You know, I, I picked you. <laughs> I want to know. I said, how did I lose this fight then? Both fighters think they won the fight. The decision announced on April 6, 1987, assured one man's ascent to greatness, confirming the unfortunate fate of another. But for Sugar Ray Leonard and marvelous Marvin Hagler, the bad blood goes back to the beginning of a long road of disparity. Their conflicting journeys date back to the amateurs, as the show-stealing Leonard embarked upon the golden road to the 1976 Olympic Games. Hagler, an amateur champion eager for a payday, turned professional only to be humbled with $50 fights in obscure arenas. Nobody ever thought of Marvin Hagler as a potential champion. I mean, probably not for the first five or six years of his career. Ray Leonard, coming out of the Olympic Games, was groomed to be a champion. There was no question about it. He was the golden boy. Ray wins the gold medal, and he's America's hero, and he gets $40,000 for his first fight. Marvin made 50 bucks. This guy makes $40,000. He's on CBS, and Hagler's looking, saying, you know, what about me? The skids were greased for Ray, and Marvin wouldn't have nothing. All he was was this tough, working class, take your lunch pail to work, blue collar, tough guy fighter from Rocky Marciano's hometown of Brockton, Massachusetts. I think uh, Marvin Hagler resented the fact that he had to slog the hard road to get recognition. He had to fight 40 or 50 fights before people would agree that he was a pretty good fighter. Oh, I never had nothing easy in my life in the boxing game. Always had to keep jumping hurdles after another hurdle or always another hurdle. After six long years and 49 professional fights, an embittered Hagler was desperate for a shot at the title. This is a feature attraction of the afternoon. This but to Hagler's dismay, his first shot came on the undercard of Sugar Ray Leonard's first welterweight championship bout in 1979. Introducing the challenger, marvelous Marvin Hagler. And the inequity of Leonard's million dollar paycheck and Hagler's $40,000 purse continued to fuel the envy of a brawler fighting for respect. Yet despite a damaging performance requiring multiple stitches in Vito Antefermo's face, Hagler's dream of becoming middleweight champion fell short. The decision is a draw. It's a draw. And to Antefermo is still. Vito retains the champion. title. Good Lord, they called it a draw. A very popular sugar ring winner. Later that night, Leonard's impressive victory over Wilfredo Benitez only enhanced the celebrity of an already adored star. Hagler's hard road to the title finally ended a year later in London, England, with a gory three-round TKO of Britain's own Alan Minter. But an enraged arena robbed the new champion of his long-drawn moment to shine. And Hagler's on his knees, acclaiming his victory. The people are throwing beer cans, one's landed on me. That's one of the things that disappointed Marvin because he didn't get to walk around the ring and have the fans show him their approval. Didn't happen. Now determined to stay on top, Hagler unleashed an endless string of consecutive knockouts, each one concluding in the celebration of his beloved belt. To be middleweight champion of the world meant everything to Marvin Hagler. That was what, what it was always all about for him. It was his announcement to the world that he was somebody and meant something. In the meantime, America's sweetheart, Sugar Ray Leonard, danced down a celebrated road of psychological savvy, avenging his only professional loss by frustrating the great Roberto Duran into quitting. Then dazzling fans with a potent encore against the hitman, Thomas Hearns. And that's all. It's over. And Ray Leonard is the undisputed welterweight champion of the world against the By 1981, the undisputed king of boxing was exceeding the purses of heavyweights and basking in the affection of infinite fans. Wow, we got the chick! Now this is my day. <laughs> but a fight between boxing's contrasting champions now seemed imminent. It was obvious that, you know, they had to get together. You had Sugar Ray, the pretty boy, the ABC kid, you know, the flurry, the flash, the, you know, the sizzle. And you got Marvin, you know, Marvin just plugging along, you know, mean, furious, leaving carnage behind him. Ray wanted to walk down the street and people say, there's Ray Leonard, he's the greatest fighter that ever lived. 
And the way he could get there was by beating Marvin Hagler, the most menacing man within his realm. And it became an obsession with him, I think. It was interrupted, this obsession. It was interrupted by the detached retina. The discovery of Leonard's detached retina in June of 82 was initially considered a career-ending eye injury. But with advanced medical treatment, doctors gave Leonard the green light to continue fighting. But the pull of public opinion proved stronger than medicine. I was 25 years old. I didn't want to quit. But because of who I was, there was mass hysteria that I was willing to risk my eyesight. He said, man, you got to be crazy. You got to be stupid. Come on, we're going to fight again. You know, you can go blind. You got enough money, got a nice family, give it up. If Ray Leonard does decide that's enough, I've had it. I'm not going to have you a can't go in do my that. <laughs> <laughs> You got to make some of that money. I'm tired of people telling me how generous he is and how good friends we go. If I'm such a good friend, give me that big payday then. That's what we want. We want to show real artists and everything else out there. And I believe that it's us that can do it. All right. I like that. Mike, trying to sign me up. <laughs> With Hagler's hopes running high, Leonard invited Muhammad Ali, Howard Cosell, and 10,000 other friends and fans to a gala ceremony in Baltimore's Civic Center. For Hagler's camp, the personal request of their presence could only mean one thing. We figured that he invited us down to make the official announcement to the world that he was going to challenge uh, Mahavis Mahavan Hagler. And as I stand here, in one second, I'll tell you exactly what I'm going to do. And we sat there with that anticipation as Leonard led us down the primrose path. To Marvin Hagler, a fight with this great man, this great champion, could be one of the greatest fights in the history of boxing. And when we got to the end of the primrose path, he cut off our head. But unfortunately, it'll never happen. Thank you and God bless you all. Thank you. It's like a, just a backhander across the face to my, you fool, you fool. You, you came all the way down here thinking I was gonna give you this. There it is. Sugar Ray Leonard has retired and God bless him. He had nothing more ever to prove. Marvin never, ever forgave him for that. To this day, you say Ray Leonard and you duck if you're with Marvin Hagler. Would you have liked to fought him? Sure. You know, that's the opportunity that I'm going to miss, but I believe it'd be bad. Though Leonard's life continued ringside, commentating on the accolades of others didn't sit well for a champion still in his prime. Well, we talk about just how marvelous, marvelous Marvin Hagler was tonight, Ray. Ray is a guy who needs the spotlight. He's got to have the spotlight. I said, you know what? This is not fair. You know, because I wanted to fight Marvin Hagler, and I figured that my, my legacy was cut short. Ray wanted to fight, and if he wasn't in the ring, if he wasn't fighting, if he wasn't training for a fight, he, Ray was not happy. Hey guys, I'm back. Leonard's short-lived return in 1984 against an unranked journeyman named Kevin Howard had Hagler on hand to witness the first knockdown of Leonard's career. Leonard rallied quickly to stop Howard in the ninth, but the damage to his pride appeared career-ending. It's just not there. I have retired for good. Leonard's departure for the second time finally left room for a marvelous main event, and 1985's epic three-round war against Thomas Hearns at long last cemented Hagler's coveted place in the spotlight. That was really his coming out party, and, and that's what made him a superstar. One should grab oneself one of these red guard sports sticks, because one would hate to be considered malodorous by one's chums. Now, wouldn't one? Well, once Marvin started to get national commercials and these kind of things that put him at that Ray Leonard level, you know, then you knew that he had broken through and he was going to stay on top. My God, Tim, what punishment this Mugabe's taken, and he's still there. Reveling in the twilight of his career, Hagler's 12th consecutive title defense came in 1986 at the demise of John the Beast Mugabe. But while most witnessed a raging battle, one man sitting ringside saw only opportunity. 
It was one of the most brutal, physically exhausting, physically damaging fights I have ever seen. He's got him hurt. He's got him hurt. Mugabe finally goes down. Eleventh round, Marvin drops Mugabe. And Mugabe sat up like, the hell with this. You know, I'm not getting up. You know, I, I can't beat the man. And when the ref said 10, Ray stood up, he looked at me and said, I can beat him, I'm going to fight him. People ask me, so you coming back? I said, no, I'm not coming back. But if Marvin Hagler called me, I do. I can consider something like that. Wait, then, wait I'm a minute. Not, I'm not sitting on JB. Listen, we're talking here. I'm not saying I'm coming back. I said, if he should call me, it's something I could, could really consider. I was home watching TV. They said Sugar Ray Leonard will be fighting Marvin Hagler. I said, what? You may or may not have heard that uh, Mr. Leonard to my left has said that he will come out of retirement to fight Marvin Hagler if Marvin Hagler will fight him. I called my brother. I said, Ray, is that true? He said, yeah. I said, well, uh, who's going to be the warmer guy? He said, I ain't got no warmer fight. I'm going straight to him. But the now 32-year-old Hagler wasn't as anxious as before. Undefeated for 11 years and just two victories short of matching the record 14 middleweight title defenses, the veteran champion took his turn to play games. And now there's talk uh, that you might... No, no, fight him. Is that true? Well, you know, right now it's really hitting a lot of press. I think basically just has an ego. He's on an ego trip or something. Or yeah. Maybe a little jealousy. Or he's missing the limelight a little bit. But uh, the way that I feel about it, I'm just going to sit back and I'm just going to lick my chops. <laughs> like that. It just, it just went. Marvin, it took a long time to convince him to take the fight. He didn't need the fight. He could retire. But such was the power of Ray Leonard that once he started banging the drum, everyone was calling out Marvin Hagley. Aren't you going to fight him? Guy's been retired for all these years. You gotta fight him. Good evening, my father, Sir Marvin. Let's fight him, beat him, and go off into the sunset. After that, I really would have said, okay, I achieved everything that I wanted in this boxing life, and now I can retire and live happily everlasting. What a great story, you know. That's what I was hoping for. Ain't nothing else to, it. to most boxing experts, Hagler's fairy tale ending seems secure against a 30-year-old ring-rusted Leonard in his first ever fight as a middleweight. I don't care how good somebody is, it is almost impossible to conceive of somebody coming back at this level after a virtual five-year and 50-day layoff and fighting at a world championship level. And it was almost like, uh, you know, like going to a hanging. I mean, people were thinking, Ray Leonard's not gonna win this fight, and, you know, we're just watching an execution here. Marvin was ferocious, and people knew it. And now Sugar Ray was gonna find out. Sugar Ray Leonard making his way out of the dressing room and toward the ring. What must be going through this man's mind? The, the march to the ring with Ray was, we realized it was something special going to happen here tonight. You, you, you could feel it. The focus naturally is on Ray because he is the question mark. He is the mystery. Ray had said, there's a couple of things I want you to do during the course of the fight. He said, um, I want you to say dip and slide. So then I want you to let me know when it's 30 seconds. I say, yell 30 seconds before each round ends because I will steal that round by throwing a lot of punches. It wasn't until the fighters were actually seen and the ring walk started that there was this just this palpable burst of energy that filled the arena. This is the main event of the night. You couldn't help it. You were caught up in the emotion of this fight and it just took you right with it all the way up into the ring. Sugar, Ray, Lemon, Arvillis. I mean, it was dramatic. The most dramatic I can ever remember in any fight. You really have a feeling the first round is going to tell an awful lot of the story of this fight. In the first round, Marvin comes out orthodox. Marvin's a southpaw. You know, it's like trick time. I remember sitting there thinking, what on earth are you doing? Leonard is beating Hagler to the punch. Are you kidding me? But it's Marvin Hagler fighting Ray Leonard's fight. I realized then that he was just as tight and scared as I was. Where was the Marvin Hagler that came out of the ring like a whirling dervish and absolutely, utterly destroyed Thomas Hurts? Where was he? Marvin Hagler was moving around. He was boxing with Sugar Ray Leonard and losing the rounds. You know? I couldn't believe it. The one thing that is very apparent now is that Leonard is the more confident fighter. I think the way Hagler came out against Leonard was 
false attempt to show that I don't even have to box you in my conventional way to beat you. On my card, Barry, Leonard won the first two rounds. 30 seconds before the bell would end, all he done that was say 30 seconds, and I would flurry and win that round. 30! It worked like a charm. 30 seconds, boom, round's over. Put that one in the bank. Bing, round two's in the books. Bing, round three's in the books. Harold Letterman, how do you score the fight? Larry, I've got all three rounds for Sugar Ray Leonard. Take this sucker, he'll go for it. Ray. ray Leonard's punches in that fight were louder. It wasn't it that, that, that they were any more effective than Marvin Hagler's punches? In fact, they absolutely weren't. But he, they came in bunches. They were pretty flashy. They were easy to see. They were good punches. They weren't just pity patter punches. They were good, solid punches. A few round stealing flurries is what he's trying to do. You can't win the fight with pitter patter. Marvin was the aggressor, and I mean, that's what, more or less, what I scored on. Marvin's doing his thing. He's pursuing Sugar Ray, and he's stalking him and hunting him down, and he was beating him up. A good right. Ray seemed hurt. Big right hand by Marvin Hagler. And now Hagler chases Leonard. And then Leonard would pop in, would do his little dance and flurry and this and that. I'm a fighter, you know, and that's that's what I've always been. Hagler just continues to press Sugar Ray Leonard. But uh, this guy was, you know, just like a little rabbit man. I mean, <laughs> pew, 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 pew. Ray Leonard wanted the bigger ring here. He got his wish, and he's using all of it. If you want to be the champion, if you want to take my title, I think you got to come and take it. This is what Hagler wants. He wants a war. All through the fight, you could see them talking. Hagler was saying to him, come on, bitch. And he was calling him a wuss. He was calling him a sissy. He said, stop and fight me like a man, you little bitch. Fight me like a man, you little bitch. And I said, no. They don't fight nobody slugging. He's a mover, a boxer, a, a chess player. To me, he fought like still back in the Olympic days with the pitter patter thing or running around and whatever. And I didn't feel as though he fought me like a champion. And Leonard with his hands at his side, really taunting Hagler. Hit him in the ass, you know, spin him around, do a little flurry, move around, dance, raise your hand. You know, the purists looked at that and said, ah, oh, that's garbage. And now Hagler mocking Leonard. But meanwhile, what is it doing to this guy's head? Smiling at him and just essentially saying, come on, and now Hagler's getting angry. He was sick of it, you know, I'm watching him fight, and he's out there, you know, sticking his head out, he's shuffling his feet, and I'm like, this is why I don't like him. It worked for what it was. It's kind of a little humor, if you will. You don't make a mockery out of the sport. Ray, please box. Deep breath. Give me another one. How you feel, man? You're gonna brawl this guy, keep the pressure on him, taking his legs away right now. The ninth round was probably Marvin's best round. I said, here we go. We're gonna we're gonna finally get to Ray and uh, and put him away. Ray Leonard is hurt in the corner. Leonard's left hand down at his side, Hadler peppering him. All of a sudden the little fella, bop, boop, bop, boop, bop, bam, bam, boom. Backs Marvin up. And now it's Hagler who backs off. Hagler knew then he had to take Ray out sooner or later to win the fight. Ray Leonard's ability to take the punches from Hagler is astonishing, really. No, I think he was dying in there. Leonard just took a deep breath and dropped his arms. Now, whether that was a ploy, we'll find out here. 15 seconds left, round nine. It seemed like every time when I had him going, the bell would ring. There's almost an audible sigh. Oh, blind Ray survived. Oh, blind Ray survived. He was winning just because he wasn't losing. And how far will Ray Leonard's legs take him? 15 seconds left, round 10. I have it an even fight. But you must understand that at this point in the fight, everyone had Ray knocked out. 30 seconds, 11th round. To me, at that point in the fight, the judges stopped watching the fight and stopped watching Ray. It's hard to know how this fight would be scored, but it's closer than Marvin Hagler thought it would be going into this last round. Ray, come on, man. deep right! We only got three men there! Yeah! Come on, baby! One more round, the fight's over! You better! New champion! The 
12th round of that fight was to me a very symbolic round. Hagler cornered him every once in a while, would get him on the ropes, but miraculously, just when it seemed he might have Leonard in trouble, Ray would suddenly flurry out of it. But I never saw the crowd turn as much as it turned in that fight. The crowd chanting Sugar Ray! I mean, people that didn't want to be rooting for Ray Leonard were rooting for Ray Leonard at the end. Sugar Ray Leonard captured the audience, captured the judges, he had captured everybody. Off the ropes! Leonard fighting off the ropes! The crowd just rose to its feet thunderously saying this is the real deal. Sugar Ray Leonard showed up for the fight. How do you like it? How do you like it? Both fighters think they won the fight. What I saw in Marvin Hagler, which told me that he kind of knew that I won the fight, was when, when the bell sounded, he, he just kind of danced. Marvin doesn't dance. I was a happy man. I was like, just getting down, you know, I still had so much energy still in me. It was a great fight on both sides, regardless of who wins it. So I went towards him, I, I said, I kissed him on the cheek, I said, man, you're still a champ to me, you're still a champ to me. And then he told me himself inside the ring, you know, that you beat me, you know, but yet the man still won a minute to the world. I never told him he won the fight. Even if he did, if I thought he did win a fight, I wouldn't say that to him. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a split decision. I thought Marvin won the fight. But when I heard him say split decision, my heart sunk and I said, they're gonna steal it. The winner by a split decision and new middleweight champion of the world, Sugar Ray Linder. Marvin thought that it had been stolen from him because he wasn't as glamorous as Sugar Ray Leonard, as beloved as Sugar Ray Leonard. And Hagler just finds this one like that. And that was kind of my last recollection of him in the ring, total disgust for the sport that made him marvelous. He told me once that he never put on another pair of gloves in a gym or anywhere else after that fight. Me to me is still a champion. I didn't want the belt, I just want to beat him. I thank Marvin's Marvin Hagler and thank you. I thought it was good for boxing, Marvin said. But uh, when they got sick of seeing my face, and they gave it to the golden boy. I proved that I was a true champion. He didn't knock me down, didn't hurt me at all. Come on. I just can't believe it. Uh. Thank you, Marvin. Okay. Marvin Hagler could have lost to anyone else. And he would have dealt with it. But for him to have lost to me, of all people, I think but for the Hagler fight, Ray Leonard might be under the category of what might have been. It's the greatest comeback I think I've ever seen. Whether you think he won or lost, it was one of the transcendent performances in the history of that sport. No question about it. When I look at the fight, I mean, I think uh, I threw about three TVs out every time because I don't see what everybody see. This man never beat me. The Ray Leonard and Marvin Hagler fight is a fight that people are going to talk about forever. But there's not going to ever be an answer. Did he win the fight? Yeah, he won the fight. And Marvin Hagler won the fight? Yeah, he won the fight. But to be honest with you, every time I see that fight, it gets closer and closer and closer. Hagler was so frustrated by the decision and by obstacles to a potential rematch that he did something no other fighter has done. He walked away from another eight-figure payday and moved to Italy never to fight again. Leonard kept fighting off and on for ten more years, but never again showed the style that earned him his most controversial and amazing victory. Thanks for watching The Tale of Hagler Leonard. Hello, I'm Jim Lampley. Welcome to this look back at the stories behind Tyson Douglas, one of the most memorable fights in 30 years of boxing on HBO. Mike Tyson made his first trip to Tokyo in March 1988 for a rapid destruction of former titleist Tony Tubbs. By the time of Tyson's next Pacific Crossing, two years later, his life had become an earthquake, an unrelenting series of seismic tabloid shocks, and the specter of the big one loomed closer than anyone on this bad planet could possibly have imagined. In February of 1990, 23-year-old Mike Tyson was about to enter the ring for the 38th time in his professional career. The fight was taking place in Tokyo, Japan, 
and his opponent, as usual, was paid little heed. This was just another demonstration of Tyson at the peak of his powers. The culmination of a career that began with a ferocious and memorable debut in the mid-1980s. Well, a lot of Tyson's early opponents were, were terrified because of his record and his manner and the way he just came roaring out of the corner and was throwing punches nonstop. He was being fed a lot of stiffs and just reeling off these one-round knockouts. He was doing it so spectacularly and so routinely that uh, you could hardly help but get enthusiastic about this. They're always drawn to the big punch. The big punch is something out of the primordial ooze that we cannot deny. Now, I've seen Tyson hit guys and just remove them from the consciousness of the earth. In 1986, Tyson, at age 20, became the youngest heavyweight champion in history. And we have a new era in boxing. He wasn't just winning fights, and he wasn't just knocking out everybody. I mean, he was knocking them out of the first round, and it looked like this was his destiny. By the end of 1989, Tyson had muscled his way to the top of the heavyweight ranks, and the only legitimate challenger left was Evander Holyfield. Their meeting was much anticipated, but slow in the making. So Tyson signed up for a quick payday against an undistinguished opponent, James Buster Douglas from Columbus, Ohio. A tall fighter with a generous reach, 29-year-old Douglas had shown flashes of a potential which had thus far gone unfulfilled. In 1990, Buster Douglas was just another heavyweight out there who looked like a sitting duck for Mike Tyson. Buster Douglas was one of the great underachievers of his time. He always was sort of perceived as a guy who really liked the fight. You know, he had a lot of tremendous physical talent. The big debate was, is anybody going to go to Tokyo to cover the fight? The only important stage that Buster Douglas had ever been on before this fight was against Tony Tucker, a good fighter. And he was beating Tony Tucker until he ran out of gas. That was interpreted as this guy doesn't have heart, will, spirit, need, whatever it was. Only one betting parlor would put up odds on the fight and that was probably just as a gag. They say it was 42 to one, it was a thousand to one or a million to one. No one gave us a prayer. If Tyson had the odds in his favor, the one thing Douglas could claim was a boxing pedigree, thanks to his father, William Dynamite Douglas, who fought professionally from 1967 to 1980. Bill was an aggressive fighter. He'd throw body shots a lot like Mike Tyson, and he uh, had a left-right combo that'd take your head off. He had a heavy bag in his basement. He would work all day at a hard job, go home, hit this heavy bag, and train himself. My father took me to the gym when I was 10. He was a center leader at the local gym here. I was on him about, you know, wanting to come in and box. Bill coached James, and uh, he was probably harder on James than any one of his boxers because he wanted James to have all the opportunities that he never got in a professional race. Bill was a nice man, but he was a no-nonsense guy. Buster sort of took after his mother, was just a sweet, kind, nice lady. A lot of times James would want to play basketball in the gym and Mrs. Douglas would come and get him out the gym and get him back into the boxing room so that he can continue his training. She wanted her son to be even better than her husband. James Buster Douglas! After Douglas turned pro in 1981, in spite of his inconsistencies, he did go farther than his father had as a boxer. And in signing to fight Tyson, Douglas would have a chance, however far-fetched, to win the world title. But just 23 days before the bout, everything changed when Buster's mother, Lula Pearl, died of a stroke at age 47. I called James and I said, let's cancel the fight. He said, no. I was more determined. I told him, I said, I'm all right. And I think that even helped the intensity even more. He told me that she would want him to go on. He was very close to his mom. Before she had passed, she come to his house and uh, she was real worried about him fighting Mike Tyson because she had heard what an animal he was. And he goes, no, I'm, I'm, I'm okay, I'm gonna beat him. She had went and told one of her girlfriends, oh, Buster's gonna beat Mike Tyson, you know? So that really gave him confidence too. She was 
having her battles, but yet she was still looking out for her baby. I mean, that's, that's uh, love, you know? Soon after his mother's death, Buster resumed training, keeping his grief private until one moment after a workout, a few days before the fight. He had his head down with a towel over his head, and um, I picked a towel up, and he was just sobbing. <laughs> broke down and it was because of his mom, you know. That was the first time that I had saw that and I thought, oh, he just told me miss his mom. In February of 1990, the boxing press, Mike Tyson, and a grieving but focused Buster Douglas traveled to Tokyo. The story of his mother's death had been communicated to us, but we didn't know at that moment that it had somehow galvanized him. He was, for this one big occasion, going to be the fighter of his dreams. We covered that fight almost as an afterthought, and we got there late in the week, and Tyson was sort of off limits or, or jetting around, I don't know which. Uh, at that point, uh, the only person available was Douglas, because who wanted to talk to Douglas? Fear was a lot of Tyson's weaponry in the past when he was at his greatness. The fighters came in almost frozen, almost the prey of a cobra. But Buster Douglas, by his mother just dying, he had no fear, what, what do I care? That just happened to be the perfect timing that he had to fight a dissipating Tyson, whose mind is going everywhere, and a lot of it's following Robin Gibbons' retreating figure. While Tyson seemed indestructible going into the fight, his personal life had been full of turmoil. His brief marriage to actress Robin Givens ended in divorce in 1988, amid allegations that Tyson had beaten her and that he was manic depressive. He was regarded as being in a morbid frame of mind because of his difficulties with Robin and the breakup of that relationship. You know, let's face it, Mike was known to be an unusual personality anyway. By late 1988, Tyson's behavior had become increasingly bizarre. Boxing champion Mike Tyson allegedly went on another emotional rampage. Tyson lost control of his BMW and it's Mike Tyson was found guilty yesterday of five The champ's troubles continue to multiply. At the same time, Tyson was taking apart his old management team and bringing in the new, led by controversial promoter Don King. Gone were manager Bill Caton and longtime trainer Kevin Rooney. Replacing Rooney was Aaron Snowell, who soon found out that he had an uncooperative fighter on his hands. He no longer wanted me to run with him. He didn't want him to be bothered. He said, if they come and get me to run, I'm leaving up out of here. And that was his attitude. In a workout in Tokyo, Mike was sparring with Greg Page, and he got hit and went down. He looked at me when he went down. I said, get up. And, uh, he got up and came over like this, and I wiped his gloves off, and I told him to go back in there. I had sat down one night, and I talked to Mike. I told him, you're not Superman, and the best that I know about this game, the things you've been doing and how you've been doing it, you're headed for a butt whooping. Korakuen Stadium in Tokyo, Japan, as HBO Sports presents World Championship Boxing. This was a fight that took place at about 9 o'clock in the morning in Japan so that it could be broadcast to New York. And it was the weirdest feeling I've ever had in a fight because the people were totally, I wouldn't say unenthusiastic, but they were so polite. It was the dullest crowd I've ever seen. I've never seen anything like it. I always say that in the Tokyo Dome, you could hear a rat piss on cotton. That's how quiet it was. When I went over into the dressing room to check Tyson's gloves, he was walking like an animal in there, storming back and forth, back and forth, looking at me like he wanted to kill me, you know? So Mike Tyson was ready to fight. And uh, when I left the room, I told him, I said, you know, you're gonna get your ass kicked. But I got out of there real quick when I told him that. <laughs> when Douglas trotted into the ring, there was almost a sense of amusement. We thought he was going to his doom, but he didn't. Mike Tyson rushing toward the ring, wanting to get it on and get it over with. When he got into the ring, I could see that he wasn't, he wasn't in top shape. 
And plus I had heard someone said he wasn't really doing any training and he was, you know, having a good time over there and you can have a good time in Japan. But Douglas was in good shape. I remember that. James Buster Douglas. I noticed he was looking at me trying to get the eye contact to do his usual stare down and stuff, but you know, I was like paying him no attention. Trying to show no fear. Douglas insists that he's going to shock the world in this fight. I don't know what Mike was thinking. If he knew he wasn't in shape, he should have went out there and threw everything he had in the first round because he wasn't throwing any punches. And Douglas was. After the first round, I felt that Mike was going to have a problem. Very hard right hand by Douglas inside. The way Mike started out, you could see his timing and his rhythm wasn't there. I was sitting next to Don King, and Mike was getting beaten so badly. And after three or four rounds, I looked at Don King, I said, Don, is this really happening? And I said, what's going on? He said, I don't know, but I don't like it. Oh, you're too flat-footed in it. All right. Okay? Trust Get that in what you know. Do it. Let it go. <clears throat> Incredibly, the self-proclaimed baddest man on the planet was struggling in the ring. And his problems were just beginning. By the end of the fourth round, swelling had developed over Tyson's left eye, and his corner was shockingly unprepared to help him. They had neglected to bring a standard piece of equipment called an end swell, an ice-cold steel press used to reduce the swelling around the eyes of a battered fighter. The disbelief didn't really set in until Mike's eye swelled and we began to watch what was going on in the corner. And, and suddenly it became clear they didn't have a cut man, they didn't have any equipment. Well, the rule of thumb for swelling is put a cold compress on it. I made a cold compress in a rubber glove from down on the floor. They were trying to put icy water into a, a latex glove to hold against his eye, which is like the little boy with his thumb in the dike. I did what I had to do for that time for a mistake somebody made that was on the team. And being that I'm the leader of the team, I take responsibility. But it wasn't his eye being swollen. It was him making a mistake and getting hit with the punch. Whatever went wrong is because of me, you know what I mean? That's what I keep my, you know what I mean? Because when it goes right, I always say it's because of me it went right. And regardless if you had the best quarterman in the world, if you can't fight, it's useless. If they didn't have an end swell, it wouldn't have changed the outcome of the fight, you know what I mean? But it would have made them look a little better. This is high drama, and the crowd here is greeting it by and large with stony silence. And one of the things that was happening at ringside was you noticed the silence of the crowd. It was like they had gone to a movie and Godzilla was coming to eat up the town and then, you know, Godzilla never showed up. Finally, in round eight, Tyson found the opening he had been waiting for when Douglas, emboldened in his role of giant slayer, dropped his guard for just an instant. Buster started looking at his work. Yeah, you ain't so bad. So he posed in front of him, Mike hit him with that uppercut. Boom, down he goes. They pounded his fist on the canvas. I said, oh, okay, he's all right. Checked my watch to see where we were at in the, in the round. I knew the round was almost over. I said, okay, we're, we're cool. Fortunately, I was just, you know, caught with a glancing blow to where it really didn't do an effect to me. It, it knocked me down, but that was it. When Mike hit him and knocked him down, I, it was like my kid getting knocked down. And at that instant, I wanted to reach through the TV and help him up. And he got up, and he got up like a man. He got up and he shook it off. And the rest is history. Let's see what Mike can do to finish. And the bell ends to save Buster Douglas at the end of round eight. He had put so much into that shot and to pull it off that it was gone. Mike normally would just swarm all over a guy when he had him hurt. And he just didn't have it in him. And Mike has slowed down. Maybe a tiny bit arm weary. He hits the guy with his best Sunday punch and the guy gets up. He's like, oh, if that don't take, you know, and the desire out of you, nothing will. Douglas coming back with a left like his right. head. Tyson is wobbling. Douglas wailing away. Tyson, who had absorbed tremendous punishment, was unable to summon the energy to capitalize on the knockdown. Douglas came back strongly in the ninth round and sensed that Tyson was a spent force in the tenth. The fight of Douglas's dreams was now the fight of his life. Round ten. I started popping him with them jabs, and he wasn't moving as much as he was before. Then I pivoted, you know, I had got leverage and came up with it, you know, a 
real good uppercut. Bow. Oh, the uppercut. And I swear if Mike Tyson's neck wasn't so big, it ripped his head off. When he hit him, I actually went like that. I swear to God, I did. I went like that. I thought maybe he knocked his head off. He hit him so hard with that uppercut. And then he'd just come with combinations and just drilled him. He fell right in our corner. I said, you're done. Stay down, Mike. I said, oh, shit. That's all went to my mind. What an uppercut by Douglas, and down goes Tyson. And I'm thinking crazy. I'm saying they won't allow me to fight if I don't have the mouthpiece in my mouth. So I'm, I'm grabbing for the mouthpiece. So it was over. I tried to get up, and I mostly I was hazy. I didn't know where I was at. He's, he, it's over. It's over. Mike Tyson has been knocked out. At the end of the fight, he asked me what had happened. And I said, you got knocked out. He wasn't feeling too good. His eye was swollen shut. He wanted to break down and cry, but he held himself together. Where He took his butt whooping like a man. The new heavyweight champion of the world, James Buster Douglas. Let's go ahead and call it the biggest upset in the history of heavyweight championship fights. Buster beat him at his best. And that myth about him not being in shape, that's not true. Because if he wouldn't have been in shape, he'd have been out of there in about the second or third round because Buster was humming him. He just got his butt handed to him, and that's the excuse that he tried to use. Why did it happen, James? Because I wanted it. Why? Why did you win this fight that nobody on mother. the planet gave you? Because his mother. In what mother. way? God bless her heart. People around him were saying, let's go, let's get out of here. You want to go, James? Fuck. No, let him talk. But that was his moment, and he, he wanted to speak. And I remember myself very clearly saying, let's just follow him as he's dealing with these extraordinarily human emotions. I'm just feeling real good and uh, finally able to exhale with all the things that have been going on and I had to keep inside. But the main thing I wanted to do was express my joy for my father and my mom, but my father. And Dad, this one is for you. I love you. He's my hero. To take the baton, so to speak, and then just to fulfill the dream, not only for myself, but for him, was just the most rewarding thing in the world. But in boxing, nothing is ever as simple as it seems. While the world had witnessed a stunning upset victory, Don King would brazenly claim that the real winner was Tyson. I said, I told you, Don, I told you we were going to kick his butt. And he said, get away from me, I'm protesting. I said, protesting what? King claimed that when Tyson knocked Douglas down in the eighth round, the count went long and should have been ruled a knockout in favor of Tyson. The tradition holds that the defeated champion keeps his belts. In the chaos following the fight, Russell snagged one of Tyson's belts figuring that in the event of a protest, possession is nine-tenths of the law. They were all looking for the belt. <laughs> I gave it to Buster when we got back. I said that they could protest it, but they can't take the belt because we got the belt. And then it starts with the, you know, accusations, well, they might not let you be the champion. You might have to relinquish the belt and fight again for the belt. You know, it's like, well, you might have won the fight, but you're not going to enjoy being champion. Word came that there was going to be a meeting back at the scene of the crime. You didn't know what was up, but you knew it wasn't going to be good for Buster Douglas. It was one of the most contentious press conferences I've ever seen. The door banged open and they walked to the side, and the image in my mind was, now you know what it feels like to be working at a 7-Eleven at 4 in the morning when they come in to rob you. And there's nothing that you can do. Here they come. Don King, perhaps because he wasn't in America, was behaving with amazing impunity and bravado. I mean, he just assumed that he could overturn this decision, this, this knockout, um, with no problem at all. And for a while, it looked like he would. Everybody has seen the facts, and the facts are irrefutable and incontrovertible. First knockout totally obliterated the second knockout, you know, claiming that Douglas had been knocked out. Well, Douglas hadn't been knocked out. The guy said nine, he got up. This is boxing baloney. This is not true. King went to the videotape, questioning the accuracy of referee Octavio Mehron's count. But according to boxing rules, the ref in the ring is the ultimate authority. And even if the count as executed by Mehran was slow, 
it was final. More important, Douglas was on his feet at nine and ready to fight. Silenced by the public's vocal support for the new champ, King abandoned his quest to take back the title. When he came home, it was like nothing I'd ever seen before. The pride that the city had, there was so much excitement, and uh, it was amazing how many people admitted they were on the bandwagon. We knew you were gonna do it, Buster. And the news was just rocking with James Buster Douglas from Columbus, Ohio. He was like a king in this, this community because he represented someone getting to the top. We went to the parade and we went downtown City Hall and they had this big stage set up and as far as you could see, there were people. It was like hanging around with Michael Jackson, the Beatles, Elvis Presley. I always told him, I said, you're like Elvis Presley. Hanging around with you is like being with Elvis. Everybody wanted a piece of him, you know, because he was the guy that beat the baddest man on the planet. I was embraced, you know. That was cool, nice reception when I came back. But that was a lot of demands. You know, I got to do the talk shows. That was all right, but I'd have much rather have been just at home, just chilling. Later that year, an overweight and underprepared Douglas was quickly knocked out by Evander Holyfield, losing his title, but gaining a $24 million payday in the process. Douglas retired to Florida, where he grew to the dangerously unhealthy weight of nearly 400 pounds and almost died in a diabetic coma. Forced to get fit again just to stay alive, Douglas staged a comeback, winning eight of his nine bouts before retiring for good in 1999. I always wanted to do something in a good light to where it showed that I existed in this world. You know, it all came together for me. As for Tyson, after losing to Douglas, things would only get worse. He fought just four more times before being sent to prison in March of 1992 for the rape of a beauty queen. And after being released three years later on parole, he returned to the ring a caricature of what he once was. Between ear bitings and angry outbursts, Tyson continued to make headlines. But the aura of invincibility was gone. Looking back now, the Tyson-Douglas fight is really the beginning of the end for Mike Tyson because Douglas exposed him as a guy that can be beaten if you're not afraid of him. Just keep chopping on him, just keep chopping on him. And eventually he's gonna go. And that's what happened, as you've seen over there, he was flat on his ass. <laughs> the blueprint that existed for how to fight Mike Tyson was executed by Buster Douglas. Nobody knew that he was capable of it. The ring was his refuge. And once he lost that image of being a monster destroyer, of being untouchable, then he had to face something closer to real life, and that's a, a very, very difficult prospect for him. Mike Tyson will be okay. He'll be all right. Regardless of what people would like to see happen to me, like people say, oh, he just wanted to like the rest of the fighters. Not a, I doubt that seriously. And that's why I guess people are upset, because they really wish that would happen. He was like one of those guys just there to flare briefly and uh, now that that's dimmed I think it's going to be a long journey out. Douglas turned out to be just as badly programmed for success in 1990 as was Tyson. Evander Holyfield immediately knocked Douglas out but another six years would pass before Tyson and Holyfield finally met and by that time Iron Mike had lived several more damaging lifetimes outside the ring. Through all the upheaval, Tyson remained the sport's most famous and infamous figure and its biggest box office draw. Thanks for watching The Tale of Tyson Douglas. Hello, I'm Jim Lampley. Welcome to this look back at the stories behind Chavez Taylor, one of the most memorable fights in 30 years of boxing on HBO. As St. Patrick's Day 1990 approached, the boxing world was still in shock from Mike Tyson's stunning loss to Buster Douglas just one month before. So what next? 80 pounds south of the heavyweights, a classic battle brood between legendary unbeaten champion Julio Cesar Chavez of Mexico and unbeaten American Meldrick Taylor. Could a little man's fight live up to the drama, the spirit, and the controversy of what had taken place in Tokyo? Could it ever?
There are fights where you lose your prawn in a single bout. When you fight a fight like that, you are never the same. A piece of you stays there. The accumulation of punishment was brutal. It destroyed him as a fighter. It ruined him. After that, it all was on the downside. That loss. That loss did it. The one thing that he should have gotten was the satisfaction of the victory. Because he beat him for 35 minutes and 58 seconds. On the final day of competition at the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles, a teenager from Philadelphia climbed into the ring, ready for his final bout in the 125-pound weight class. He was part of one of the best American boxing teams ever assembled, including future Hall of Famers Evander Holyfield and Purnell Whitaker. Their take would be eight gold medals. Meldrick Taylor was trying to make it nine. When he got to the Olympic Games, he was 17 years old. He was sort of the baby of that team and a vastly talented fighter. But you had much bigger names on that team, much older guys. The winner in the red corner, Meldrick Taylor of the United States of America. But once he became a pro, uh, he quickly became the, the class of that class. Meldrick became the star. Taylor with a good left again, and Lexi goes down. He developed faster. Good stuff from Meldrick Taylor. He was flashier. Meldrick's speed certainly has to be respected. He could do everything. A lot of people thought he was a new Ray Leonard. Meldrick Taylor was dazzling. He had hand speed. He had good foot movement. I don't know if there's been too many fighters in the last 25 years who were any more fun to watch. He could snap off these seven, eight punch combinations just in the blur of an eye. But I think his greatest strength and perhaps his greatest weakness was he was a Philadelphia fighter. <laughs> he thought of himself as a fighter more than a boxer. Which was the tradition passed down through the years in gritty North Philadelphia, a boxing neighborhood renowned for its gym wars and for producing legends like Smoke and Joe Frazier. As a kid growing up in North Philly, Meldrick Taylor wrote a promise to himself in black magic marker. It read, I will be a champion someday. To do so, he would box and fight the Philadelphia way. A Philadelphia fighter is basically fighters that has a lot of heart, a lot of desire. They come to fight every minute, every round. He had the mindset and he had the history. This is my home. What Meldrick wanted to be, in a way, was Joe Frazier. Meldrick Taylor was too much of a Philadelphia fighter. He had real quickness and boxing skills, but that he loved to get in there and fight, and sometimes when it wasn't to his best advantage. But he's flailing away. This is a brawl. But that's what made him the outstanding young fighter he was. Meldrick Taylor could not be more impressive. In just his 21st professional bout, Taylor fulfilled his childhood dream. A wicked right hand by Taylor. When he upset Buddy McGirt to win his first title. And the brand new junior welterweight champion, Meldrick TNT Taylor. He was in demand. Uh, the crowd loved him. TV loved him. He entertained. He threw punches. He boxed. He danced. For flash, you couldn't beat Meldrick Taylor. But Taylor, with his Philadelphia heart, was determined to prove himself as more than flash. What better way than to beat the least flashy fighter in the sport? A budding legend who appeared to be Taylor's polar opposite in nearly every way. Mexico's Julio Cesar Chavez. Chavez, unloaded. Chavez was regarded as the best pound for pound fighter in the world, but more than that, he was regarded as the toughest son of a bitch in boxing. He articulated all the virtues that Mexican fighters are supposed to have. He didn't submit to the odds. He kept coming. 
Julio Cesar Chavez was only 27 years old. But since rising from an impoverished upbringing in Culiacan, Mexico, he had already earned the stature of a Mexican folk hero. Chavez is something different, something extra natural. Julio Cesar Chavez! Chavez always fights for the Mexican flag. People, they don't care, they don't go to war just to see him fight. What Mexican fight fans loved about Julio Cesar Chavez is that he endured incredible amounts of pain in order to win fights for them. That's the Mexican passion. Outlast, outwork, outfight, outbattle. By 1990, Chavez had already won four titles and successfully defended them 13 times. His undefeated record gave him an aura of invincibility. Chavez was 66 and 0, the quintessential Mexican fighter. Take three to land one. Wear you down with his relentless aggression and toughness. He was the workman. He was the plumber. You know, Meldrick was the guy driving the Jaguar, and Javis pulled up in an SUV. But then he might run over your Jaguar with the SUV. People wondered who could get to Julio Cesar Chavez. And most people believed that if anybody was going to do it, it would be Meldrick Taylor. For people who like to follow boxing, this is what you live for. Two great fighters, same weight class, both in their prime. Boy, it had everything. It was a stylistic matchup, it was a, a nationalistic matchup. The multi-million dollar bout was scheduled for March 17, 1990, at the Las Vegas Hilton. But it didn't take long for something to get in the way. Every referee in the world, oh man, you, can you imagine how much you dream, how much you, you, you just pray that you can get this assignment? Richard Steele was considered one of the best referees in the sport. He was assigned to the fight by the Nevada State Athletic Commission. He had already officiated 45 title fights, but his rumored relationship with Chavez's promoter, Don King, made the Taylor camp uneasy. I objected to Richard Steele uh, being the referee. And not that he wasn't competent, I think he was competent. But uh, in Vegas, there had been some questions about the way he handled some of the fighters that at that time were Don King fighters. Steele had been accused in the past of perhaps favoring Tyson and some other King fighters. He was also a friend of, of King's, or at least was perceived to be. And perception is reality, especially in boxing. Every time that I spoke with Don King has been in the public, in the ring. Don King and I have never said over 10 words at one time during the 30 years of refereeing that I did. I worked for the State Athletic Commission, and that's who my loyalty always went to. Richard Steele is the as honest a man as I've ever dealt with. Nevada Athletic Commission Executive Director Mark Ratner worked closely with Richard Steele for 20 years. He's just an upstanding individual, and whatever he has done in boxing, he did for the right reasons. So I've never believed any of those comments whatsoever. I thought it would be best to get another referee in there. But apparently, the commission says, no, it's going to be Richard Steele. So it was Richard Steele. Every so often in boxing, Two landmark talents are brought together in a match of risk and reward unlike any in recent memory. Tonight in Las Vegas, such a meeting between Julio Cesar Chavez and Meldrick Taylor. It was one of those fights that ringside people, boxing insiders, were hungry to see it. It's our great pleasure at HBO Sports to bring you what we call and what other experts have called the greatest little fight money can buy. About between two extraordinarily talented undefeated champions whose styles seem to be perfect foils for one another. Whoever won this fight was going to be at that moment the spotlight of everything below the heavyweight division in boxing. It was in the ballroom at the Las Vegas Hilton. That building held 9,200 people. And I would say about 7,000 were people from the Culiacan neighborhood. So in the past 50 years, no professional boxer has begun a career and sustained unbeaten success for as long as has Julio Cesar Chavez. Melrick Taylor is really up for the fight. The familiar Lou Duva and his lieutenants will lead their charge, Meldrick Taylor, out of his dressing room. We all thought that he would win the fight because he just threw too many punches. 
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I was really thrilled to be selected for this fight. And your referee is Richard Steele. I know that Julio Cesar Chavez has never fought a fighter like Melger Teller. Chavez's eyes are focused on the midriff of Meldrick Taylor. He is thinking body from the outset. Taylor was unintimidated by the pressure. Chavez was just a target, moving into his range. Taylor lands a vicious right hand. Look at the speed of Meldrick Taylor's flurry. Brilliant stuff from Meldrick Taylor. The drama in this fight early on was that Taylor was dominating a terrific fighter. Taylor still trading four blows to one for Chavez. Nobody expected that to happen. With the first four rounds, Meltrick Taylor would appear to have built an early lead. Boxing. Moving. Punches and bunches. His fluid hand speed and combinations. Clearly reminiscent of Ray Leonard at his best. Whoa, beautiful Trading punches inside, and Chavez again seems to wobble slightly as Taylor lands at will. The hand speed of Melcher Taylor was superior, totally superior, and nullified the offense of Chavez. He's been doing what he needs to do, just boxing, using speed. Taylor was way ahead. And as round five comes to a close, Meldrick Taylor throws his glove skyward in celebration of his performance so far. He was winning the fight. Now you're boxing beautiful. There's no doubt in anybody's mind. This is why we try to hold him up a little bit and slow him down. Now just settle down, settle down. Don't let the guy carry you too fast. Because we saw the fight maybe going into the 12th round, and we wanted to hold him back a little bit so he had enough to turn it on in case he needed it. But through the middle rounds, Taylor showed no signs of slowing down. It's hard to imagine Taylor being more effective. Hard to imagine him doing a better job of rising to the biggest occasion of his career. Even Chavez's staunchest supporters were in shock. The male dictator was dominating Chavez for like for nine, ten rounds. Even the, the Chavez corner said, come on, do it for your family, for your sons, for everybody, for your country. You're losing the fight. For your family, Julio. They know how desperate the situation is. He was an unbeaten young champion fighter, fighting the fight of his life against one of the greatest fighters in the sport, and I thought that he won the first nine rounds of the fight. If you're in the middle of the ninth round of a classic performance by a young fighter on the threshold of greatness, Taylor may well have won every round. I thought that uh, Taylor was decisively winning the fight. I thought he was really giving Chavez a boxing lesson. It was clear to almost everyone that Taylor was giving a virtuoso performance. But it was clear to one man that something else was happening. I knew that Melcher Teller was winning the fights because he was landing two to one. But at the same time, I saw Julio Cesar Chavez landing these hard punches, hard shots, shots that would break bones. Most of the audience didn't know how much of a beating that this young man was taking. It's incumbent on Taylor not to give Chavez an unnecessary chance to get back into this. We started to see very gradually that there was a shift. Taylor was landing punches, but Chavez was starting to land more hurtful ones. There is swelling around both of Meldrick Taylor's eyes. You were giving him round after round, and then you looked up and said, you know, what happened to this guy? <laughs> it looked like he'd been hit by a windmill. Taylor beginning to look more the worse for wear than the action of the bout would have led you to believe, though. I think Julio was turning the tide. I still don't think he was winning rounds, but he was punishing Meldrick physically from the middle rounds of the fight on, and, and that ultimately was going to tell the tale. Chavez finally seizing the initiative for the first time in round 10, and for the first time, there's a mild air of danger for Meldrick Taylor. He knew he was losing the, the fight, but he also knew that he was extracting a cost for Meldrick Taylor to win each one of those rounds. Blood again from the mouth and the nostrils. The issue became, can I get him before they say the fight's over? As round 11 comes toward a close, and Taylor was woozy and almost went to the wrong corner. Finally came down to the 12th round, and he was winning the fight. Sure, he got hit some shots, but he was in condition. 
and we tell him in the corner, look, this is the last round. No, this is the last round. The whole fight is right now. But the advice Lou Duva remembers offering, what was actually said in the corner, differ just a bit. Move, move, move. Dance, 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 you know? I mean, um, they believe you're Muhammad Ali out there. Have a little fun out there, but don't fight. Hey, it's round the oh, you need it now. No. You need this now. You're winning the fight. You don't have to fight the 12th round. No, the fight is hanging on this round here, Mel. This is okay, yeah. champ. This is the last and final round. No, you want to be champ of the world? His corner was telling him, it's close. You got to go out there and fight. The fight is hanging on this round here, Mel. This is okay. It wasn't even close. I didn't know what fight the corner was watching. Melder Keller was not going to back down from Chavez. He was not going to give Chavez the satisfaction of making him fight in a manner not befitting a Philadelphia fighter. Cuts glove, cuts glove. If you're a fight fan, get ready for three minutes of high drama now as a desperate and determined Julio Cesar Chavez tries to take out a fading and battered Meldrick Taylor who has completely dominated him for most of the fight. Early in round 12, the only question on everybody's mind was, can Taylor finish the fight on his feet? If he does, he wins. Two minutes to go. Maybe two minutes left in Julio Cesar Chavez's historic unbeaten streak. It was like watching someone leading the Boston Marathon for 25 miles and they're falling apart. That is a tired Meldrick Taylor slipping to the canvas. Can this guy just get to the finish line? Both of Taylor's eyes are closing. The blood continues to flow from his nose and his mouth. But if he stands up, he wins. I do remember feeling that the sand was running out of Taylor's hourglass. So I'm watching, and I'm thinking, is this kid going to be able to finish? There it was, 25 seconds left in the round. You know who was winning the fight. And all of a sudden, if he gets up, he probably wins the fight. Unbelievable! Richard Steele stopped the fight with fewer than five seconds to go. You're gonna watch Lou Duva go crazy now. You're gonna watch Lou Duva go absolutely berserk. This is one of the most unusual calls by a referee in the whole history of the sport. Five seconds left. I cannot believe they stopped that fight. I was shocked when Steele stopped the fight. The official time will be 2.58 of the 12th round he knocked him out with two seconds left. What are you doing stopping this fight? You're giving a victory away. This guy's earned the right. He's a champion. He got up. What are you doing stopping the fight? Richard, you describe the end of the fight and why you stopped it. Well, Larry, I stopped it because, you know, Melger had took a lot of good shots, a lot of hard shots. When that famous right hand that Julio Cesar Chavez landed, he went down like there was no more life in him. He got up, he pulled himself up. And I asked him twice, are you all right? Are you all right? You okay? You okay? And he could not continue. Well, I don't care about the time. When I see a man that has enough, I'm stopping the fight. Not only was I infuriated, I was Italian mad. He says, I don't know what time it is. All I know is I've got a hurt fighter in front of me. I don't want him to get hit anymore. Bullshit. I don't believe that there. He got up. He, count, he started to pick up the count. At six, he got up. I thought we had got jobbed. This fight should have been mine. This should have been in the basket. I had leaned in on the scorecards. And then it was premature that Richard Steele would do something like this. The controversial ending was filled with subplots. Taylor's trainers were criticized for convincing him that he needed to win the final round. Lou Duva was criticized for jumping onto the ring apron, which distracted Taylor and caused him to look to his right just as Steele asked him to respond to critical questions. And Steele was criticized for not being aware of the flashing red light right behind Taylor that signified the last 10 seconds of the 12th round. His decision immediately became one of the most debated in boxing history. I think that Richard Steele made a bad stoppage. 
Meldrick Taylor had fought his heart out, he had earned the right of those extra two seconds. It was hard initially to step back and really look at what had happened. Uh, one guy got assaulted at the end is what happened. So should they have stopped the fight? Yeah, they should have stopped the fight. His expression said it all. I mean, uh, he couldn't believe that he lost. Today, every time I think about that fight, I think about that expression on his face. If the fight had gone to the scorecards, Meldrick Taylor would have won a split decision victory. But no matter the outcome, he paid a high price. I examined Meldrick right after the fight, sent him to the hospital. Meldrick had a facial fracture. He was urinating pure blood. His face was grotesquely swollen. This was a kid who was truly beaten up to the face, the body, and the brain. You rarely see guys of that world-class caliber beaten so decisively to the point where their bodies are utterly gone. Once it's beaten out of you, it's gone forever. From Culiacan, Mexico, Julio Cesar Chavez. In Mexico, this fight turned Chavez into a heroic, almost legendary figure. Chavez would remain unbeaten for the next 21 fights before finally losing in 1994. Meldrick Taylor never truly recovered. Meldrick Taylor lost everything that night. He didn't just lose a title belt. He was never going to be Meldrick Taylor again. In the years following the loss to Chavez, Taylor's life and career propelled into a downward spiral, marked by diminished skills inside the ring, financial and legal problems outside of it, and most worrisome, this. Oh, it's funny not to me because uh, the media wrote bad things about me. The not my name said I was washed up. Today at 36, Taylor continues to fight, despite evidence that he shouldn't. Taylor back in 1992 won lost awesome my title, but... Meldrick is the classic great champion that won't quit. Someone that continued on with his career as best he could, but who shows all the evidence of chronic brain injury. I mean, I'm at the beginning of the prime of my career, and I think I'm going to really excel in, in this fight. I'm going to propel me as the best fighter pound for pound in the world. It's going to make me a superstar. People say a lot of things about, about me, about my career. I shouldn't be fighting no more, and it's not true. So I'm here to prove myself that I'm still the same fighter I was. This man should not be in the ring, should not be training in the gym. It makes me feel embarrassed for the sport that anyone would allow him to fight. If I had to use one word of where Meldrick Taylor's life is now, I would say tragic. But he should have had his victory for his own personal pride, for the satisfaction of knowing that he did it. Because Meldrick Taylor was special. You just don't see many better fights. Skill, will, close competition, bizarre circumstances, strong personalities. That fight had it all. It turned out to be a great fight. It really a great moment in my life. I never regretted what I did. It was as barbaric as it was beautiful. It was probably the best fight of the decade. It's painful to see what has happened to Meldrick Taylor. Among his many hurts, a one-sided knockout loss to Chavez in their 1994 rematch. And though referee Richard Steele continued to officiate fights in Las Vegas for another decade, he caught fewer and fewer of the top assignments until he left the ring behind for good in 2001. Thanks for watching The Tale of Chavez Taylor. Hello, I'm Jim Lampley. Welcome to this look back at the stories behind the Holyfield Bow Trilogy, possibly the most memorable series of fights in 30 years of boxing on HBO. When Mike Tyson was convicted of rape and sent off to prison in early 1992, Evander Holyfield was left to search for other ways of proving that he was, as he said, the real deal. He chose to fight the best young American heavyweight, Olympic silver medalist Riddick Bow. What followed was the greatest heavyweight trilogy since Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier. 
As heavyweight champion Evander Holyfield prepared to meet Riddick Bowe in 1992, he was regarded as an undersized overachiever. As a light heavyweight in the 1984 Olympics, he suffered a controversial disqualification. As a pro, he won the 190-pound title, which had little public appeal. Though lacking the natural size of a heavyweight, Holyfield set his mind to conquering that division as well. My coach told me at eight years old that I could be the heavyweight champ of the world. I hadn't reached a goal. If I would have just stayed the junior heavyweight champ of the world, been undefeated and retired. He had the skills and smarts. But what made him special was his belief that he could break his opponent's will, no matter his size. I chose to be insecure about what I thought the people would say. I wanted to prove to the guy, you know, you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you back. Holyfield always talked about how he would box. And then, of course, he would get hit, and he would start a brawl, and that was his nature. The bigger his opponents, the bigger his will seemed to grow. There was a, a moment in the Holyfield Foreman fight. Another left hook, and a right. When Evander went after George and landed 18, 19 punches in a row, he just wasn't going to take no for an answer. But his inability to KO former champions Foreman and Larry Holmes seemed to confirm the view he was an outstanding fighter, but not the type of dominant heavyweight fans preferred. People thought of him as a blown up light heavyweight, a blown up cruiserweight. There was this thought that he was just holding on to a title that still really belonged to Mike Tyson. Tyson had lost the crown, perhaps the biggest upset in boxing history, to 40 to one underdog Buster Douglas in Tokyo. Eight months later, Holyfield won the championship by knocking out Douglas in the third. Still, respect was elusive. And they said, you know, the only reason why you won that because this guy was overweight. And I knocked him out, but people said, well, Tyson hit him harder than that. After a dynamic powerhouse like Mike Tyson, Evander Holyfield wasn't appreciated for the great fighter he was. It was hard for people to accept that someone can be the heavyweight champ of the world and not be as big a puncher as Tyson. Only a fight with Tyson could convince the skeptics, and one was scheduled for November of 1991. However, delays caused first by an injury to Tyson's rib and later by his rape conviction deprived fight fans of the most eagerly anticipated heavyweight fight in years. With Tyson in prison, Holyfield scheduled a giant of a young fighter from Tyson's neighborhood in Brooklyn, the unbeaten Riddick Bowe. There were questions about Bowe's qualifications. The knock on him was that he was lazy. There were rumors all the time. He had to be barred from going to the kitchen during training. It was difficult to get him to get up and do his road work. I was with Riddick when he was an amateur, and uh, we had a lot of fun, but he never showed the drive to be a champion. Louie brought him in and as a sparring partner for Tyrell Biggs. Tyrell was beating the living shit out of him every day, primarily because he was just going through the motions. But no one questioned Bo's pure talent for fighting. We knew that he had the size, we knew he had the speed, we knew he had the strength and the talent. What we didn't know was whether if, when the going got tough, whether he was going to be able to step it up. As he showed against trial horses Pierre Coetzer and Bigfoot Martin, Bo was not the usual plotting giant. Taking on Holyfield for the title, however, would require a new level of commitment. He was the guy that I boxed when I was an amateur, he was a professional. But I knew that from his attitude and his makeup, when your father got like it the Holyfield, I mean, I'm gonna tell you, your father comes to get it. So I never underestimated him. You never saw a more focused, more serious Riddick Bell. It was perhaps the best training camp that we've ever had. Bo was ready to fight for the title. A crowd of 18,000 awaits the fourth title defense for Evander Holyfield, a defense which now becomes the biggest test for respect in his two-year reign as champion. On November 13, 1992, the challenger appeared ready, but few anticipated the ferocious encounter we'd see that night. The question in the air was, how would Bo deal with the kind of pressure and firestorm that Holyfield was capable of bringing to him? And they brawl in the center of the ring. Bo has answered 
some questions early in this fight. He was showing a real willingness for combat. Holyfield intended to box and flurry with Bo, as he had against Douglas. But that plan was quickly abandoned. He hit me so hard. And but because of pride, I stayed out so long, both my eye was swollen up so I couldn't see from the outside. So it's just a night of me standing there toe to toe. Fighting at this furious pace, many felt Bo would wilt. Ritter Bo used to be my sparring partner. A smart fighter, good hand speed, inside and outside. But he was known for running out of gas. The left and a right by Holyfield and the left. These are solid shots, but the champion does not seem able to hurt Riddick Bowe. Now, why didn't he run out of gas? Round by round, the excitement was building, but it was the 10th round which took the fight into the stratosphere. Bowe stuns him with an uppercut, and just like that, the champion struggles to stay on his feet. What a hard fight, Holyfield. He's going to stay on his feet. He's hanging in there. He hit me with an uppercut. Oh, oh it just... The shot, oh, you know, all of a sudden, you know, I know that I'm hit. Now I go on defense, and he's swinging for life. Gets away from the right hand, blocks another one. Bo throwing and throwing, now goes to the body. Holyfield somehow standing up. Riddick laid so much punishment on Evander in the first minute and a half of the round that it was pretty hard to fathom how Evander was standing up. Joe Cortez watching. Champion gets the benefit of the doubt. It was just a matter of him getting hit one more devastating blow before I would have stopped it. However, Holyfield has been known to get staggered and come back. If you can feel the pain, then you're still in the game. It's when you don't feel the pain, you're out. This damn pit bull from Georgia would not go down. Evander Holyfield's incredible powers of recovery once again on display. And all of a sudden, the storm got quiet. Uh-oh now. Oh boy, I'm gonna hurt you. All of a sudden he had Riddick on the run, and for the last 30 seconds of the round, you're wondering how Riddick is gonna finish. Look at Holyfield! What a warrior! Reversing the tide of the battle! The champion now has bow wobbling! And he lands the right hand! Everybody in the Thomas and Max Center on their feet! A right hand by Holyfield! Another. Round 10 continues after the bell. And when the bell rung, I said, man, I just had 10 more seconds. Now, now in the whole fight, now that's the only round that I was wishing that it could have been a little bit more time. I said to myself, this cat here, you all right. I was impressed with him, you know. Pat him on the stomach at the end of the round. I mean, that's a good round, you know. They both survived the storm but it took more out of Holyfield than Bo. Holyfield was floored in the 11th. Oh, Holyfield in serious trouble now, and he's gonna go down. Again, Holyfield proved his resilience. The champion entered the 12th, needing a knockout to retain the title. It was not to be. From the back of the arena now, they begin to rise and applaud what has been an extraordinary battle between two men of heart and will and courage. It could have been one of those old fights that went 20, 30 rounds. The bell rang to end the 12th round, and it was like, you know, they were saying 12 rounds isn't enough. We need to go until somebody can't go anymore. And new heavyweight champion of the world, Riddick. And they were devastating to me. Did he win? Oh, yeah, 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 he, he won. And he won it the right way. He took the fight. Riddick Bowe emphatically answered any doubts about his resolve. His heart had always been questioned. And I felt like, God damn it, question this. Look at this man. Look at this athlete. Look at this competitor. And Holyfield's valor showed that a heavyweight champion could be measured by qualities other than power. There is no doubt whatsoever that the 10th round completely won over all the skeptics for Holyfield. Following the loss, Holyfield briefly considered retirement before winning a decision over journeyman Alex Stewart in June of 1993. Bo's life, of course, changed overnight. The heavyweight championship is what you make of it, and Bo's manager, the newcomer Rock Newman, 
intended to make a lot of it. I remember thinking, Rock Newman has a heavyweight champion. We're going to see some entertaining things. Newman had Bo toss his WBC championship belt into a trash can, scrapping an understanding that he would fight Lennox Lewis. If anyone has criticism of me because I fought, scratched, and clawed for my client's interest, bring that criticism on. To further promote the personable new champion, Newman took Bo on an Ali-like world tour. It expanded Bo's horizons and his waistline. I got a chance to meet the Pope. Um, I was in Somalia, I was in Germany, I was all over the place. By the time you get to traveling all over the world and shaking people's hand and smiling, you don't get a chance to train. Rock Newman is a smart guy who thinks out of the box, and he was going to try to market Bo as a world figure. He outthought himself. To this day, a defiant Newman disagrees. In spite of the fact that many say that the world tour had something to do with his problems, he came back, he went into training, he fought Jesse Ferguson in May. It is a fight that Eddie Futch says that he thought that Bo looked better than he had ever looked, ever. Whether or not the world tour adversely affected Bo, a bigger distraction was a constant battle of the bulge. Bo was not a partier, was not a drinker, smoker, or drugger. What he did is he gorged himself. If there was a piece of cake over there that I was, that was, you know, telling me to come get it, I went and got it. It was clear when Bo met Holyfield for the rematch that Bo did more eating than training. It's more than just the extra 11 pounds. He looks softer all over, right, George? He is not proud of his body tonight. Holyfield added 12 pounds, but it was all muscle demonstrating that his hunger was only to recapture the title he had lost. With new trainer Emmanuel Stewart, Holyfield agreed to stick to the strategy he abandoned in the first fight. I says, we're gonna beat him with rhythm, speed, techniques, moves that would make Riddick Bowe's larger size become a handicap instead of an advantage. The change worked as Holyfield dictated a more deliberate pace in the early rounds. Holyfield has got the fight in his hand now. He's double jabbing. Everything he does, he, he moves first and then he retreats good afterwards. By adopting a different strategic tack, Evander had thrown Riddick just enough off balance to, to make it a different fight. He was standing out of harm's way. He kind of frustrated me with his movement. Bo throwing one punch at a time. I was counter punching, then I was able to lead. That second fight was, you know, it was a masterpiece. A masterpiece that looked like it would go unfinished. And somebody in a parachute has just landed on the edge of the ring, has been pulled away by security guards. The fight has been brought to a halt. There's a massive melee at ringside. I see this guy come crashing into the road. When it did that, uh, you know, that look on my face and Red Bow, like, turned around looking. He was kind of skeptical and looked back like I was joking. I thought he seen King Kong. Chaos. Surreal. Just bizarre. We were disoriented. No one knew what this meant. I thought, this has got to be a dream. Maybe I didn't wake up in time. Couldn't be real. The fight stopped. People reaching over and pulling him down and starting to pound him. He got his ass thoroughly smashed. I saw Caesar's Palace security. I saw our security. I saw the fruit of Islam. Everyone converging on this guy. I was thinking, does he have a weapon? Is he carrying a bomb? And people began to scream. And some people pull out their guns. I grabbed Mrs. Boy and we hit the floor because we figured they were going to be shooting would be in, in our direction. My first thought was it was an attempt on either Farrakhan or Jesse Jackson's life. Pandemonium broke out. This is a monumental disaster. Right now, police are filing by me at ringside and grabbing this gentleman who has created a monstrosity of an interruption in the bout. With Fan Man finally removed, the question became, what next? I don't know what we would have done if they would have refused to fight anymore. Um, 
I knew that Bo's wife was taken on a stretcher that night. I have just gotten word that Riddick Bo's wife has just fainted at ringside. Gentlemen, she's in the early stages of her fourth pregnancy. She's fainted with excitement and maybe even fear. We had to take her out. I thought about it for a long time, standing there, if I should go with her, if I should stay here. To the extent that we could have some coherent discussion, it really focused on him feeling a need to get out of the ring and go be with his pregnant wife versus whether or not he should stay there and fight and try to defend his title. I never wanted people to say that Riddick Bo was a quitter. He could have continued to fight, but he got out the ring or whatever the case may be, so I didn't want to open that door. After a 21-minute delay, the fight resumed in round seven, already in progress. One minute, 50 seconds remain in the round. Well, I suppose that if a wasp came into Picasso's studio and stung him on the nose. He'd go and get some ice and go right back to his easel, and that's what the fighters did. Who had benefited from the delay? Bo saw his wife in distress. Holyfield saw a weary opponent get a rest. If it wasn't been for that man that flew in, you know, <laughs> for the short night. When the fight resumes, he come out there, he start throwing punches. I was overwhelmed. It takes me damn it to end the fight to get warmed back up. And by this time, I'm behind on points. I realized that what I have won is six round. But you know what? The fight is over at the 12. Left, right combination. Bo misses with the uppercut. Should have used my jab because he couldn't get away from the jab and he couldn't get around it. But if I had used my jab a little bit better. I don't want to fight hands down. Riddick still had his moments. Holyfield staying in, becoming a target. Bow starting to heat up. It was a really close fight. It was doggone near impossible to separate them and try to figure out who had actually won the fight. So close, in fact, that the scoring of the disrupted seventh round played a major role in Holyfield regaining the title. The three judges, one scored it for Bow, one scored it even, one scored it for Holyfield. If the judge who scored it for Holofield would have scored that round for Bo, then Bo would have kept his title, would have turned out to be a draw. And so this fan man may have caused a change in boxing history. Holyfield had recaptured the title, but subsequently lost it to Michael Moore. During the course of that bout, major health concerns arose. A vandal complained of pain in his shoulder. He developed some shortness of breath, and there appeared to be a, an obvious problem with his heart. I'll read a statement. He was transferred back to Emory, and they concurred. They showed a model of his heart and talked about the problems. What we see with his heart, though, is the elasticity is not quite normal, that it, it doesn't expand as easily as we would expect the heart to do. Not satisfied with these conclusions, Holyfield visited a faith healer and pronounced himself fit to fight. The Nevada State Athletic Commission, however, needed medical evidence. I'm a medical guy. I can only look at, at black and white and a database. So we sent Evander to the Mayo Clinic for the most intensive medical evaluation any athlete in history has been through. The doctor there was able to let me know that, you know, you weren't born with a heart condition. And what has happened is that they overhydrate you and they gave you too much morphine which caused my heart to blow up so in time that the heart is, it went back down and it's all right he said you are right to fight satisfied with the results of the mayo clinic evaluation the nevada state athletic commission granted holyfield a license which meant a rubber match with bow no title would be at stake but it was still the biggest heavyweight fight that could be made it was perhaps the most brutal of the three fights. Hard right hand by Bo. Holyfield comes back with a left. They both absorbed a tremendous amount of punishment. A persistent theme in the trilogy, hunting after the bell. Holyfield was quickly exhausted, raising concerns that his heart was in distress again. This is a very dangerous fight, as far as I'm concerned, for Evander Holyfield. This man is, can, is not able to catch a second win. This man is going to end up in a pine box. I understand the frustration and the concern of George Foreman. So, you know, this guy's going to die, but it, it wasn't my heart. But what it was, 
was something that could have endangered his life by weakening him in the ring. Recent revelations explain Holyfield's fatigue. I wrapped his hands every morning. He was sitting there and his eyes was yellow as I don't know what. I said, man, what's, what's wrong with you? I didn't know it till after the fight, but Evander had, had contracted hepatitis. I eaten some seafood and got hepatitis A, and my doctor told me, you shouldn't fight. Your energy level gonna go up and down, up and down. Despite being diagnosed with hepatitis A, Holyfield chose to fight. By round five, he appeared to be finished. Holyfield taking a couple Stop. of heavy shots. Stop. Holyfield is really hurting. He just became 33 going on 53. It looked like he was all through as a fighter, like he had spent so much to prove what he had proven. I recall thinking the end is near for Holyfield. And then early on the sixth round, I ran it through left hook to the body, through left hook to my shoulder. Ain't no big deal. Boom! Everything went blank. As promised by his doctor, though, Holyfield's energy surge wouldn't last. And now Holyfield seems to have run out of gas. He was hurt, and, and I didn't do that because I didn't have the energy to finish. He let a bow off the hook. I had Holyfield been able to hurt bow a little bit more in that round, I would have had no choice but to stop the contest. I was disappointed myself. I had the courage to get in that ring that way. But when it came to the final test, to just throw in a few punches and not worry about how I felt, I didn't do it. Holyfield had one more energy surge in the eighth round. He was capable of those 20 seconds of throwback to what you had seen before. and then just as suddenly gone again. Third knockdown this on Holyfield's it. career. Here comes the, the fourth, and that's it. That's it, that's it. There was this shell of Holyfield there in the ring where Evander's flaming spirit had once been. With that, the trilogy came to a close with Bo having won two of the three bouts. The boxing world was witnessing the beginning of an end, a surprise end. I always figured Holyfield would be the guy who'd come out for the worse. Turns out <laughs> that the guy who was really hurt in this trilogy was Bo, physically and psychologically. Indeed, Bo's career had peaked against Evander Holyfield. He fought just twice more, taking bad beatings in disqualification wins against Andrew Galata. Riddick Bo allowed his worst instincts to take over, and his worst instincts were laziness, gluttony, if he was driven by anything, he was driven by hunger to eat, but certainly not by hunger to be great. By contrast, Holyfield's legend kept rolling along. We thought after the third fight that this would be the end of Holyfield's run as a great fighter. But of course, it worked the other way. Holyfield regrouped to have more great fights, as he did most famously against Mike Tyson. While the Tyson fights helped define Holyfield's high standing in history, the epic bow fights defined him in victory and defeat as the noblest of warriors. You saw the best of Evander Holyfield and you saw the best of Riddick Bow. These two guys were made for each other. It would have been impossible for anyone to foresee that the seemingly spent shell of Holyfield we saw in that third fight against Bo would knock out Mike Tyson just 12 months later. It might have been equally difficult to envision the demise of Bo, whose two ensuing fights with Andrew Galata were as bizarre in their way as Fan Man's flight. As for the man on the paraglider, James Miller was found dead on a trail in Alaska at age 39 in March 2003. Thanks for watching The Tale of Holyfield Bo. Hello, I'm Jim Lampley. Welcome to this look back at stories behind Moorer Foreman, one of the most memorable fights in 30 years of boxing on HBO. The 1994 battle between brand new heavyweight champion Michael Moorer and former champion George Foreman was a pairing of opposites. The standoffish Moorer was a mystery to many, best known as the sport's first ever southpaw heavyweight king. 
Foreman was a grandfatherly pitch man nearly 20 years older than Moore, with an unlikely long shot to become the oldest man ever to wear the crown. The heavyweight championship of the world. I get up in the morning, I want it. I go to bed at night, I dream about it. What really sustains him is not just the power in his fists, but the power of his will. I think deep at heart, Michael was a reluctant champion. He's got a lot of heart. I want to kill those people that question that. Back then, I couldn't see it as it was happening. Moore seems to be gaining confidence. Teddy always taught me, fighter, you're able to fight anybody at any time. He's a 45-year-old man in a young man's game. George could break ribs with punches. Starting to get the Moore's respect. George has sweatshirts older than Moore. Other than being boxers, there was nothing in common at all. In 1988, Michael Moore arrived at the Kronk Gym in Detroit, a program unparalleled in the production of champion boxers. A small town kid from Manesson, Pennsylvania, Moore quickly adapted to his new surroundings. When you fought inside the gym, you gained a lot of notoriety, recognition on what you did in the ring. And I kicked a lot of ass in there. We turned him professionally in March of 1988. And in December of 1988, on nationwide television, he was the new light heavyweight championship of the world. What a cut, man. Warren just putting Hassan away as the referee Brady steps between, and he has pulled it. Manual promoted him as the next Tommy Hearns. And so from day one, he was under a lot of pressure. Michael Moore was definitely one of the greatest light heavyweights I've had in the history of boxing. Michael Moore had knocked out every opponent he faced as a light heavyweight. With nothing left to prove in the light heavyweight division, he became a heavyweight, facing men often 80 pounds heavier than any previous opponent. White goes down less than a minute into the fight. By the time that Michael Moore had began fighting as a heavyweight, he also had made big changes in his mental makeup. He wanted to do things more his way. Regardless of what you would tell him, he wanted to prove you wrong. So in 1991, Michael Moore moved out of Emanuel Stewart's house in Detroit, which he thought of as a home. His trainer and surrogate father had sold his contractual interests. For nearly two years, Moore had a series of trainers, many of whom questioned his desire and mental makeup. I had heard that he was a guy that would walk out in the middle of sparring. And I said, this is a guy who's just unsure of himself. In 1993, Moore's manager, John Davamos, hired trainer Teddy Atlas, whose reputation was of a tough, loving disciplinarian. He would push me, and I'd push him right back. He wasn't taking any shit, neither was I. He had been abandoned by a father. He had been abandoned in certain situations professionally, so he wanted a test to see if you were really going to be there, if you weren't going to disappear. There's no question that Teddy was the right guy at the right time. He was my trainer, and he was also my friend. A person who taught me a lot. I love Teddy. I'm sure he feels the same way about me. He won't say it, because that's that tough guy image. In only their second fight together, Moore and Atlas walked into the ring to face the greatest challenge of their collective careers, a heavyweight championship fight with Evander Holyfield. Let's get it on! Michael Moore, get it on. Short punches inside, doing damage for Moore. Already his punching power, a factor in the battle. Holyfield knocks it down. Early in the fight, Atlas confronted Moore about his passive approach in the biggest fight of his life. You go in there and you start backing this guy up and you start doing what we trained to do. Otherwise, don't come back to this fucking corner. Do you hear me? Where's the fight? Where's the passion? Where's the desperate need to win the title? You're lying to yourself because you're gonna cry tomorrow. You're lying to yourself and I'd lie to you if I let you get away with that. Boxing tradition suggests that a challenger must take the title from a champion, especially a respected champion like Evander Holyfield. Atlas worried Moore wasn't doing enough. It comes a time in a man's life, but he makes a decision to just live, survive, or he wants to win. You're doing just enough to keep him off you and hope he leaves you alone. Can Moore win a championship this way? Does he have to show some passion and make something happen? Or can he just go along trying to win each round? Do you want round? me to change places with you? You're blowing it. 
You're blowing it. You're satisfied just to do enough to keep him off you. You can't do that now. In this world, we can't do that all the time. You heard it. That's as good as anybody can say it. As the fight progressed, Moore began to heed Atlas's instructions and went after Holyfield. To many, it seemed Teddy Atlas willed Michael Moore to victory. They made him the star, but I was the fighter who brought that out. One last assault from the challenger. Was there anything in particular that he said that rung a bell when he said this is the one opportunity in a lifetime, you've got 12 minutes to go? He told me this is for my son, and I pushed, I pushed hard for my son. In addition to the credit given to Teddy Atlas, the legitimacy of Moore's victory was called into question by rumors surrounding the health of Evander Holyfield. Evander went to the hospital to have his eye sutured. At that point, he developed some shortness of breath, he got some fluid in his lungs, and there appeared to be a, an obvious problem with his heart. The circumstances involving, involving Evander Holyfield after the fight were so unfair for Michael because it made his victory almost shallow. They, they took away from me winning the championship and focused it on him having a heart attack, so-called heart attack. Coming off the Holyfield win, he felt like he had something to prove. George Foreman also had something to prove. As a young man, Foreman was regarded as one of the sport's most brutal contenders. He's not normal. He was never normal. Frazier has never taken this kind of punishment. And he goes down at the bell. When he hit Joe Frazier, I thought the world was coming to an end. down and go. It goes down again. That George Foreman intimidated the hell out of a lot of opponents. He would just come in, growl, throw punches, and go home. George was once as feral a figure or as demonic a figure as Mike Tyson. Easy. George was kind of a freak. George was unusual. George was one of a kind. If you could survive one or two rounds with me, which would be a lot of pain and probably a, a lot of heartbreak in your life because not only could I hurt you for those f few rounds, two or three rounds of my previous career, I could really do damage to your, your body physically and your brain. But Foreman would soon meet his match. In 1974, he fought Muhammad Ali in Zaire and lost the championship of the world. The reason why he lost the title to Ali, not because Ali was better than he was, Look, George had one thing in his mind, destroy Ali. And I remember beating this guy, beating this guy, and hitting him upside the head. The next thing you know, I retreated just a little bit. Ali, a sneaky right hand. Another sneaky right hand. When I was on the floor, losing the championship of the world. If you look at those film clips carefully and watch Zach Clayton's count, Foreman is up at nine, and so beaten, he just goes to his corner, just walks off. He was beaten mentally more than physically. The bitter memories of losing his title haunted Foreman. He retired in 1977, and for the next 10 years, served as an evangelist minister in his hometown of Houston, Texas. The little fame and fortune we get is not going to follow us in the grave, brother and sister. 13 years after losing the heavyweight title, he began his seemingly impossible quest to regain it. George came to me and said, Butch, I'm coming back in boxing. What do you think about handling it? And I, I, I talked to him and I, I said, George, this is a young man's sport. You should leave it alone. His return to the ring in 1987 was greeted with mocking laughter from the media. When this comeback started, I was one of the guys going, oh, come on. Please, boy, you know, some guys will do anything for a buck. Two, five, seven. Two, five, seven. His physique was not as appealing as it was many years ago. I had to hear all of that, and this is why I had to be in the most supreme condition of my life. The public image of George Foreman was that of a disturbed and defeated former champ. By his own admission, Foreman returned to boxing for the money and nurtured a new, consumer-friendly image in the process. Oh, George. I was a salesman. I'd learned to be a salesman. I had 10 years out of boxing to be an evangelist, and I'd understood if you don't really make some noise and make people pay some attention, no one is going to stop and listen to you. Foreman persevered for several years, 
facing opponents who range from dangerous to worthy to highly overmatched. When he first came out of retirement, he was considered a better story than fighter because of his selection of opponents. This perception changed overnight. Right hand on the surface of Holyfield's head. In 1991, Foreman fought Evander Holyfield in his first attempt to regain the title. His fight with Holyfield was terrific, and he really fought well and fought bravely. And people started to look at George Foreman in a different light. And they're applauding George Foreman for his courage and persistence. With his well-constructed comeback in its seventh year, Foreman found himself in line for a title shot. Mike Tyson was away in prison. Evander Holyfield and Riddick Bowe were in the process of deteriorating each other. Lennox Lewis had lost unexpectedly to Oliver McCall, so the landscape was open. A few days after Michael Mora beat Evander Holyfield, I got a call from George. And I said, George, you can't kid me. You want to fight Michael Mora. And he said more than anything else in the world, get me that fight. Many still doubted whether at age 45, Foreman could recapture the title taking on a 26-year-old heavyweight champion. But George continued being his own pitch man. I just want to go out there, show the world that 45 and 55 is not a death sentence. We can do anything we want to do. He sort of became everybody's friend and a great quote. Let me talk to George. George will give me a quote. You know, he, he didn't even ask you, what do you need? In contrast, Mora resembled a young foreman, disturbed, disgruntled, and disenchanted. They're looking for something that the average person at home will say, I gotta watch this. Michael Moore just didn't offer that much verbally for people to catch on to it. While Foreman moved the public, Moore lost patience with his antics. I knew what Teddy had told me, like, this is a, he's a big con. And I just look at him like, go get me a sandwich and sit down. Man, you're so fake. Moore had even less patience with the media. Back then, I was probably very confrontational. He was worse than reclusive. He was almost antagonistic to the point where you almost felt, not knowing any better, that it might be dangerous to be with him. If you asked a question that he felt was stupid, he would say, that's a stupid question. And to myself, I'd be just ask, I was going to ask me the big, dumbest question ever. You're right, everyone does ask that question. And now, you know how sports writers are. They're the smartest guys in the room. So they don't want to hear that from a fighter. I'm not going to put on no act or put on no show for nobody. People already thought he was a little mean, so we said, everybody thinks he's mean? Well, let's run with it anyway. So now you have the good versus evil. Tonight, live from the MGM Grand in Las Vegas, Nevada, HBO Sports presents World Championship Boxing as Michael Moore, WBA and IBF heavyweight champion, defends his title against the one and only George Foreman. There are a lot of skeptics out there who think that George now is more King Khan than King Kong. George hasn't earned this championship shot as a fighter. He hasn't fought in a year and a half, and on that inauspicious occasion, he lost to Tommy Morrison. On the other hand, George is a star, and stardom like age has its privileges. There are many, many champions and very, very few stars. That's why he's here. On November 5th, 1994, Michael Moore headed into the ring to fight 45-year-old George Foreman. Moore was looking to impress the public who ignored him, the media who questioned him, and the trainer who became a star instead of him. Has Teddy Atlas received too much credit? And he was going to do it his way. And he booed me. That doesn't matter. I was still a champion. Michael knew, he's not a dummy, that that night in the arena, if they seat 19,000, 18,500 were going to be cheering for Foreman. Foreman looked to become the oldest heavyweight champion in boxing history. But despite the optimism of the crowd, few gave Foreman more than a puncher's chance. At that point, I just thought that middle-aged men don't knock out 25-year-old heavyweight champions. I'm the boss man in here. Take hands, good luck. Left and a right inside by Moore. Sizzling. Solid left hand over the top, backing Foreman up again. 
Sharp right by Mora, who seems to be gaining confidence. I like that he was starting to feel good about being champ and feel confident and trying to fulfill what everyone said he wasn't. Teddy might have created a monster. So it's a guy. Our spawn partners were better. Teddy always knew that instilling confidence in Michael was one of the keys to getting him to perform at a certain level. I have a sense here, Gil, that Moore feels as though he has felt Foreman's power and it's not going to hurt him. That could be a big mistake. I had no intention of throwing out my power at him in the first, second, and third round. He didn't have control over the fight. He didn't have control over me. And my intentions were to extend him and make certain that when I hit him with one shot, he would not get up. And there's no reason for you to stand there and let him find you. George with a strong start in round five. Moore is still standing right in front of him. Big right hand. That's the best right hand of the fight by George Foreman. I never could understand why he was being so courageous. Standing in front of a big man like that. Moore allowing Foreman to land. And the big man is getting off to good effect in round six. I don't think we've seen him yet follow Atlas's instructions to move away and put more distance between himself and George. Listen to me, you're not gonna have a real friendly corner. I'm proud of you, but you're not gonna have a friendly corner if you keep letting him go slow, all right? You're gonna make him go faster? I thought I was doing fine, but he's on the outside looking in. I can't see what he sees. He can't see what I see. Harold Letterman, how do you see it so far? Jim, six rounds to one, commanding five-point lead for Michael Moore. So I can perfectly understand how if if Teddy was saying, do this, do that, between rounds four, five, and six, and seven, Michael was thinking, why do I need to listen to anything? Everything I do is working. What people don't remember is up until the 10th round, Michael fought the best fight of his career. I mean, he was tremendous that night. I think he was brilliant for the first nine rounds. He was doing everything right, but I was doing something he had not prepared for. You can see Foreman loading up with that right hand. I'm surprised that Moore couldn't see it. How can you say he was setting me up for a one-two? I don't think Teddy Adler's and those trainers knew exactly what I was doing. That's bullshit. Totally. What's not bullshit is that George knew his best chance to hit you was with a blind punch you wouldn't see. At the end of the last round, I thought Michael Moore had found the key. He was moving to his right, and he was really picking George apart. He comes out this round, and he goes right back to his left again. Michael Moore was falling into a trap. There was a case where George set him up for that right hand, but just couldn't pull the trigger. That's those slow reflexes. I think the myth of George's power has been exposed by Michael Moore so far. He was swollen up. He, he was losing. He was starting to wonder whether or not he was going to pull it off. And George makes it out of the round that bedeviled him in Zaire 20 years ago. I fought Muhammad Ali in Africa, and I know what it felt when he got in the ring and everyone was cheering for him. I could hurt him, but the crowd just kept him on his feet. Now, for the first time in my life, I was feeling the same thing. Here was a guy that was clearly on a mission in his own life. He just knew you were dealing with something that mentally was a little different. Foreman's strategy was not simply to land one punch, but rather a series of punches to set up what would most likely be his last shot to make history. I was able to get a body punch in, just one body shot. He threw that left hook just to move this guy. I gotta get him to move this way. If he moves this way, I'm not gonna be able to land this punch. I would hurt them. I'd use the old cattle tactics. So he was calm. He had the ability to think like that. I knew then if I knocked him down once, he would have to stay down. Win or lose, George is gonna have a left eye swollen shot tonight. George's best punch is still that left jab. And my jab was gonna be the most important punch in the boxing match. He'd still snap a left jab out, but not do much else. He says, ah, don't worry, Mike, you know, I'm an old man. Don't worry about that. And you stand there, and then all of a sudden, boom, bang, there's a right hand right behind it. Don't stay there because he's looking to set you up one shot, and then he'll open up a combination for the hit you. The irony of this fight is both simple and complex. With nine minutes left and a head on all judges' cards by a large margin, all Michael Moore had to do was stay away. Instead, he fought like a heavyweight champion. Right hand landed there. And another. And a right and a left, and suddenly Moore stops punching, and it's Foreman's initiative. The first punch I hit him with was the straight right. It was just a little too high. He didn't move out of the way because he was kind of stunned. And Moore later told me that he was basically out on his feet before the last one-two. 
I expected him to fall, it didn't. And I said right then I was going to lower it just a little bit. Is that on go four on the right hand? An unbelievably close in right hand shot. Four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It happened. It happened. I think that George has advanced ring intelligence. I had this all planned out for the previous three months. Bullshit. Don't, don't fake it. You got lucky. Don't sit there and say you, you planned it by no means. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I was crushing him for 10 rounds. Nobody had any idea that I was setting this fight up all night. I don't have no bad feelings against George, but don't, don't say that you set this up because you're lying then. You're lying. Now Michael Moore, is that on go four on the right hand? An unbelievably close in. He never saw it coming. Everything disconnected. My body was completely dead. And it was devastating. Five, this was a chance for him to grow. Seven, if he got through it, who knows what would have been in front of him. But we didn't quite get there. It was an unbelievable achievement, but I have to tell you that my face was not on George. My heart was with Michael Moore on the mat. I respect the fact that he came there to fight. And in the 10th round, 45 years old, he still had the power to knock me out. And I remember going up the freight elevator, and I remember looking over, and there was Michael standing right next to me and Teddy standing next to him, and there was no one else in the elevator. And I remember looking at him, and I just said to him, I said, look, Michael, you have nothing to be ashamed of. You could say things about yourself that no man can say. And he said, I don't care about any of that stuff. He says, I'm only upset is, how do I explain this to my son? I had told George for months, George, how are you going to find him? You, know, you haven't fought in a long time. He moves in there. He goes at a different angle. He's a southpaw. He, you know, he wouldn't stand still for Holyfield. Why would he stand still for you? And George said, you watch. Somewhere late in the fight, he's going to come stand in front of me. Wow. I dreamed I knocked Michael Moore out before that fight. George knew this all along. George saw this from maybe, you know, from five years before. This is Zaire all over again, but I'm the guy who's going to win this time. I'm the guy who's going to be too smart for that other guy. I lose the title in Zaire, and that wasn't the best of me. There I'm on the canvas, I try to beat the count. I had all kinds of excuses, but it was a hard thing, and it had been a hard thing to live down, that you are the heavyweight champ of the world, yet you don't have the title. For years, I had to live with that. I saw George at a, a function here a few months back, and um, they showed the tape of him knocking me out, and I would said a few words. I said, just think, if I had a if I had a duck one more time, we'd be telling like Michael Moore girls instead of George Foreman girls. Somebody once asked me, if was George Foreman winning the heavyweight title at age 45 tougher than Jack Nicklaus winning the Masters at age 46? And as much as I love Jack Nicklaus, nobody was hitting Jack Nicklaus. Michael Moore was still punching George Foreman. And once again, heavyweight champion of the world! Michael Moore later recaptured a heavyweight belt, but lost it to Evander Holyfield. George Foreman had never openly sought specific redemption for his demise against Ali and Zaire, but it's revealing that he chose to wear the same trunks on this night that he had worn in the jungle 20 years before. His triumph was trumpeted in headlines, but it spoke even louder in the fine print of endorsement contracts, which earned him hundreds of millions of dollars. Call it the biggest purse in the history of prize fighting. Thanks for watching. The Tale of Foreman Moore. Hello, I'm Jim Lampley. Welcome to this look back at the stories behind Bo Galata, 
which for its own reasons ranks as one of the most memorable fights in 30 years of boxing on HBO. In this case, it's worth noting, memorable need not mean great fight. What made this Madison Square Garden night unforgettable was something totally unforeseen. A moment when a volatile mix of circumstances in and out of the ring lit a match and touched off an explosion. This ring has been stormed by thugs and hooligans. Impossible to imagine what's going to be done to restore order here. But right now there are no police in sight. Chaos. A riot at Madison Square Garden on July 11, 1996. It came on the heels of a beating suffered by Riddick Bowe in his hometown. It came after Andrew Galata was disqualified for fouling. It was a short, steep fall from grace for the man who just four years earlier defeated Evander Holyfield for the title. And new heavyweight champion of the world, Riddick! In three epic bouts with Holyfield, the Brownsville, Brooklyn native was willing to take punishment to become a giant among giants. I've had some great ones, Joe Frazier, Ken Norton, Larry Holmes, and I said, you have potential to become the greatest heavyweight I ever had, and that's saying a whole lot. He was long, he was strong, he could move, he could also fight inside, which was peculiar for, for such a a big guy, he had a great uppercut. He had all the physical tools. What Bo didn't have was the same dedication to remain champion as he had had to become champion. His Hall of Fame trainer, Eddie Futch, had seen it coming. He had some doubts as to whether or not he would discipline himself and, and not let himself disintegrate in between fights. He loved the idea of the trappings of success. He hated the process of preparing to be great. And I felt like, you know, I worked so hard where well, I couldn't enjoy myself, and that's what I did. You only live once. Futch's worst fears were founded. Bo lost the title to Holyfield in their second fight, when he entered the ring at 246 pounds, 11 pounds more than the night he won the title. He would be champion only once for one year. Riddick Bowe was starting to squander the enormous um, physical talents that he had. Even though he won the third Holyfield fight, he won primarily because Holyfield just got tired and he was able to knock him out. It had to do with him living badly and weight fluctuations, 50, 60, 70 pound swings. And that yo-yo effect over time eroded his reflexes and hurt his skills. Hoping to get another title shot, Bo was matched with an underestimated opponent, Andrew Galata, for a homecoming tune-up. In part because he didn't take Galata seriously, Bo found himself faced with a serious opponent. I just thought they're sticking him up against the opponent just to keep him busy until the whole thing with Mike Tyson can eventually be set up. I just looked at his eyes as if it was a payday. I thought two, three rounds would be going home. If he was always going to go up and down the scale, sooner or later he would pay a price for that. But you didn't necessarily suspect that it was going to come against a guy like Galata. In the same 1988 Olympics in which Bo won a silver medal, Andrew Galata of Poland won a bronze. Like most fighters, he had had a rough start in life and found an escape in boxing. He was big, strong, athletic, and wild. He was raised in a ghetto part of Warsaw in Poland with a lot of crime going on. He is um, known to be a street guy. Galata came to America in 1990 in an effort to avoid prosecution. He settled in Chicago, the city with the largest Polish population outside of Warsaw. He was involved in brawl in a bar, supposedly gun involved, and uh, he was afraid he will go to jail. He basically escaped from Poland. Chicago was a place where Andrew Galata could fight, you know, friends, uh, where he could find some employment or some kind of support. When he came to the States, he said, my boxing career is over, I want to be a truck driver. And this was his dream, just to have an 18-wheeler and just go to Arizona. But fighting was what he did best. He went to a gym and turned pro. He was hoping in the beginning, it's just, you know, temporary thing, boxing. 
I will just earn maybe a couple of bucks, it will be fine, and then I will be a businessman. But then his career started to progress. Main events, which promoted Evander Holyfield and Lennox Lewis, signed Galata. Four years later, the six foot four inch, 240 pound Galata was unbeaten and largely unknown. Still a work in progress. He's 25 and 0, he's starting to get some recognition. He's a big white guy. You know, there's an appeal there. And, and he wasn't just a white guy. I mean, I think there's was a white guy that could fight. Big, good looking guy, strong guy, could punch, you know, could fight, could do it all, you know. Galata seemed like an ideal opponent for Bo. Good, but not too good. As an added bonus, the match boasted two big men with controversial tendencies. There's the bell, and now some extra work. Oh, a little kickboxing by Elijah Tillery. Bo won't stand for that. Rock Newman, the manager of Riddick Bo, and a tag team comes in. Rock wasn't going to have Elijah kicking Riddick, injuring him, and then throwing him off for a year or two. During his rematch with Evander Holyfield, Bo's crew also imposed street justice on the infamous fan man. There's a massive melee at ringside. Rock Newman, Riddick Bowe's manager, was right there. We was like, hold up. <laughs> you know, this guy's fucking us up. How does this stuff find us? It was just utter chaos. All you could do was to try to react to it as best you could. Rock is confrontational. Rock is from the politics of engagement, not from the politics of contemplation. Galata did his own dirty work. Galato had a reputation as being a guy who occasionally lost control. It was a biting incident in a fight. Galato in deep trouble! Now, a referee comes up, your man bit the other fighter. Andrew, did you bite the guy? Andrew looked at us and he said, I had to bite the motherfucker. Given his background as a street kid from Warsaw, he would reveal himself in the ring where you can't hide from who you are. I don't think he does it intentionally, I think something goes in his mind and he blanks out. Here, here's the Nicholson fight, he's winning every round, he's got the guy under control, he's hurting him, but yet, because it was going into the later rounds, he headbutted the guy. He does not know how to handle pressure. Prior to refereeing the fight, several people in the boxing business had warned me of his reputation with the uh, low blows, hitting behind the head, biting, etc. And Lou Duva, Rock Newman, also had a reputation of being excitable. So uh, I had quite a bit of concerns going into that fight. The recipe for disaster was in place on July 11, 1996, in the heart of New York City. Prior to the fight, we entered the dressing room of each fighter, and I went to Andrew Galata, and I said, Andrew, I don't want any of that stuff going on tonight. And he just looked me right in the eye, and he said, I do what I have to do to win. When we walk into the arena, first thing I noticed was I didn't notice police officers. I didn't see NYPD. The crowd was much more frenzied than I expected for a fight most people in boxing had very low expectations of. Boxing has always been an ethnic-oriented sport. There had been no Polish serious heavyweight in the memory of man, and here he was, and his supporters stood and roared. Brownsville people had started problem with the white people from Poland. The people from Brownsville didn't like the red and white flags being flown in their faces. Almost half of the stadium were Polak, and they had flags, and they were ready to fight before the fight started. People don't need to wear jerseys when one fighter is white and Polish and the other fighter is black and from Brownsville. With that energy in there, it's like a bomb just waiting to go off. From the start, it was clear that Galata had the size and the skill to compete with Bo. Crowd lights up as Galata lands at Bo. Bo's wobble. This is the first guy I've ever fought that could hit me with a jab at will. It surprised me and threw me off. Just about everyone in press row was expecting Bo to go through the guy pretty easily. And all of a sudden, I remember Galata out jabbing him, really out jabbing him. And Bo may be surprised, Jim, that a guy is out jabbing him. I remember as the rounds went on, turning to a, a writer next to me and saying, this guy looks like Jack Dempsey. The volatile garden crowd was stunned by Galata's success against Bo. 
but it was the Pole's inability to control his punches that turned the situation explosive. First, there was a shock that Galata was so clearly superior to Bo. Then there is this shock that he's hitting him low, and he keeps hitting him low. What the hell's going on here? Oh, hey, hey, oh, oh, oh. Next time it's a point. Last one. Wayne Kelly stops and warns him. No point deducted so far. And Wayne Kelly is going to have to give Bo a timeout. There's a point deducted from each of the three scorecards. This was a bad, low blow foul. You got five minutes. But when he came to the corner, I said, look, we got this fight won. Do not hit him in the body anymore. Keep him up. You're going to lose another point. Now another low blow. One point. And Galata has lost a second point. And Harold, what comes next? Jim, the thing that comes next, without question, is a disqualification. I mean, I don't know how much of this Wayne Kelly's going to put up with. It just seemed unfathomable that he was going to give away this easy victory but you had to observe the inevitability that it was probably going to happen i looked him right in the eyes and i said andrew if you hit him low one more time it's over do you understand that and he said yes i do walked out there hit him low that was another low blow yeah, down that's goes it. Bo, and that's, that's it that's it, it. Great. it's a disqualification that's it's time to someone to understand that you're going to have to keep the rules in this business. And now there's a fight in the ring that's been started by some of Bo's handlers who went after Lou Duca, and somebody's going to get hurt in there. I remember a guy from Bo's camp jumping into the mix and started to tomahawk Galata. That wasn't going in there to hit Galata until I felt like I was assault. This is a very desperate situation. Lou Duva's in trouble. Lou Duva's in trouble on the ring mat. When he was on the ground, he was getting kicked. He was getting punched. 70-year-old man, he was helpless. First thing I thought is, oh my God, Lou's died in there. Right in the middle of all this craziness in the ring. But he clearly wasn't conscious. Duva's, Duva's being taken out on a gurney right now. And we hope that they can get it through the crowd. And they had about four or five guys carrying it, and they were going, turning me over, turning me. I said, for Christmas sake, it's safer to go back into the ring and fight. You guys are killing me over here, you know? Four minutes after Galata was attacked, Duva was taken to the hospital for observation. The violence in the garden was spreading. George Foreman trying to be the peacemaker. What are you doing? What are you doing, guys? What are you going to accomplish in there? I don't know if it was racial, but it felt sort of tribal. It felt like what I imagine a soccer riot could be like. People were getting hit over the head with chairs. People were getting stomped on. It's flaring up again now behind us. Another riot. Guys jumping and over chairs. Riots and fights are breaking out at ringside. At that point, I realized, well, if I stay here, I'm not going to be able to report much longer because this whole setup is bound to come apart. And I just dumped off my headset and yeah. ran up one section in Madison Square Gardens to deliver a little bit broader perspective on what was going on. And I've never been involved in a more personally terrifying situation than that one. This ring has been stormed by thugs and hooligans. Obviously, emotions were flowing high on both sides. You expect that in a matter of a minute or two, the powers that be are going to get it organized and cleared up. Well, there were no powers that be, were there? Well, it was the desire of Madison Square Garden to provide their own security. And of course, since it's a private arena, unless you're invited in, you can't be there. In the beginning, there was no security at all. There was a couple of guys in their 60s trying to stop guys in their 20s. I was actually at home. I was watching uh, TV and a flash came across the TV that there was a riot going on in Madison Square Garden. So I called my security detail and I responded. Some 15 minutes after Galata was attacked, Safer's security force finally arrived. 
It was worse than I thought it would be, and my biggest concern was that we had not been notified in a timely manner. Order was restored some 23 minutes after the fight ended. Ross Greenberg, producing from the truck, said to me, uh, okay, I think we've covered this. Offer whatever personal comment you want to make and then take us off the air. Something about that phrase just triggered the recognition. By the way, I've got a teenage daughter in here somewhere. I'm going to go find her. That became the personal comment. Situation. Myself, i got a 16-year-old daughter in here somewhere, and I'm looking to be sure that she's safe. This morning, the New York police summoned Bo's manager to this precinct headquarters a block from the garden. He was ordered to review the videotapes and identify anybody from Bo's camp involved in the fighting. I remember just being so personally angry with Galata that, you know, I went into the ring and screamed at him. Ten seconds later, the ring was full. Now, history has it that I started a riot. And now the number of arrests are up to 10. The police are reviewing the videotapes with uh, uh, boxing officials and will make further arrests based on an analysis of the videotapes. In all, 22 people were injured and 14 arrests were made, including Jason Harris, a member of the Bo security staff. Harris, it turned out, had a record of violence, including the Fan Man incident, when his weapon of choice had been a walkie-talkie. He was given a five-year suspended sentence. Oh, I paid my dues. I was in the middle of being investigated for a police department. You know, when I got back, my investigator called me and said, eh, Jason, eh, sorry. The turmoil overshadowed the fact that despite the victory, Bo had been battered. A rematch would be big. It was set for five months later in Atlantic City. This time, Galata's trainers concentrated on Bo's belt line. So the punches are going to be coming up here. They're going to be hitting him on the chin. They're going to be hitting him in the chest. They're going to be hitting him in the body. They're going to hit me there. Over here, we've taught Andrew to keep away. This is a no zone over here. Bo, dedicated now, shed 50 pounds in eight weeks and appeared to be in championship form at 235 pounds. He embarrassed me. He did all the things to me that I should have did to him. I wanted to redeem myself. What Bo and others didn't know at the time was that the 29-year-old's body couldn't overcome years of pounding and abuse. And the only championship part of him left was his heart. From the opening bell, he looked lethargic in the ring. It soon became apparent that he was a spent force. That first fight was not just a matter of conditioning. He was an old fighter before he got old. He proceeded to hammer bow with the most continuous assortment of power punches that any heavyweight has ever had to take in a big fight. Goes down. All the courage that Riddick had shown against Holyfield in the first fight, here it was again, as he was taking ridiculous punishment all around the ring from pillar to post, sometimes landing back. Riddick both fighting with a nothing to lose attitude now. After losing a point for intentional headbutting, Galata lost control of himself and his punches again in the fourth. Low blows by Galata, and Eddie yeah. Cotton will pull him away. All right, look, that's your first warning for low blows. Okay. Right, no, 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 no. That's your first low for low blows. Your first one, no more. Okay. Come on. Ah! A fighter who simply cannot stop himself from throwing low blows. Disbelief. I couldn't believe I was seeing the same thing again. I want all straight punches. And God damn it, step the jab in. No more body punches. You gotta go to the head with this guy. Upper cousin, go to the head with this guy. Even with two points now deducted from his score, Galata continued his onslaught. That's a knockdown. That's another knockdown. Galata received another warning in the sixth round. And now Eddie Cotton's gonna warn Galata for rabbit punching. Late in the ninth round, he went back to it again, and the uh, last two was a combination way below the belt. Low blows, and down goes Bo again. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it. He's calling that's the it. fight that's over. That's it. That's it. That's it. He's disqualified the ladder again. He was willing to fight the hands down, but because he's an idiot, 
he got himself disqualified. He didn't want to be there. I felt sad for him. I felt sad for Riddick. I felt sad for us that a potentially glorious event had once again become this strange atrocity. Ludova, give us your assessment of the fight. Well, I don't know what to say. I really don't. I'm going to sit down with Andrew and say, look, do you want to be a fighter or don't you want to be a fighter? If you don't want to be the fighter that fights in the ring and fights the right way, then you better, you better go look for a championship of a tough man contest in a bar or something like that because it's not going to happen. Andrew Galata would have three more chances at redemption. Against Lennox Lewis, Galata would be KO'd in the first round. Against Michael Grant, Galata would quit during the 10th round. He said no! He said he didn't want to fight! And after two rounds with Mike Tyson, Galata quit the fight and boxing. When I was trying to put that mouthpiece in his mouth, I should have shoved it up his ass. I said to him, Andrew, don't do this to yourself. And then he didn't want to know nothing. He pushed me away. Whatever demon it was that forced Andrew Galata to do those things in the ring, he couldn't stop it. He had no control. Currently, Galata lives in Chicago and is facing criminal charges for a melee outside a hotel in Poland in November of 2002. For Bo, who took way too many clean blows in big fights, his days as a fighter were also over. His reflexes and responses weren't quite what I would have expected, especially somebody that's 28 years old. If you look at Riddick's speech pattern, from the Holyfield Bow era. You underestimate my, my stamina, my punching power. You know, Bert Cooper knocked me down the fellow in the road, I knocked him down. To the Bow Galata era. It's totally different. I mean, you look at like this new guy's guy. Galata is somewhat, you know, fresh. He hasn't, he hasn't had as many fights, so therefore he don't get his time. But as soon as the uh, fatigue set in a little bit, that's when he started hitting me low. One of the major hallmark symptoms of chronic brain injury is personality changes, aggressive behavior, uh, problems in someone's personal life. One month after the second Galata fiasco, Bo made a strange decision. Well, I'm not retiring, and I'm not going to announce my next fight until after I do something else. And that something else is joining the United States Marine Corps. For a guy who had trouble training for a fight worth tens of millions of dollars, how the hell is this guy going to go to Paris Island and wake up for Reveille? Bo's first day of Marine Corps training was February 18, 1997. He would be a civilian again just three days later. I didn't expect the drill instructors to give me such a hard time. Okay, Returning okay. to civilian life wasn't easy for Bo. A string of domestic disputes resulted in a separation from his wife, Judy. She laughing to the kids down in North Carolina. I kind of felt like a part of me died. And what good was I? I got a call from one of Judy's nieces to say that Bo had come and he had taken the family. What people must understand is that what I did, I'm not proud of it. But I did it out of love. Bo pled guilty to interstate domestic violence and in November of 2002 was sentenced to at least 18 months in prison. In a sentencing hearing, his defense team claimed that injuries to his brain from boxing were partly to blame for his decision making. This is a different Riddick Bow than that fresh, young, big bear of a guy who first fought Evander. You know what, God has a way of humbling you. And perhaps, you know, somewhere along the line I did something or maybe I was somewhat snobbish and he wanted to bring me back down to earth. Riddick Bow is a tragic figure in boxing to become a champion and not to be able to deal with success and then to suffer some physical and probably mental damage, uh, his whole life falling apart, it doesn't get more graphic than that. Though he was only 29, these were Riddick Bowe's last two fights. In the first, he showed how the accumulated effects of his sloth had diminished his abilities. But in the second, he reminded us of the gallantry he had shown in taking the title from Evander Holyfield just four years before. Bo fought with extraordinary courage, even as his career was vanishing round by round. 
Andrew Galata was just the latest of many to prove you need more than physical talent to become a boxing champion. Thanks for watching The Tale of Bo Galata. I'm Jim Lampley. Welcome to this look back at the stories behind De La Hoya Trinidad, one of the most memorable fights in 30 years of boxing on HBO. By the time Puerto Rico's unbeaten Felix Trinidad faced off with unbeaten Mexican-American Oscar De La Hoya in 1999, the competitive dominance of Hispanic fighters in many weight classes had eclipsed all other ethnic groups. After years of escalating passions, expectations for what was billed as the fight of the millennium could scarcely have been any higher. Any story like this needs a start. It needs an amulet. It needs something where people look at right away and see something special. And for Oscar De La Hoya, it was winning an Olympic gold medal with his mother having recently passed away and him having promised his mother on her deathbed that he was going to win a gold medal. When I took the gold medal, it was the most exciting moment. At the same time, it was the saddest moment of my life. I was on top of the podium listening to the national anthem, holding the gold medal, flowers, thinking about my mom. Reflected off that gold medal was the Latino version of another golden boy, Sugar Ray Leonard. From East LA, De La Hoya had movie star looks, a high wattage smile, and serious talent as a fighter. In Hollywood, an actor or an actress who can open a movie big is bankable. He's a matinee idol. I mean, he looks like Rudolph Valentino in The Sheik. Oscar is someone who 16-year-old girls need to see. What other fighter do you see 16, 17, 18-year-old girls going to the fight, paying $50 to go see, and can fight nobody? They get your autograph, they faint, they cry. That's what it's all about to me. I love that. It, I enjoy it. I'm bringing something new to the sport, some excitement to the sport. De La Hoya created excitement inside the ring as well, where he was soon recognized as one of boxing's top fighters, winning title belts at 130 and 135 pounds. But transcending the sport, coming across as a packaged teenage idol, turned off many hardcore Mexican fans in his own neighborhood. They felt they were the ones being transcended. I hate to say this, because, you know, I'm, I'm a Mexican-American, just like Oscar, but for the hardcore boxing fans, they think he's crossed over. They think that he cares more about his looks than trying to be the best fighter of all time. The Mexican people, they pay the money just to see an action, a brutal fight. Like the old time, like in Rome, when the, the Tigers eat the people. So Oscar never accomplished that. De La Hoya attempted to change this perception when he faced beloved Mexican warrior Julio Cesar Chavez. Beating and humiliating an aging legend was satisfying to De La Hoya but he couldn't make Chavez's fans love him. That's the meanest looking Oscar De La Hoya you've ever seen. You're gonna embarrass this old, now a really old fighter. Again, who's still revered in, in the country that, that where you want to be revered, and you're just gonna make a fool of him, really. He sort of threw coal on the fire with the Mexican fans. Felix Trinidad had none of the cultural dilemmas associated with an immigrant group, quickly becoming the favorite son on the island of Puerto Rico following in the footsteps of Roberto Clemente. I tell Tito every time that we, we get together, I said that I was very proud of him. I said, you were carrying a torch that actually my father carried at one time. He's rightfully proud of his heritage, of his roots, of his achievements as a Puerto Rican, and he stands for the values and principles of the Puerto Rican people. I love you, Puerto Rico. He has uh, not learned English, was actually seen as something very good among a lot of Puerto Ricans, because you know, he's not really like uh, selling out. He really wants to stay one of us, a humble guy who's a fighter fighting for us, which was uh, contrary to what some people thought that Oscar de Hoy was, that it seemed like Oscar de Hoy was really fighting for himself. Not only is, is Felix Puerto Rico born, but Felix is more in the style of the warrior. He is the fighter that comes out and wants to finish a fight, if possible, with one punch. Trinidad's success was built on lessons taught by his trainer, manager, and father, 
Felix Trinidad Sr. Everything I learned since I was a kid, I learned from my father. He always said that I was better than he was. And another thing I learned that was instilled from him was to have courage, to have guts, to never fear anyone. The father and son combination would win their first professional title in 1993, when a 20-year-old Felix Trinidad defeated welterweight champion Maurice Blocker. My dreams as a father and as a trainer were that he become a champ as an amateur, which he did. And when he turned pro, I wanted him to do it again. I wanted him to become a champion, and we did it. My father is a person who neither tries to control my life nor me. Whenever he said, Tito, we shouldn't do this because it's not good for us, or Tito, let's do this, whatever my father said, I agreed with him. Now contrast that with Oscar de la Hoya, who has a love-hate relationship with his father. It's a relationship of boss and employee in many respects. I think the mother was the love, she was the charm, she hugged him when the father yelled at them. For a long time, Oscar's father would never praise him. And Oscar told me one time, I would give up my gold medal and all my belts just to hear my father say he thought I was a good fighter, but he never will. He would never tell me that I was doing good, that I was a, a, a good fighter. Found out that he, the reason why he didn't tell me is because if he would tell me that I was good, then it would kind of like get to my head. I'm waiting for that moment. It's making me train harder. It's pushing me to uh, you know, go that extra mile. Despite a strained relationship with his father, De La Hoya was becoming a bigger and bigger star, a rare celebrity prize fighter. But it wasn't until his battle with the unbeaten Ike Corte in 1999 that he asserted himself as a potentially great fighter. I thought that the Corte fight was a glorious celebration of Oscar's good qualities. A tough round-by-round -round struggle. Oscar knocks Corte down, Corte knocks him down. I thought the fight was basically even coming to the 12th round. He didn't depend on the judges. He didn't depend on being fancy. Bellow is right there. It's Leonard Hearns all over. He went after Corte in that 12th round and won the fight, and that still to me is his finest hour. Even in one of De La Hoya's most dramatic victories, he would still receive harsh criticism from the person closest to him. I'll still go back to the Corte fight where Oscar is looking horrendous. What's the most compelling figure on screen? It's Joel De La Hoya jumping out of his seat, running along press row, screaming at Oscar, willing his, his son to fight. It wasn't love. It wasn't do this for me. It was you better do this or you're not my son. Soon after defeating Corte, De La Hoya signed to unify the titles with Felix Trinidad. Suddenly, 1999 was looking like the early 1980s when the welterweight division was at boxing's forefront. Like Leonard versus Hearns won, a fight between two young stars in their primes. De La Hoya versus Trinidad was going to decide who was the major force in boxing below the heavyweight division. Two undefeated fighters, same weight, same age, in their prime, didn't like one another. That had mystique written all over it. The De La Hoya fight was a, not only a big fight for Trinidad, it was looked over here in Puerto Rico as a, one of the biggest things ever. People thought it was a do or die situation for Trinidad. What was on the line for De La Hoya in this fight was the defining moment as to whether or not he could actually earn the respect that he so richly wanted. He had one man in front of him, a man that had the respect of the world, and if he could win this fight, Oscar gets over. De La Hoya versus Trinidad grabbed the public's attention, but the historic rivalry between Puerto Rico and Mexico triggered raw nationalistic emotions. Puerto Rico and Mexico go at it in every sport, and when you take it to boxing, you're talking about just one-on-one, -on -one, one country on one side, one country on the other, and just two men in the ring. I think, in, in a way, they, the, the real head-to-head -head came in De La Hoya Trinidad. You had Puerto Rico and their favorite child, and you had Mexico with a, with a fighter that they had adopted. Uh, they had never felt that Oscar De La Hoya was one of them, but they're going to borrow him for this one. The tremendous hype of the fight was realized the day before at the weigh-in. They came up with the idea that this fight was so big, we should do it in the arena. 
The weigh-in for this fight was something special. This felt like a World Cup final between Mexico and Puerto Rico. When Oscar came out, you saw one of those moments that you see once in a while in boxing. I couldn't make the weight anymore. And I was so concerned that I took everything off. And the arena just went crazy because apparently my trainer, I told him, keep the damn towel up. And he apparently brought it down and they just, I, everybody went crazy. I said, what's going on? I looked down and I'm like exposed to the world. Oscar De La Hoya, 147 pounds. The weigh-in was a preview of what would go on in the arena the next night. We knew the atmosphere was going to be over the top. On a weekend of electric excitement in Las Vegas, five years of eager anticipation among boxing insiders and fight fans climaxes with the welterweight summit meeting between two unbeaten knockout artist champions, Puerto Rico's Felix Trinidad, Southern California's Oscar De La Hoya. What boxing truly needs tonight is a fight that lives up to or even exceeds the very high expectations for this fight. It would also be nice if we got a decision that was just in the end. Trinidad used the national spotlight to draw attention to the controversy on the Puerto Rican island of Vieques, where the U.S. conducted military exercises. There were always these accidental deaths of someone because of this. And there was one death which occurred, and people were saying enough is enough. And when Felix Trinidad walked into the ring showing solidarity with the people of Vegas, he couldn't ask for anything better. Wherever it was, whether it was a big screen or a TV set or whatever, it created a bridge directly to the hearts of every Puerto Rican watching. The time has arrived for the ultimate confrontation. 12 rounds of boxing for the welterweight championship of the world. People knew that Oscar had boxing skills and that he was going to have to outbox Tito to win. But nobody realized he was going to do it that easily. He was giving him a clinic. You're, you're taking him to school. You're giving him a boxing lesson. I, I remember leaning over to the guy next to me and sort of in shock and said, De La Hoya is making Trinidad look foolish. Harold had to score the first three rounds. Three to nothing. 30 to 27, Oscar De La Hoya. Beautiful ring generalship. Good, clean punching. Oscar wins on those two points. And he's trying to, like, chase me, and, and, he, and he's lost. So I say to myself, OK, if I, if I continue on this and pop my jab, right hand, throw a few combinations here and there, then I can win the fight. Punch this guy to hell, Oscar. Just like you said you were going to do. Give him a boxing lesson. Popping Trinidad with a four-punch combination, stepping forward, going to the body, back upstairs. Out class is too big a word for what's happening here, but it's verging on that. Harold, how do you have it through nine? Jim, six rounds to three, 87-84, Oscar De La Hoya, boxing beautifully. As the fight moved into the later rounds, De La Hoya's successful boxing strategy deteriorated into retreat. Oscar's always been the one to close the show. Now he's trying to close the show by guaranteeing a victory for himself simply by staying away from Trinidad. I have to admit I was a bit tired. I've never boxed like that in my life. My legs were shaking. I, I thought I had to fight in the bag after nine rounds. So I'm going to cruise the last three rounds. You know, that's what my corner told me to. So I said, OK, let's do it. You, you got him controlled. You, you, you got the fight. Both Alcazar and Gil Clancy in his corner told him you have the fight won, and they basically instructed him not to engage Trinidad too heavily, don't risk too much. And 
turned out to be terrible advice. Two more rounds. Okay, that's it. And we go home. You can blame the corner, you can blame the people, but inside the ring, it's it's only you. How do you feel, Oscar? Okay. Yeah. Uh, box the next two rounds. My corner was telling me box them, and then you have to fight in the bag. But when it comes down to it, hey, it's it's my fault. He made a choice that. Rather than get knocked out, rather than get hurt, he would take a chance that he had a big enough lead and stay away. And he basically threw away the last three rounds. He lost a lot of fans within his own ethnic community by fighting the last three rounds against Trinidad the way that he did. That is not the way a Mexican fighter would have fought that particular fight. He's finished! We gotta take him now! He, he's, all, he, he's all beat up already! Now we gotta go for it to work! He seemed uncomfortable because he kept running. He knew that if he stopped to fight, he could have been knocked out because he knew I was a harder puncher. That's why he was always on the run. At the end of nine rounds, he had a three-point lead. All he needed to do was win, win one of the last three rounds, and he would have won. You can feel the scorecards narrowing as round 12 begins. Harold Letterman, how do you have it going into the last frame? 105, 104, six rounds to five. Oscar De La Hoya. The, Jim, the question is, can you win a fight running away? Many questions to be answered after these next 55 seconds go away. George, you tell me, do you think that De La Hoya has won the fight the way he's fought the last several rounds? I don't think so. I think he had the fight in control, and now he's leaving in the hand of the judges. As the crowd awaited the decision, many believed that De La Hoya's popularity in Las Vegas would give him the edge with the judges. Well, we've talked and talked about the home court factor. The question of whether Tito Trinidad can get a decision against Oscar De La Hoya in Las Vegas. Oscar lived in Los Angeles, but his town was Las Vegas. He'd fought there so many times, his biggest fights he fought there. And if you were gonna outpoint him, you'd better beat him convincingly, otherwise you had no chance. I knew that Oscar won the fight. I mean, the first nine rounds, the worst it could have been was seven two. There was no way he could lose the fight. Michael Buffer has the numbers in his hand. Lynn Hamada scores the bout 114 to 114. He has it even the first uh, scorecard. When they announced uh, it was like such a close call, I said, oh, okay, here we go. I'm gonna be part of a shady situation. Bob Logis scores the bell, 115 to 114. I was confident that Tito had won. We knew he had won it. However, there was still the possibility that they would steal it from us. And Jerry Roth scores the bell. 115 to 113 for the winner by majority decision, De Puerto Rico and a unified welterweight champion of the world, Felix Kiko Trinidad. That answers the question of whether Felix Trinidad could get a decision against Oscar De La Hoya in Las Vegas. Yes, he could. The celebration of the Trinidad victory went from the ring in Las Vegas to the streets of Puerto Rico. I had beat the Golden Boy. It was a moment of great emotion. I cried when I heard the decision. It's a moment I'll never forget. De La Hoya's first reaction to the decision was denial. You know, um, I, I know I won. I, you know, he's a great fighter. I thought I put a boxing lesson of my life. Once away from the ring, shock and outrage would soon merge and explode. I, la I landed 120 more fucking punches, man. Shit. I fucking gave him a boxing lesson. God damn it, man. When I got into the locker room, I went berserk. I, I started crying. Like, my gosh, how can they do this to me? I was devastated, I was just crushed. I remember punching one of those little lockers that those rooms have, because I got so mad. In that moment of despair, Oscar found comfort in the place he would least expect it. When my father comes up to me and tells me, uh, you know, you fought a beautiful fight. And I was like, whoa, okay. I mean, when I lose, now my father tells me I'm a great fighter, you know, it's like, but it felt good. It felt really, really good coming from him.
Promoter Bob Arum believed the scoring was affected by a pre-fight meeting between then Nevada Athletic Commission Chairman Elias Ghanem and the Trinidad camp. There was something fishy in appointing the officials. The Trinidad camp and Don King were making noises about not wanting to come to Las Vegas because they said that the Vegas judges would favor De La Hoya. Bob Arum was aware that this meeting happened. Dr. Gonham called him before it happened and he said, I'm gonna have a meeting with Senor Trinidad at my home. Bob Arum encouraged that meeting. It was really more of a meeting to just say, look, here's the process that we follow in Nevada. We have followed it for a hundred years. We're gonna follow it this time. It's gonna be a great fight. Everybody's gonna love it. And the true champion's gonna emerge. And certain assurances were made at that meeting to Trinidad. The assurances, I believe, were to the effect that the officials would be talked to before the fight. You wouldn't go to them and say, we want you to be fair for this fight. That's kind of silly when you think about it. These are the best in the world. You go to them and you say, it's a big fight. You know, this is important. Bring your A game. Nobody ever talked to me about any assurances before the De La Hoya Trinidad fight, unequivocally. The conventional wisdom is that Oscar dominated early and then gave away the last three rounds. Look at Jerry Roth's scorecard. The first four rounds, he has Trinidad winning three of those four rounds. That is preposterous. I didn't bend over backwards to go the other way at all. And I'd be more than happy with anyone, including you, Mr. Harum, if you want to watch that fight with me with the sound turned down round by round, and we'll have a good discussion about it. And Lojas' scorecard is so unbelievable that even Lojas must have realized it because he gives the 12th round to Oscar De La Hoya to make it closer, and Oscar didn't throw one punch in the 12th round. So his scorecard is suspect. There is no way that Oscar De La Hoya lost the fight with Felix Trinidad. He's the promoter. His fighter lost. And I would expect him to feel that his fighter won. Somebody forgot to tell Trinidad's fans there was a controversy. The following morning, all of Puerto Rico welcomed him home. People everywhere, flags everywhere, music, dancing. It was a great party. I mean, people did not go to work. The government gave the day off to the people just to be able to say hi to Tito. I went on stage and said hello to all my people. They were chanting and cheering. It was a beautiful moment, an experience I will never forget. And like I said that day, we beat Oscar de la Hoya, and the golden boy is no more. The fight exceeded the hype in one important way. The 1.4 million buys on pay-per-view made it the richest non-heavyweight event ever. But the fight itself left a lingering aftertaste of disappointment and a question of what could have been. This had all the makings of Leonard Hearns, Hagler Hearns, Prior Arguello. I think the interesting story is, why did the cake not rise? What was missing? When I think of Oscar De La Hoya versus Felix Trinidad, it's a story of two guys who weren't quite what we thought they were. Oscar De La Hoya put on this tremendous boxing performance. He couldn't close the show. Felix Trinidad, he had a guy in front of him looking for an excuse to lose. And Felix Trinidad couldn't give him one. It was a good fight. But if De La Hoya had fought better, it would have been one for the ages, a classic. It was supposed to be the fight of the millennium. They said it didn't meet the hype. It was not my fault. I did my best. I gave my best. He was to blame. There are lots of ways in which I wouldn't want to be Oscar De La Hoya. I wouldn't want to have to try to explain to myself from time to time for the rest of my life why I willfully gave away the biggest fight of my career. If I had the opportunity to do it again, I wouldn't cruise. I, I, would, I would go in there for the kill because I felt so confident that night that I can do anything I want. And yeah, I made a mistake. I did cruise and, and it was the biggest mistake of my life. I think those last three rounds opened up his whole career for debate. If he had won that fight, he would be considered a great fighter, simple as that. Nine minutes might have blown it all. 
If the meeting between the two 26-year-old stars was anticlimactic, surely it would be redeemed by a rematch. It has never happened, and if Trinidad sticks to his retirement, it never will. De La Hoya has the hollow satisfaction of having watched Bernard Hopkins dismantle Trinidad using a carbon copy of Oscar's game plan. But fight fans wonder whether a rematch might have enhanced both careers instead of what happened in Las Vegas. Thanks for watching The Tale of De La Hoya Trinidad. Hello, I'm Jim Lampley. Welcome to this look back at Lewis Tyson, one of the most memorable fights in 30 years of boxing on HBO. When Lennox Lewis and Mike Tyson finally met, years after they first might have, and both on the dark side of 35, their fight was a preordained watershed. For Tyson, a chance to wipe out a decade of misadventures with a single hard punch. For Lewis, a chance to cement his legacy by obliterating a myth. The preview was a brawl on a stage in New York. The movie was an urban action adventure, a courtroom drama, a frenzied road flick, and then a knockout. There was no logical reason in boxing terms that a fight between two guys past their primes should have counted for so much. But because fans thought it did, because this fight had been building for a number of years, then it really carried a lot of weight. But everybody felt that Mike Tyson was still like Mike Tyson was 15 years ago. The general talk on the street was, Mike is back, Mike is from the streets, yo man, Mike is just too much man, he's too much of a dog for Lennox. We all seem to need a threat from outside, the other, who is dangerous and who can hurt us. And we need the champion who can save us from that. Lewis, he should win. He's bigger, he's stronger, he's highly skilled, but he doesn't have that magic. That's why Tyson captured people's imagination. And he knocked people out. Mike Tyson stunned the boxing world with his punching power when he turned pro in 1985. He was still a teenager, just a few years away from a troubled childhood in Brooklyn, New York. Tyson's story was familiar. Boxing would save him from the streets and make him a star. The youngest ever heavyweight champion at the age of 20. And we have a new era in boxing. Shortly after he became the heavyweight champion of the world, he became the poster boy and did ads. Knock drugs out of your life by just saying no. Just not sham a diet Pepsi. Mike Tyson. <laughs> Uh, he was well-spoken, uh, had a nice smile, a little gap tooth, but a nice smile. He was a charming young man. Get, no, no, time, no, they should get fighting rings because you can't walk the street with them, no? <laughs> he was gathering enormous momentum as a public figure. The crowd was magnetized to him. When I go to big cities, everybody stop, you know, and it's like, wow, Mike Tyson. You're Mike Tyson, aren't you? Aren't you that young knockout kid? You know, and it's like, wow. When he started to become popular, uh, he would talk to me about girls and if girls would find him attractive, that he felt ugly. I remember sitting in traffic, people coming out of their car to give their daughter's phone number to him. Then it was the limos and the girls and the parties, and there were always people surrounding him who didn't help develop the sweeter side of Mike. I'm with Robin Givens, who was attending our first Mike Tyson fight as Mrs. Champion. <laughs> Robin, uh, inquiring minds want to know, how does a woman who went to Sarah Lawrence and Harvard Medical School wind up falling in love with a guy who's a graduate of the School of Hard Knocks? God, I want to know too. In 1988, Tyson formed an unlikely union with actress Robin Givens. But as quickly as it began, their marriage ended eight months later, with Givens accusing Tyson of being manic depressive and physically abusive. The question came, what is the best punch you have ever hit anyone with? And then he started to laugh. I said, why are you laughing? He said, because the best punch was a right backhand that I hit Robin with, and she, she hit every fucking wall in the room. At his peak, Tyson was terrifying, 
a master of destruction who paralyzed his opponents with fear and amassed a captivated following. But in 1990, a 42-to-1 underdog, James Buster Douglas, would hand Tyson his first shocking loss. At the same time, Tyson's chaotic personal life became front page news. In 1992, he was found guilty of rape and sent to prison, where he would discover the Islamic faith before being released on parole in 1995. As I've told Mike on many occasions, man, when you got out of jail for that rape beef, you know, all you had to do was clean your act up, man. You could have been the greatest thing since sliced bread. But no, coach, I, I want to roll like I want to roll. The pimps, the hoes, the druggies, those my people. GQ Puck, fuck them. I don't care about them. When he was released from prison, this man became even bigger than life. When most people are down and headed in the wrong direction, he became more famous. The public and much of the boxing world, I think, had invested so much in the myth of Mike Tyson. And so it didn't take much you know, to convince people always oh, back. But underneath it all, it was, uh, there was a lot of dry rot. Mike Tyson decided that he was just going to go on this kind of circus tour to fight anybody's because the public had this fascination with him. He was just going to go for as much money as he could make. After prison, Tyson was still a box office bonanza. Not so much for his abilities, which he put on display against dubious opponents, as for the frightening behavior he had begun to exhibit in the ring. The bizarre ear-biting incident with Evander Holyfield came first, and that was only an appetizer. And the fight with both of them, you know? Both the kept, you know, messing with him. So, hey, I'm gonna break his arm. Stop it! asked him at the press conference, did you try to break his arm? Yeah, I tried to break his arm, so what about it? And then he's in against Lou Savarese, and Savarese is out. And the next thing you know, he's pounding him anyway. The referee's down, you know, and he's just sitting there saying, you know, this is like a five-alarm fire here. This is a guy who's having a lot of trouble controlling himself. To the general sports fan, boxing is supposed to be about violence and no fighter was more palpably violent than Mike. And then, of course, there's all this flamboyant tabloid material, which our society feeds on. And so he satisfied people on a lot of fronts. We were drawn to him. It's not like Mike Tyson broke into our house and said, watch me, okay? So everything repulsive and bad and negative about him must also be in us because we were drawn to him. Tyson's notoriety eclipsed the recognition of Lennox Lewis, whose journey had been very different from Tyson's. Ironically, before their paths diverged, they came together to spar as teenagers. And Tyson's trainer, Customato, made a prophetic prediction. Customato would say, these guys are gonna meet in the future. So I said, that'd be interesting. But at that time I was saying, I, don't, I hope I don't meet this guy, you know, because he's like an animal. Born of Jamaican descent in London, England, Lennox Lewis spent his youth in Canada. He arrived in Toronto at the age of 12, and it was there that he discovered boxing. Lewis took his time in the amateur ranks and earned two trips to the Olympics for Canada, winning gold in 1988. In a way, Lennox was in finishing school when Mike was becoming a global figure. Lennox Lewis was one of the best right-hand punchers in the amateurs. Everything you want from an Olympic gold medalist, Lennox Lewis had the package. I beat the great American superstar, Rudy Bowe, and knocked him out. And the winner is Lennox Lewis. All of a sudden, you win the Olympics, everybody wants your autograph, and you become important. In 1989, Lewis moved back to England to turn pro. Lennox Lewis is in total command now. And scored his first important victory against Razor Ruddock in 1992. Scene. Six weeks later, with Tyson in prison, Lewis won a vacated title. Abandoned by Riddick Bowe, who had no interest after the Olympics in fighting Lewis again. Lennox wants this belt. We must get it out of the garbage, and uh, then we'll be calling him the garbage picker. 
That was a, a, a coward's way out. Why don't you just say you don't want to fight me? Why do you have to go through all that? In his fourth title defense, Lewis would lose the championship to an unremarkable opponent, Oliver McCall. He won it back in a bizarre rematch, but would spend years trying to overcome the stigma of that first loss. That's going to be it. In 1999, Lewis became the undisputed heavyweight champion after defeating Evander Holyfield. And the prospect of a clash with Tyson loomed. Talk to us about your future. You know, I want Tyson. Definitely want Tyson, you know. But in 2001, another unexpected loss to Haseem Rahman would stall his ongoing quest for respect. Between his wavering focus and foreign passport, Lewis was a hard pill to swallow for American fans. The enigma of, of Lennox is nobody knows really who Lennox is. He's a man with many passports. I was born here, I grew up there, I fought for the, the Olympic team over here. If you're a citizen of, of, of everywhere, you're a citizen of nowhere. The promotion that used him with his uh, pinky sticking up in the air. Tea time, Mr. Lewis. Lovely idea. Accented the negative. Will your mum be at the fight? She never misses about. Another thing about Lennox Lewis was he played chess. For goodness sakes, the heavyweight champion playing chess. Because Lennox has a British accent, the notion persisted throughout his career that he was somehow more civilized than Mike, and therefore he wouldn't be the same kind of destructive force. He's a nice guy, and he's a great guy, and that's why I like him. Well, yeah, that might be why you'd like to have him over for tea. <laughs> but, you know, being a great guy in $1.50 will get you a ride on the subway as far as being heavyweight champion goes. By late 2001, Lewis had regained the title from Rockman, and Lewis and Tyson were the only star heavyweights still standing. By finally meeting, Lewis would get a chance to cement his legacy, and Tyson, an opportunity to get out of debt and justify his rage. I was going to rip his heart out. I'm the best ever. I'm the most brutal and vicious and most ruthless champion there's ever been. My style is impetuous. My defense is impregnable, and I'm just ferocious. I want your heart. I want to eat his children. Praise be to Allah. There was a tremendous talk about this fight happening, Lewis versus Tyson, and so many doubters because Lennox Lewis is tied to HBO. Mike Tyson is tied to Showtime. How on earth are these two networks who are rivals going to join forces to enable this fight to happen? The fighters wanted it, the public wanted it, and seeing the great potential profit to be made, the two networks, after extensive negotiations, finally agreed to come together for an unprecedented joint pay-per-view broadcast. The fight was set for April 6, 2002 in Las Vegas. And in January, a press conference was convened in New York City to announce the plans. I said to a guy in our entourage, he looks pretty mean there. I mean, he just looks mad. And then as soon as Lennox came out, Mike just came across the stage. He took off his hat, threw it on the ground and started marching over to me. So I'm saying, I don't know what he's doing. My security came out, stopped him. Mike commenced the punching, Lennox commenced the punching. It was like I'm uh, all free for all. Somebody was biting my leg. I'm like pushing the head, realizing, you know, Tyson's biting my leg, he's biting my leg. I hate getting bit, so. Part of him was like, I'm gonna hype this fight, but part of him was trying to encourage himself. I am in my 30s. I am four or five years away from a competitive fight. This man is up to the mark. Let me look into the eye of the tiger and see if I see any wavering. And I don't think he saw any. And so it degenerated from there. He knows that he's a jerk. He knows that he's been taken for a ride by all the people around him. That's what makes him angry. And when he's yelling and screaming, you can almost see him crying because he knows that this is not where he wants to be. I'll fuck you till you love me, faggot. Yet he doesn't have the wherewithal to pull himself out. Him and I took a walk outside, and as we're walking down the street, he turns to me, he says, it's gonna make the fight bigger, isn't it? I said, yes, but this isn't what I wanted. And he said, but it's gonna be bigger. And I said, yes. One week later, as a direct result of the press conference melee, the fight was put in peril when Tyson was denied a boxing license from the state of Nevada. Nevada turning down profit, Las Vegas turning down money on moral grounds. When Nevada turned you down, a place where prostitution's legal, 
You know, it's a little tough to find some place to go with this fight at that point. Other traditional boxing states also declined, including New Jersey and New York. But after several months of searching, Memphis, Tennessee finally agreed to host the fight, which was rescheduled for June 8, 2002. In April, Tyson opened his training camp in Maui, Hawaii, and the few journalists who traveled there found Tyson's behavior as raw and unchecked as ever. I may like Fonny King more than other people. It's just who I am. I sacrificed so much of my life. Can I at least get laid? You know what I mean? I've been robbed of most of my money. Can I at least get a blowjob? Well, Tyson, enough was never enough, no matter what he did. And this was almost accepted as just part of the show. How confident might I be that you can win this fight? Are you talking out of turn? No, I think we're all talking together. I normally don't do interview with women unless I fornicate with them. So you shouldn't talk anymore. Unless you want to, you know. It was just watching a man reduced to his rage. If I wish one of your guys had children so I could kick them in their fucking head or stomp on their testicles so you could feel my pain because that's the pain I have, waking up every day. It's part frustration, it's part fear, it's part performance. It's part hype. Mike is a salesman. Mike knows what put asses in seats. Mike knows controversy doesn't. Once in Memphis, great efforts were made to keep the fighters apart, including separate press conferences and weigh-ins, which dramatized how volatile Tyson was perceived to be. But when he arrived at the arena on fight night, there was a collective sigh of relief. Finally, Lewis Tyson was on. I didn't see him until a couple hours before he was supposed to go in the ring. And he was so confident. Mike was known for the intensity of his persona on fight night, the electric crackle that seemed to be going through his body and his brain as he approached the ring. And the Mike Tyson in Memphis seemed docile. I get into the ring and I see this barrier of, of bodies. I'm saying, this is interesting. Mike Tyson and Lennox Lewis yeah. separated by a cordon of security forces. Tyson was coming up to the barrier and looking over. He was looking at me, he was looking at my body. And I beat in my stomach saying, yeah, I'm ready. Now they get together again as professionals as Tyson's late trainer, Pastamato, had predicted they would. And here we go. I know he's going to come at me and I'm thinking, I'm not going to give up my ground. I'm the champion. In my mind, that's the ego aspect of it. Big left hand by Tyson after the jab by Lewis. Tyson seems to be the aggressor of the two. Everybody gave him the first round, but he got hit with an uppercut. I mean, it really hurt him bad. He came back to the corner and he told me, he said, Ronnie, I'm hurt. You hurt you? What do you think he was here for? You know, taking a date? I mean, you know, of course he hurt you. <laughs> now you're supposed to hurt him. Tyson fighting at a measured pace, not the whirlwind that some expect. Where I could tell by the middle of the second round, he has no chance, he has no hope. And he had to know that because I'm 30, 40 rows away and I can see it. Tyson's confidence ebbing, Lewis is seeming to grow. Lewis used his physical advantages to dominate the smaller, slower Tyson by the fourth round, was clearly weakened by the punishment he had been absorbing. Lewis come up with a right hand, leads on Tyson, but Eddie Cotton says no knockdown. After about four rounds, I noticed from the clinches where Lennox was physically pushing back, and you could see the little look in Mike that he'd given up. It is rapidly becoming a technical mismatch. Lennox Lewis is content right now to just stay outside, and Manuel Stewart wants him to finish this. Listen to Emmanuel. He get caught with some crazy shit. Step it up, the man is finished. He was actually cursing Lennox out and beating Lennox's chest. And I had to actually say, oh, Manny, Manny, don't beat him up in the corner. Because you got a dead man in front of you, and you still doing this. Just let that shit go. Let's fight it all the way. You got a dead man in front of you. Go out there and knock him out. And I'm saying, well, this is the wrong time to explain that I hurt my hand. So, you know, while he was giving me heck, I was taking it. But there was a reason why I wasn't out there throwing my right hand. So you know, I had to give it a couple rounds to settle in with the pain. He did what he's always done, which is not put himself at risk, 
being the chess player, protect your king, and then ultimately say checkmate. Target practice. This is easy for Lewis. If he doesn't get caught with something big, he's going to walk to victory. Mama didn't raise no fools, and he still respected this man's power. And for good reasons, he's the one in the ring with him. And no matter how hurt and slow Tyson is, he is a dangerous puncher. There was a little bit of the sadist in Lennox Lewis in this fight. Lennox, I feel, wanted to punish him for saying, you're going to eat my kids, biting him on his thigh. And I'll hit you twice hard. Pow, pow. And seeing where the blood is coming from. Yeah, I'm enjoying this. I'm really liking this. I think he wanted to let Mike feel some more of the punishment before he put him out of his misery. The bad boy of boxing is getting spanked by Lennox Lewis. I was surprised and shocked at some of the punches that he took. Fighters fight to the end. Gladiators. And plus, Mike, you know, he's a proud brother. He's been a great champion in the past. So, you know, he's going to give it all he's got and tell us no more. Ah, you understand? Not many sure people can do that. You understand? Like that. Shot, yeah, like Everybody you can can't talk it. in the corner. One at a fucking time. I kind of cursed at everybody in the corner, telling them to be quiet, let me do the talking. And I would kind of just became a mess. Nothing could have helped Mike Tyson in that fight. It was except a time machine. Finally, in the eighth round, Lewis wobbled the defeated former champion with a ferocious uppercut. And referee Eddie Cotton gave Tyson a brief reprieve when the end was long overdue. Hey, you all right, Mike? First knockdown of the fight. Now Lewis goes for the knockout. Mike Tyson was having problems, and uh, this was the time for my right hand to be really effective, so I threw it. They only give you credit when you knock out people. And people were saying they didn't like the way I boxed, the fact that I boxed too safe. So for me to knock out Mike Tyson gives me a great feeling of accomplishment. He took a, a vicious ass whooping. He got one of them down home Mississippi ass whoopings in that fight. I mean, grandma's lie so couldn't wash out what he got that night. He took that beating and he didn't have to take it. He could have just said no, no mas because you can die in there. Let's be frank, you can die in there. That to me was like his red badge of courage. Mike, are you sorry this fight didn't take place years ago? It wasn't meant to be. I've known Lil Terry since he was 16, 15 years old. I have mad respect. Everything I said was in um, proposition for promoting the fight. He knows I love him and his mother, and I know for, if he thinks I don't have respect and don't love him, he's crazy. So you're saying a lot People got a chance to see the real Mike Tyson. Mike's interaction with Lennox in the ring, in the locker room with his baby, being very considerate. No pain, no animosity, no tension in his face, no bad words. He didn't want to give him any more ammunition to dislike him any longer. Time will tell if Mike Tyson's uncharacteristic sportsmanship was a temporary response to a beating or something more permanent. And if Lewis will finally get full credit from the American public for all he's achieved. There's still at best a grudging process of respect for Lennox Lewis in America. People understand that Lennox is the, the best heavyweight of this particular era but probably most people define that era as after Tyson went south. Tyson was not the foil to make Lennox Lewis great. Mike Tyson, certainly in his prime, one of the great stories in boxing. But by the time Lewis got him, a shell, a shell of his former self. People will be interested in Mike Tyson until they put him in the ground. He'll be fighting for money for a while longer because he won't have any choice. But he stopped fighting to win a long time ago.
As an exercise in nostalgia, Lewis Tyson proved that the old stories still sell best. The pay-per-view gross of $112 million, a record for the sport. The two fighters split more than $60 million. That establishes why, in spite of the lopsided fight, there was a rematch clause in the contract. Thanks for watching The Tale of Lewis Tyson. These men are all about heart. So much emotion, five years of build-up. One thing is going to make a difference tonight is passion. It comes out of their core as human beings. A fight to the finish. There's so much desire. Looks, he had the ability, he was agreeable to white America, and not only just black America. Sugar Ray was a marketing marvel. Reach it up, feel it up. Sugar Ray's turning seven up. America is turning seven up. This is a boxer, you know, this is a gladiator, and he's being, celebrity wise, he's being moved over to the entertainment field. So you're the champ, huh? Yeah. <laughs> His popularity transcended the boxing world. There were people who never watched boxing at all who knew who Ray Leonard was. Sugar Ray Leonard was sort of the mini Ali. He was the most charismatic and accomplished fighter out there and had a chance to become the most important figure of his time in the ring. But early in Leonard's career, his supremacy appeared threatened by a burgeoning young fighter named Thomas Hearns. Thomas Hearns was physically unique, very broad back, very long arms, and because he was so thin in the legs, he could carry 147 pounds and still be 6'1". He, he was just a freak. I mean, a freak that someone can put this body together and give it the ability and know how to use it. And that was Emmanuel's job, showing how to take this body and make a champion out of him. Eager to escape the dilapidated streets of Detroit's inner city, Thomas Hearns trained under the yet unproven talent of Emanuel Stewart in the 100-degree lair of the legendary Kronk Gym. The heat in that hellhole will run a pretender out. When you get down there, there are these fighters, row upon row of fighters, skinny, flawed fighters, undernourished, overdosed, but you could see the will in their eyes. Thomas Hearns among the original crook fighters was not the most naturally talented, but what made Thomas so special was his unbelievable determination. I knew from day one that my students would definitely look out for me and guide me, not just to, to develop me as a fighter, but to develop me as a, a, a young man. Still awkwardly growing into his lanky frame, the teenage Thomas Hearns failed to qualify for the 1976 Olympic trials. So the following year, both trainer and fighter turned professional, where the keen steward quickly unveiled the hidden potential in Hearns' lethal right hand. The right hand was a creation of Emmanuel Stewart. He always made sure that when Tommy punched, that he would punch from a distance where he would extend his whole arm and so he would get the snap out of it. Tommy Hearns started out in first fight, knockout, second fight, knockout, third fight, knockout. I mean, I'm talking about these knockouts in the first, second, third round. It's over. He hit him with some right hand. A third round knockout for Thomas Hearns, his 19th knockout. I have never seen a welterweight hit as hard as this kid. Nobody with his size. He's going to get to anybody, any of these welterweights. That's for real. Nobody is going to beat this kid. He's the Moni City Cobra. He's the hitman, Tommy Hearns. 
The arrival of Thomas Hearns provided the fuel for an economically depressed Motor City, hungry for a new champion. Not since Joe Lewis came roaring out of Detroit back in 1934 has this town been so excited about a fighter as they are about Tommy Hearns. This was the rebirth of boxing in the city of Detroit. Thomas was our secret weapon. In the hometown crowd here in Detroit, on their feet with another standing ovation. Hearns has received so many of those here. They were loud and they were bold and, and you know, they weren't above heckling, but Tommy wasn't like that. He was the, the nicest, most polite, you know, quietest kid in the world. His biggest concern always of any fight did the fans enjoy. He was always concerned about the fans first and that he gave his best performance. That's a wonderful feeling to know that you are very much appreciated. I was on my way up the ladder and climbing up the ladder was, um, it was a great time for me. In 1980, all of Detroit gravitated to Joe Louis Arena as Hearns carried his 28-0 record into a world title match against Mexico's dreaded Pepino Cuevas. Hearns connected with the right hand in the second round, Cuevas just became a noodle. There's a Johnny Otto. Otto, Pepino. Pepino, Cuevas is down. Pepino's trainer immediately, no hesitation, threw the white towel in the ring. Immediately. That's how devastating that right hand was. That's all. The fight is over. It ends in the second round as Thomas Hearns becomes the new WBA welterweight champion. I said, holy crap, this guy can fight. This guy's bad. You are dodging that man. Well, the fact is just what they say. They've uh, made statements that I'm trying to get away from Thomas Hearns, that I'm afraid of him. The only thing that I fear is the fact that they won't give me the money that I deserve, the money that I want. Aren't you afraid he's going to beat you? I'm not afraid of any man. By 1980, the boxing world had two welterweight title holders, Thomas the Hitman Hearns and Sugar Ray Leonard who had recently regained his belt in a contentious rematch with Roberto Duran, where Leonard's taunting style frustrated the legendary champion into quitting. I think that Ray Leonard proved in the fights with Duran that he was more than a pretty face. It was no longer was Sugar Ray Leonard a really good fighter. It was, was he the best fighter out there? Are you going to fight Thomas Hearns? I'll fight Thomas Hearns when he reach the statue Thomas Hearns was legitimately feared, we believe, by the Leonard camp. Their response was to try to minimize him. If Hearns does not have the popularity of Durand, who else is there for you to fight? Tommy, is that your friend there? Uh, okay, do we have another question? Buddy? We perceived that as them ducking Thomas Hearns. But the rivalry continued to simmer as Dundee deferred the fight for nearly a year. So what for? Not now. Let it get juicy, because I can smell it when it's going to be a big, big promotion. I turn Hearns down. But Thomas Hearns remained Leonard's last barrier to greatness. Tommy was the best, and I had to prove that I was the best by beating a guy like Tommy Hearns. That fight was the most important fight of my professional boxing career. The showdown was finally set for September 16, 1981, in Las Vegas proving the genius of Dundee's delay by promising to be boxing's highest grossing fight of all time. With Leonard's take of nearly $12 million, banking him the largest salary in sports history. I'm looking forward to it. And buddy, you better be ready. You better be ready. All day long. Pop, 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 your head. All day long. All day long. All day long. one shot. Everybody in America wanted to be in Las Vegas that night. The only 25,000 people could see the fight, but 100,000 people came to town. It was that big of a deal for the boxing world and the city of Las Vegas. With Leonard perceived as the classic boxer and Hearns known as the devastating puncher, experts were at odds over the fight favorite. But to the thousands of loyal Detroit fans flooding into Vegas, Hearns was a sure thing. This was the safest bet in town, betting on Thomas Hearns. People were mortgaging their homes. They were selling their businesses. This was their retirement fund. And everything rested on Thomas Hearns. 
This is the feature attraction of the evening. 15 rounds of boxing for the undisputed welterweight championship of the world. I do remember walking towards the ring and all I thought about was Muhammad Ali, how he would react at that moment. And all I said to myself was, be the man. Sugar Ray Leonard. It was the first big super fight for both of us. It was like life or death. There was no in between. It was kind of scary. It was like being somewhere I'd never been before. Introducing Thomas, the Motor City Cobra, Hearn. And I remember in the introductions, he had this little smile on his face. I just thought to myself, ah, he thinks he arrived. All the words are now over. We are down to round one, and here we go. In the first round of that fight, everybody was fixed on those two combatants, and they were fixed on each other, and there was a heightened state of being among all of us. First round, well, the weight championship of the world. It is probably the most talked about fight in history. Leonard was baiting him. He was baiting him. He was staying outside. Hearns was stalking him, just measuring him, trying to hit him with that right. And you could tell, somebody's going to get hurt. Round one comes to an end. After the end of the first round, I touched him on top of the head and said, I got you, son. And I didn't like that. And Hearns sticks Ray Leonard, and Leonard feigns going down after the round is over. And you can't slap me around. Tommy, he's from the east side of Detroit, you know. You touch me wrong, man, I'm gonna break your head. He set the stage right there that he's not playing. This is no game anymore. We're fighting. Round two, first round very close. And the second round, Tommy stung him. Early, a good, good right, right hand. hand. Good right hand. Bam! Oh, my God. <laughs> Long night. Tommy was like a cobra. He was bringing the fight to Ray. Combination that time by Hearns. Once more, scores on Ray. The primary goal was to knock Ray Leonard out. Ernst stalking his man now. Ray sweating, I'm sweating too. I'm saying, Ray, move, 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 Ray. Right hand by Hearns, stands Leonard straight up and he backs off. We're going in second round, third round, fourth round, you know, I'm like, oh, what, what, what is he doing? What is he doing? Because Tommy is winning. Hearns' jab is bothering Leonard, there's no question about it. His jab was so accurate and so fast that my left eye started to swell. Tommy was tattooing, ba -ba boom, ba -ba boom. I mean, no if and buts. Tommy is winning the fight. It's starting to build. That fire is getting bigger and bigger. It's so far, it's living up to its bill. Come on, relax. Don't look out fighting this guy. One third of this fight is over. We're going into the second oh. third. Even though Thomas was slightly ahead, I was never, never, never relaxed. Ray Leonard was very much stronger than most people realize. I knew the explosion was still going to happen sooner or later. Ray gets inside, left oh. hand, hurts, hurts, hurts backs hurts, him up. Hurts. From there, the fight changed. The fight totally reversed. Leonard became the puncher, the stalker, and Hearns became the boxer who was evading. Ray's corner telling him to stay on him, stay on him. Hearns backs up now. Leonard stalks him. Leonard, 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 Leonard Hearns is still hurt. hurt. Thomas got hit. Thomas got hurt. I mean, we couldn't believe it. Combinations once more by Ray Leonard. Hearns' legs are still like jelly. That's the first time we have ever seen Thomas in trouble. We didn't know if he could ever take a punch. Hearns is against the ropes, and he has definitely had the starch taken out of him here. They could have knocked him out in that round, I'm certain. And he let him off, thinking he's playing possum. He's he, this isn't. He's not really hurt as bad as this. If I go after him, is he going to catch me? Right hand misses by Leonard. Gives Hearns another moment. He's still hurt, though. Combinations right above us. Hearns goes reeling back once more. Against the ropes again. It's been coming to the end of round six. At the end of the sixth round, I was threatening to possibly stop the fight. Most definitive round of the fight. That round could turn the fight around. But Thomas has tremendous pride and determination. We doctored him up, put some ice, and brought him back as quick as we could. Sent him back out there for some more damage. Good enough to talk. Good enough to talk. Good enough to Once more, Hurts back up. Hurts is hurt. Against the ropes, and he is hurt. All I thought about was doing was just keep throwing punches, just keep throwing punches, just keep throwing punches. And right now, Thomas Hurts is an open book for Ray Leonard. Backs up against the ropes. And his legs almost buckle on. I stayed right in his chest. I stayed right in his body. From there on out, that was my fight plan, to, to just take the fight to him, to break him down. Leonard giving a lot of pounding to Thomas Hearns, who unquestionably is hurt. I don't 
think Hearns is going to weather this off. I really don't. Tommy was in so much pain. I don't know how he stayed on the street. I really don't. I wasn't so much scared. It was just um, I was trying, trying to regain my composure. Thomas Hearns looking at his part to beat the fighter now. Another right hand drives him back into the ring post. Crowd is on his feet here and Vegas. We come to the end of the round. I knew I had. I said, this is over. I think it was gone. It was out. Tommy Hearns is in a land now that he's never been to before. I knew once that bell rang to go back out there, I'd been okay. All I needed was a few minutes to get myself back together. Emmanuel was trying to just get him together. So don't worry about it. You know, just, we got to box him. Tommy, you have to box. So Ray Leonard comes to round eight now, having taken the measure of his man in the last two rounds. Right now, there seems little doubt as to the outcome of this fight. That's when Tommy showed the true heart of a champion. It was amazing. You could see him, you know, for a couple of rounds, like just, you know, just trying to clear his head as he stayed away. And then he started pecking away, pecking away, and he's piling up points. He was on his toes. He was using the ring. He was sliding side to side. He's no longer the hitman. He's the dancer. I don't think I've ever seen a fight that took an 180 degree turn the way this one did. I think Sugar Ray is a little bit confused. It was very, very difficult for me to keep up with him because I was exhausted. I was gasping for breath. That jab snaps the head of Ray Leonard back and lands right on that puppy left eye. My, my eye was so tender that his jab would, would seem like a sledgehammer. Larry, you've been scoring the fight. You really do have Hearns getting back in in the last three rounds. I do. I mean, Hearns has got it won. All he's got to do is keep pecking away, and he's going to be welterweight champ. By the end of the 12th round, Hearns had boxed his way back to a significant lead on all three judges' scorecards. You're back ahead on points now. You heard Emmanuel Stewart that you're back ahead on points. And with three rounds remaining, Leonard's legacy was on the line. You got nine minutes. You're blowing it now, son. You're blowing it. My eye was like a slit. I had no peripheral vision. I mean, I remember looking at it and just thinking, <laughs> Angelo kept saying to me, you're blowing it, kid. You're blowing it. You're blowing it. Break! I separate the man from the boys now. We're blowing it. In other words, you lose it. You got to take it away from him, OK? Speed! And you just see him explode out of the corner. This, of course, is the 13th round, Randy. You heard everything that Angelo Dundee had to say. You got nine minutes. You got nine minutes. Ray just gave it all. I mean, everything. I mean, see, Tommy dig down, but Ray stooped down and dig down to get this fight out. I don't know. It's going for the whole boat. Hitting up with combinations. Leonard has given everything he's got. Hurt starts down the ground, and now goes down through the ropes. The only thing that kept him from being knocked into the seats was he was completely tangled up in the ropes. I was hoping that Tommy could hold on. I was hoping that Tommy could keep moving. Tommy had a huge heart. He was just going on guts there. Time-wise, was getting close. Tommy knew that the only thing I had to do is box for two rounds. I'm the champ of the world. Basically, if he could have stayed on his feet, he would have won the fight. He was that far ahead on some of the judges' scorecards. We knew Ray was behind, so he had to knock him out. Leonard wants to put his man away right here. Does not want this fight to go to a decision. It was a race against the clock, two of the greatest fighters of all time. And a right hand, and that hurts oh, him. Hurt sense of winning. Hurts is not down yet. Ray, at that point, you know, smell blood. Ray Thompson now, two left hands against the rope, Hearns is reeling. I threw every punch that I had left. I just went on a rampage. Trying to go downstairs is Ray Leonard. Thomas was on the ropes, still holding his hands up, blocking punches, but didn't have the energy to even hold his body erect. Hearns just trying to hang on here. Left hand sends Hearns back against the ropes again, and that's all. It's over, and Ray Leonard champion of the world against a very gay Thomas Hurts. You cannot say enough about both of these fighters. I jumped in the ring. We grabbed Ray. <laughs> it was the greatest thing since my mother kicked him. That was Ray's big obstacle. That's the mountain he had to climb. And once he climbed it, oh, God, it was a beautiful show from there. Hail to the new undisputed welterweight champion of the world, Sugar Ray. Leonard!
Ray became the ambassador of the boxing. And Tommy was the one to put him in that position. You look at a rather stunned Thomas Hearns right now. I felt I let myself down as well as my fans. Um, that was a fight that I definitely had won. I had it in the bag already and just let it slip away. Detroit really lived and died with him that night. And they had no compunction to come into Tommy later and saying, I bet my house on you. There was two chapters in the same division, and one of us had to be eliminated. And I should may I say, Detroit, I shall return. I cried all that night after him, so I woke up the next morning and I started to cry again. And Thomas himself, he cheered me up like a father cheered up a son when it should have been the other way around. Tommy Hearns was clearly not disgraced in the fight. He raised the level of his game. He also raised the level of Sugar Ray Leonard's game. One of us came out victorious, but still, I say in my book, we both are still champions. That fight was the most important fight to Sugar Ray Leonard and to Tommy Hearns, without question. Leonard lost an eye. Hearns lost his consciousness, but they both gained immortality, ring immortality that night. Stand up, go stand up, stand up. Right. Three months after Leonard Hearns, Muhammad Ali fought for the last time. The passing of the torch was complete. But Ray Leonard and Tommy Hearns didn't meet again in the ring until eight years later, 1989. That night, Hearns knocked Sugar Ray Leonard down twice and seemed to many at ringside to have earned his long-sought vindication. But the judges' scorecards turned up even, and Leonard escaped with a draw and a sigh of relief. Thanks for watching The Tale of Leonard Hearns. Hello, I'm Jim Lampley. Welcome to this look back at the stories behind Holmes Cooney, one of the most memorable fights in 30 years of boxing on HBO. It was a given that whoever succeeded Muhammad Ali as heavyweight champion would suffer by comparison in the public eye. That Larry Holmes was more a technician than a lightning bolt, more a worker bee than a cult icon, only made his road to glory that much rougher. And when a power-punching New York-based Irish-American challenger came along to face him, it was perhaps written in American granite that their confrontation would be not just about hurt, but also about hope, white hope. This should be one whale of a finish. All the marbles on the line. Go. On June 9, 1978, at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, a 28-year-old heavyweight, best known for being Muhammad Ali's sparring partner, began the 15th round of his bout with heavyweight champion Ken Norton, dead even on the judges' scorecards. The 15th round of the world heavyweight title is on the line right now. One round, winner take all. Larry is fighting back, really now. This is what he has to do. See if he's got enough left to take the champ out. I used to tell people that I won't be heavyweight champion in the world. And they said, Larry, you ain't gonna make it. I said, I have no heart. As Holmes comes back, scores a kick shot. He's got Gordon in trouble. Yes. Running out of time, and that's it. It's all over. And I said, you watch. We have a split decision for the new. Larry Holmes has done it. We have a new heavyweight champion in the world. Larry Holmes, seventh grade dropout from Easton, Pennsylvania would begin the second longest reign as heavyweight champion in the history of boxing. Seven and a half years, fighting in the wake of a legend and for a respect he would always find elusive. Ray is down from the upper I defended my title over 20 times. Larry clips him with the right hand and down he goes. Didn't duck anybody. And retains the heavyweight championship of the world. I wasn't getting the respect that I thought I should have got. Larry Holmes was one of the great heavyweight champions ever. Yet, through all his career, it was very cold in the shadows where he was living because Muhammad Ali was still a champion in the eyes of the public. Civil rights figure, loud, brash talker, braggart, made Ali the most charismatic and colorful fighter that ever lived. 
And here, Larry Holmes, who's in a lunch pail, blue collar guy. And he doesn't nearly have the fire that Allie had. He was the forgotten heavyweight. Nobody knew who he was. I have to con convince you day in and day out, there is no one in the world today could beat me. I went into an Allentown fair with him in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and he was introduced as George Foreman. I get called more Joe Frazier than I did George Foreman. <laughs> I have 29 KOs with 39 fights, with 11 title defenses, with 10 straight knockouts. Holmes was not a larger-than-life figure. He didn't have a dazzling style. He didn't have a dazzling personality. He was just a really good prize fighter who was the heavyweight champion of the world. Dazzling personality or not, by 1982, Holmes had beaten everyone in his way, including a pummeling of the great Ali. But there was one candidate left for him to take on, an undefeated Irish kid from New York who looked like Rocky Balboa and supposedly had a left hook like Joe Frazier. So I think that a lot of people related to me and the underdog. It was like the Rocky story being lived. The New York City suburb of Huntington, Long Island, had never before been a breeding ground for heavyweight contenders. Then again, for a steel worker named Arthur Cooney, it really didn't matter where he moved his family. His son Jerry would be a fighter. My old man was a tough guy, and he always wanted to be a fighter, and unfortunately, he never could be, so he kind of built a ring in the backyard, and he used to box with us himself. My father hit me probably the hardest I got hit a couple of times. He told me his father would get him up in the morning and make him run through the dark streets of Huntington. When other kids could do different stuff after school, he had to go get on the train and go to New York to the gym. His father made him feel like crap. Ah, you're a bum. You're no good. You'll never be anything. Boxing was a way for me to express the anger I felt from the house I grew up in. It made me somebody, and it fed me, and it kept me alive. Let's work on this guy. Let's break this night guy's neck. Come on. Working with trainer Victor Valley, Cooney turned professional in 1977 and hired as his managers a pair of Long Island real estate moguls named Dennis Rappaport and Mike Jones. They were boxing novices who'd quickly earned a reputation and a nickname, the Wacko Twins. We got the nickname the Wacko Twins from some very creative things we did for publicity. We had a fight of Ronnie Harris. Ronnie was black and he wanted to fight with a yarmulke and claimed he was a black Jew. With Howard Davis, we had him give uh, long stem roses to his opponents. With Jerry, we brought leprechauns into the ring to put hexes on the opponent. In the game of boxing, they were very much within the cultural mainstream of that sport, because it's a wacko sport. You couldn't stop Rappaport from talking with a gun, a whip, and a chair. There's a love affair taking place today between America and Jerry Cooney. It's so profound, it'll make people forget an affair to remember. He was one of those guys you talk to and you kind of touch all your wallet and all your parts just to make sure everything's still there. There's mom, apple pie, and Jerry Cooney. He cared about what was going into his pocket and how quickly he could get it there. Jerry Cooney, I think he was kind of a product. A product that rarely appeared in heavyweight boxing. A product that history taught them was better than gold. Jerry Cooney is a white fighter. The great white hope always sells. It just so happens that the vast majority of people in this country are white. And the fact that there's yet another black heavyweight champion of the world is not nearly so interesting as the fact that there is a white guy out there who actually punches like a wrecking ball. They had the perfect product for them to put before the consumer and they were playing it for all it was worth. The product began his pro career with a string of quick knockouts that garnered plenty of notice, but left most grizzled boxing scribes skeptical. He might as well have been fighting unemployed shepherds and vacationing streetcar conductors when you look at the line of guys he fought. First for Jerry Cooney. Well, I think he made believers out of a lot of people when he fought Norton. Good evening. Welcome to Madison Square Garden. In May of 1981, Cooney faced a legitimate threat in Ken Norton, the man Larry Holmes had beaten for the title three years earlier. It was on this night that Cooney won over many of his critics. And I'm figuring this guy's built like a monster, I'm in trouble, and I get into the center of the ring and I think to myself, man, he's not that big. A right hand buckle of knees of Norton. Took him out 54 seconds. With combinations of left stance, one straight up, Norton's about to 
Scott. Gordon is on his knees. He is not going to get up from this. It was brutal. When Norton slumped into that corner, I've seen fighters die in a ring, and it wasn't unlike that. After that fight, he became legitimate. And he was white. When had there last been a respected white heavyweight champion? Rocky Marciano, three decades before. For the media, it became a part of the narrative. Do you resent the fact that people make a special deal out of you perhaps becoming a white champion in a black-dominated sport? Well, I think that uh, in today's time, it's sad that, that people are going to label other people. And I, I never thought about the white hope and that kind of thing. It was just never a part of myself. I was knocking everybody out. I deserved a shot at the championship. And I never thought about that. But everyone else was thinking about it, especially promoter Don King, who was determined to match his champion with the White Hope and to promote it as a race war. So Don likes to say the only color he pays attention to is green. For the money, race sells. It's a white and black fight. Any way you look at it, you cannot change that. Jerry Cooney, Irish, white, Catholic. Here you have an Irish American against an African American and it was a very effective sales hook. But first, King and Rappaport would need to strike a deal for what would become the richest fight in history. As they began negotiating about for 1982, Rappaport demanded terms no inexperienced challenger had ever received before. Complete financial parity with the champion, an even split of $20 million. We had the attraction. Larry couldn't put rear ends in seats. Jerry Cooney could, not because he was white, but because he was right. Jerry had the right complexion to get the connection. I don't fought four black guys the one that made the money. I fight one white guy and make all the money. But it didn't take long for the money and the massive attention Cooney was receiving to begin to gnaw at the proud champion. If the man was black, he wouldn't be nowhere. You know it, I know it, everybody know it. Jerry Cooney's a white hope. I said, they hope I don't kill his ass. And if he come in here today, I'll punch him in the mouth for free. I mean, he was a nasty guy. I was more reserved, quiet, and he was more aggressive, you know, yelling and screaming. I tell it like it is. And come June 11th, I promise you, Jerry Looney Cooney will be knocked out. It was ugly because everybody was talking about the white hope. When a black guy fights, a white guy is automatic. Automatic or not, the people who stood to gain the most from the racial hostility were only too happy to pour oil on the smoldering fire. The people that handled this fight turned it into racial dynamite, and Dennis Rappaport was largely responsible for that. I do not respect Larry Holmes as a human being. I don't think he's carried the championship with dignity. Between Don King and Dennis Rappaport, listening to the two of them shrieking at each other, they were a circus. I found it contemptible when anyone would use the race card. Larry translated everything into black and white. If it wasn't a black-white situation, Jerry Cooney wouldn't be sitting up here talking about multi-million dollars. I felt discriminated against. I felt discriminated against everywhere I went. People shot in my windows, blew my mailbox up. Once everybody congregated in Las Vegas, it was ugly. It really got ugly and it really got base. We have to have press conference in segments now in separation because the two gladiators, the champion and the contender, they can't be on the same podium at the same time. There was real bad blood between the camps. There was a battlefield, like getting ready for war. There was that type of tension. And we weren't going to be intimidated. This fight at some point in this hype began to get out of control. Fearing an outbreak of violence between the fighters and their entourages, Holmes asked the Reverend Jesse Jackson to help quell the tension. It got beyond a great boxing match between an up-and-coming young fighter who was white, a champion who was black, into the social overlap. And my appeal was, let Larry and Poonet fight in the ring, but you fight outside the ring. It was tense all across the country. And it was one of the hottest days I could recall. Boy, it was just a steam bath in Las Vegas. It reminded me a little bit of the day in the Spike Lee movie, Do the Right Thing. We all know what happened at the end of that movie. It is the mecca for the world of lavish entertainment, a showcase for the top names in show business. The months of racial exploitation leading up to the bout certainly proved positive for the promoters. 
By June 11, 1982, the Holmes-Cooney fight had become one of the most anticipated events in modern sports history. WBC heavyweight champion Larry Holmes defends his crown against the number one contender, Jerry Cooney. It grossed more money than any theatrical opening, than any Super Bowl. Broke every record at the crap tables and the roulette wheels and in the casinos. To be sure, the heat here in Las Vegas has been oppressive, but the 100 degree temperatures that we recorded on our own thermometer ringside here at Caesars Palace just a little bit ago are nothing compared to the heat of anticipation that has surrounded this heavyweight championship fight. I don't think I've ever been around a fight where the opinions were so divided. There was a, a whole undercurrent of anger. You just feel people choosing sides. Just as blacks identify with heroes like Jackie Robinson and Muhammad Ali, white people occasionally invest in a Vince Lombardi or a Jerry Cooney. I felt a palpable feeling of danger out there. And I have to think the public sentiment right now is toward the challenge of Jerry Cooney. And there was some threats that Cody would be shot or Holmes would be shot. You look at what is certainly a spectacle here at Caesars Palace. This is Jerry Cooney, the challenger, coming into the ring. I remember walking out of the dressing room and looking up and seeing snipers on every roof. Jerry Cooney comes into the ring. He does look relaxed, but at the same time, he has a rather stern look in his face. All the other nonsense that took place beforehand didn't mean anything. I wanted to show him that he wasn't a better man than me. Larry Holmes comes in here having won 39 fights without a loss. 29 of those fights coming as knockouts. He ain't a white hope to me. He's just another guy out there trying to take my head off. The hype was finally over, and it was time for the two undefeated heavyweights to get it on. Yet before the referee would give his final instructions, the champion, who longed for respect, would be tweaked one more time. Introducing, in the red corner, defying decades of boxing tradition, the champion was introduced before the challenger. The undefeated heavyweight champion of the world, Larry Holmes. They wanted to introduce me first, and they did. They didn't want to give me the credit, and they did. I've never seen it in any other championship fight that I've ever done. That just further fueled the fire for Larry Holmes. And fighting out of Huntington, New York. Everybody knew why. They were doing it to give Jerry Cooney's fans a chance to build up, build up, build up, and drown out the cheers for Larry Holmes. Gentlemen, Jerry. That was absolutely despicable. Remember to check this up at all times. When we were in the center of the ring and Mills Lane said, touch up, he looked at me and said, Holmes did, and said, let's have a good fight. Shake hands now, let's get it off. When the bell rings, all the bullshit goes out the window. There is electricity. I realize that that may be a cliche, but there is simply no other way to describe what is happening right now. It's me and you. You can't call the cops. Round one, the heavyweight championship of the world, the most anticipated fight in years. Because so many of his fights ended in quick knockouts, Jerry Cooney wasn't used to going more than just a few rounds. But as this 15-round championship bout began, going the distance weighed on his mind. I was thinking, oh boy, I better go slow, make sure I can go the distance in case I have to and that really affected me. Holmes all business with the jab right now. And Holmes was fighting such a disciplined, tight fight. Holmes being very patient. He was absolutely determined that he was not going to give Cooney a chance to land a big punch. The first big punch wouldn't land until late in the second round. He was thrown by the champion. One, two, right on the chin. And Cooney took a good right hand from Holmes. He staggers and is down. Cooney is down from a right hand by Larry Holmes. I get dropped to one knee and I think to myself, what in the hell are you doing here? And I got up. He is back up, but he is on rubber legs. And he gets up, the fight's harder. <laughs> he gave him a lot of respect, he gave Cooney. He thought, you know, wounded tigers are dangerous. He didn't want to get too close. End of round two, Larry Holmes being very patient after he had his man down. Obviously, he didn't think he was hurt that bad. In the corner between rounds, Dennis Rappaport attempted to inspire Cooney with words that reminded many of the pre-fight racial ugliness. Who is the guy in the corner who looked at Cooney during the fight and said, 
America needs you. In the changing of God, America needs you. He wasn't talking about Harlem, I'm sure. That's BS. I was saying things that I thought that could prompt them to get that little extra effort that may have been the difference between the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. Cooney responded in the fourth with one of his best rounds of the bout. A good left to the body, backs Holmes up. That was a right hand to the ribs that seemed to hurt Holmes. Another good left hand. Cooney with another good left to the ribs of Larry Holmes as the bell sounds ending the fourth round. He hurt me with a left hook to the body, and I went back to the ropes like death. And Holmes a little bit slow going back to his corner. Thank God that the bell went ping. There's a right hand by the champion, and another right hand. The longer the fight went on, the more we saw the distance between the two fighters. And a combination that time by Holmes scores once more on Cooney. One fighter was a complete pro. The other fighter was an incomplete pro. Holmes comes back with a right hand and the legs wobble once more. Cooney is in trouble against the ropes. Now a left and an uppercut. Cooney goes through the rope, but is still on his feet. Hard right by the champion. Holmes scoring almost at will, but Cooney will not go down. End of the round, a big round for Holmes, but Cooney would not fall. By round nine, as Holmes was gaining control of the fight, Cooney would throw the most memorable uppercut of his career. There was a low blow thrown by Cooney. Rob Williams said it was the punch that was felt around the world. 20 years later, I still feel it. Cooney would eventually have a total of three points deducted for low blows. By the end of round 12, he was also badly cut and fatigued. After the 12th round, I thought to myself, you know, I really can't win. I started to lose hope. And then I wanted to just show him, listen, you can't hurt me, man. 13 round, the punch was going boom, 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 headshots. Cooney very wobbly in the center of the ring, takes another right hand. Holmes knows he has his man in trouble, another right hand. The body will fall if that hand gives up. This one is all but over. Cooney against the ropes, Mills Lane steps in, and Victor Valley is saying no more, I believe. Victor Valley is in the ring saying no more, that's it. Victor Valley, to his credit, really cared about Jerry Cooney. He didn't want to see me get hurt. It is over, and Mills Lane raises Larry Holmes' hand in victory. Jerry Cooney fought his ass off that night. Whatever he had, he left in the ring that night, and he just fought a guy who was just so overwhelmingly better than he was. Larry Holmes had paid his dues. Holmes' victory was a victory for professionalism. The winner, and still the WBC heavyweight champion of the world, Larry Holmes. The 13th round technical knockout was Holmes' 40th straight victory without a loss. But to the champion, it meant much more than just preserving an undefeated record. I feel relieved. I feel the pressure's gone. In my heart, my mind, I felt that I didn't have to prove anything anymore. Larry Holmes believed beating Cooney was going to be his moment. But it wasn't. For much of America, the wrong guy won. So it wasn't a crowning moment anymore. There was never going to be a moment for Larry Holmes. But he never, ever got out of the shadow of Muhammad Ali. I felt disappointed and let down. What are your feelings about tonight, your personal feelings? Should have ducked a little more. I wish I would have won. I've been away from home a long time. And I think that the people were great. And uh, I wanted to win for them as much as I want to win for me. I just won 13 rounds for, for the heavyweight championship of the world. Of course it was emotional. It's a tough night. Long night. He really felt he had let down so many people. And I feel sorry for, for all the people that really wanted me to win. I think so much pressure was put on him that he was carrying a load for a large portion of America. I just want to say I'm very sorry. Cooney made a huge payday, one of the biggest in the history of boxing, but he never seemed to have to stop apologizing for his performance. It seemed to scar him psychologically. Listen, I grew up in a household where I learned five things from my old man. You know what they were? You're no good, you're a failure, you're not going to amount to anything. Don't trust nobody and don't tell nobody your business. When I lost to Larry Holmes in 1982, I felt all five of those things smack me right across the face. I deal with them. 
the law sent Cooney's career into a puzzling tailspin, marked by substance abuse, depression, and lack of ring activity. He would only fight five more times before retiring in 1990. George Foreman blows away Jerry Cooney! Jerry Cooney was a product of everybody else's ideas and other people's money and other people's perceptions. He's a guy who just sort of showed up, became bigger than life, and then just kind of went back to being what he was in the first place. It's just a good guy sitting on the next bar stool. 15 rounds of boxing for the WBC Heavyweight Championship of the World. The fight is remembered sort of like a passing tornado. Something bad happened, something dangerous happened. And it's gone and maybe we're still trying to figure out what it was. America went into the fight choosing sides, black against white. It played to the worst and to the best. It played to the worst in, in those people that accepted this fight as a black-white fight. It played to the best to those people who saw the artistry of Larry Holmes and the courage of Jerry Cooney put them all together, and you had the heavyweight carnival to end all heavyweight carnivals. We can only hope that as a country, we've come as far as have Holmes and Cooney, who can now be seen as friends. Cooney has organized a foundation aimed at creating after-career opportunities and financial help for retired fighters, and Holmes makes frequent appearances on behalf of Cooney's foundation. Thanks for watching The Tale of Holmes Cooney. Hello, I'm Jim Lampley. Welcome to this look back at the stories behind Prior Arguello, one of the most memorable fights in 30 years of boxing on HBO. The early 1980s marked a golden era in boxing below the heavyweight division as fighters like Ray Leonard, Tommy Hearns, and Roberto Duran filled the stardom gap left behind by Muhammad Ali. But maybe the greatest action fight of the era matched a man aching for the spotlight, Aaron Pryor, against the class and charm of Nicaraguan mini-media darling, Alexis Arguello. The fates were not totally kind to Aaron Pryor. Aaron Pryor was the original bad luck kid. He always had everything against him. He was a bad guy. He could never be the matinee idol. He could never be the good guy. Alexis Arguello is one of the most gracious people in or out of the ring. He was the embodiment of all the things that I loved about sports. Arguello, the conquistador, the, the, the hero figure. He was an easy guy to root for. Kind of a Spanish Don, a true sportsman. He exemplifies the word champion. Usually in boxing, one of the fighters is portrayed as this gallant figure, and the other is sort of portrayed as Grendel. Aaron Pryor was born the fifth of seven children in a Cincinnati ghetto gravitated to a career as violent as his upbringing. I have a very violent family. The impression my mom always gave us, if somebody hit you, you better hit them back. And she used to pop, pop me in here. She said, why you don't move your head when I hit you? I was like, mama, I didn't know I was supposed to move my head. He doesn't really have a lot of guidance as a child. And um, he walks into a gym one day. And here's a, a sport that he's, he's good at, and he gets attention. You know, here's, a, here's a, an older guy, a coach, paying attention to him, which he didn't necessarily have that guidance growing up. I used to be frustrated that nobody in my family came to see me fight. My amateur fights, when I fought in Russia, Poland, Germany, Mexico, um, didn't nobody even know I was gone. I think there was a lot of pain that he was dealing with inside. I think he suppressed a lot of things, and uh, those actions came out when he entered the ring. Prior on the ball of his feet. He beat everybody in the He's one of our top, top amateur fighters of all time. In 76, he won the National Gold Glove Championship in Miami, Florida. Beat the heck out of Tommy Hearns. Prior is your champion. Leading up to the 1976 Olympics, Pryor was marked as America's best bet to win a gold medal in boxing. Aaron, I didn't see it, but I've been told by the guys that were there, Aaron was so, so good in that weight class. Ray moved up. 
Ray Leonard moved up to get away from Aaron Pryor. But when the famed 76 boxing team arrived in Montreal, Aaron Pryor remained in Cincinnati, reeling from a controversial loss in the Olympic trials. I truly believe that uh, if I'd have made the Olympic team, that I would have been a lot more successful than I was. He was so upset about not making the Olympic Games that he stood in front of a mirror and he hit himself. He hit himself. I saw Sugar Ray Leonard and him. He felt he always belonged in that group and in that class. When he saw them get the big contracts and the money, it broke his heart. Ray Leonard, Howard Davis, and the Spinks brothers, Michael and Leon, won gold medals and signed lucrative television contracts. With no Olympic recognition, Aaron Pryor took a job as a sparring partner for Howard Davis, the man who beat him in the Olympic trials. I was making 500 bucks a week working for Howard Davis. Hey, I beat him up a couple of times, I lost my job. For three years, Aaron Pryor pummeled overmatched opponents. Still, crowds were thin everywhere but his hometown, Cincinnati. I was making a couple of thousand, two, three thousand a fight. Howard Davis and them was making a million, million and a half. Back then, if you weren't made into something special by the networks, then you really weren't anything special. Unable to draw a title shot despite a record of 23 and 0, Pryor moved out of the lightweight division. And only his second fight as a junior welterweight, Pryor faced Antonio Kid Cervantes for the title. In the second round, Cervantes knocked him down. And the referee was counting and he was smiling at Cervantes. Oh, now you really want to fight. And he got up and he just destroyed Cervantes. And from then on, it was all Aaron Pryor. His talent was just tremendous. That was Aaron Pryor. He would take your best punch, spit in your eye, and then kick your ass. What time is it? What time is it? What time is it? Pryor was one of those early inner city fighters who, who came with an entourage of people making noise and threats and, and charging themselves up. And he always had this chorus, you know, everywhere he went. Yeah, I got a bunch of guys to me. What time is it? Hulk time! What time is it? Hulk time! His need for love, his need for family, his need for I am somebody was just tremendous. What time is it? Hulk time! What time is it? Hulk time! What time is it? Hulk time. You know, after a while it was all right. We know what time it is. <laughs> but the spectacle surrounding Pryor rarely caught the attention of big name opponents. A dangerous fighter with meager earning potential, few marquee boxers took the risk of fighting Aaron Pryor. Who do you want to fight next? I want to fight Leonard because I feel like I'm the king of the junior welterweights for what I've already done. A bout with Sugar Ray Leonard offered the surest path to a world-class payday, but Pryor's challenges were repeatedly now, dismissed. I had just been um, asked that you want to challenge me and that you knock me down and I knock you down. And We've had workouts when we were amateur. I actually knocked the guy as a pro and an amateur. What do you know? He knows me. Me and Leonard, you know, I worked with him for flat three or four before he became Mr. Leonard. <laughs> and there was a little rivalry there, always was. But I know one thing, whenever they'd be in the ring working out, Aaron used to give him a working over. I just beat the number one contender in my weight division. I ain't got nothing to prove there. It's so why show. not come up? This is my show, pal. Go ahead. <laughs> Any other questions, please? <laughs> I want to fight. I want to fight. I beat Tommy Hearns. I Aaron to Pryor was being shortchanged by history, if not opponents. He needed a marquee name. Alexis Arguello! Alexis Arguello was a classic boxer. And by that, I mean every time you throw a punch, an opening is left. And a great boxer knows what that opening is immediately. Under 30 seconds to go. He was like a bullfighter in there. Oh, big right hand! And that was the art that I loved. By 1981, Alexis Arguello had been crowned champion in three divisions. Yet he remained relatively anonymous to the American public. However, no fighter earned greater respect within the boxing community. 
if there was a person that embodied the whole idea of the sweet science, it was Alexis Arguello. He was the first guy that started going to the opponent and giving the credit they need or they deserve for being in the ring like with a guy like him. He's hurt against him. He's hurt he is this time. There he goes. Arguello's popularity crested when he beat the popular brawler Ray Boom Boom Mancini in 1981. Mancini's ailing father, whose promising fight career was ended by an injury suffered in World War II, was on hand. I love you, father. That's the most beautiful thing you have, like I have my father, and I promise if I can do something for you, let me know, please. Thank you. Five minutes ago, this guy was a raging tornado, crazed dog who had just beaten the crap out of this kid. And now he's got his arm around him and telling him how he loved his father. His father was crying. That's what we're, that's what we're talking about. He won the Hearts of America over. And after that, he became one of America's champions. As Arguello embraced celebrity in America, civil war raged in his homeland. As the Sandinista rebel army attempted a takeover of the Nicaraguan government. For Arguello, returning home was no longer an option. His habit had always been to wrap himself in the Nicaraguan flag, the blue and white, in Madison Square Garden in July of 79 with Bazooka Limon. A Sandinista guy came up and gave him the red and black Sandinista, and he wrapped himself in the Sandinista flag. He would say later that may have been the biggest mistake he ever made in his life, because then the Sandinistas wanted a piece of him. Arguello, at the beginning of the war, uh, he actually supported the Sandinistas. He felt they had blackmailed him. He didn't like their tactics. He didn't like being strong-armed. He didn't like being told what to do by this revolutionary group. And as a result, they took everything he had. Arguello became the most famous political exile of the Sandinista occupation. The Sandinistas seized his house, seized all of his assets, evicted his mother, in 79, you know, the revolution had started in Nicaragua, and we picked up and left everything that we had. By 1982, after leaving his war-torn homeland, Arguello rebuilt his financial standing and settled with his family in Miami, Florida. A big portion of the community down here had left Cuba, had, uh, basically because of similar reasons. So they embraced Arguello for, for taking a stand against the Sandinista government at that time, because the Sandinista government had a close link with the Castro government. He was a prototype and a hero to the Cuban community because it was part of the Cuban cause to, to get rid of Castro. So in other words, he symbolized the fight against communism. Arguello's popularity was so immense in South Florida that the Orange Bowl was selected as the site for his fight with Aaron Pryor. You don't beat an Aaron Pryor and you don't beat an Alexis Arguello until you absolutely destroy either fighter. Who's the hungrier fighter, you think? I don't know that at 1.6 and 1.5 million you can say anybody's hungry. Aaron Pryor wants a recognition. Alexis Aguayo is fighting for history. That gives you a heck of an incentive that money can't. Nicaragua in tu suelo. It is a madhouse here. As Arguello comes into the ring with a Nicaraguan flag. And the crowd responds, and I don't think there's any question, Larry, but it is going to be a pro-Arguello crowd here. So although he is in exile, he is still a, a great hero in his country. Ray, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that Arguello is not the champion here, but the challenger. The stadium filled in the hope of seeing Arguello claim his fourth title, while Pryor had at last earned a chance to prove himself on the world stage. Says you look at Aaron Pryor, and he is a man intense right now, Ray. I attempted to make Alexis believe that I was going to kill him. What I felt I was going to do to him was for real. You've got this guy standing across the ring from you, and he's got this attitude and this aura about him that he doesn't care if he dies. I think he personified in Alexis all the things he could never be. Most importantly, respected. From Manoa, Nicaragua, Mr. Alexis Arguello. Pryor felt slighted, 
he was introduced in a distinctly different manner than the man trying to take his title. Adam Aguero! I'm the champion. And you can't say Mr. Pryor, you said Mr. Aguero. You know, I said, man, I'm gonna get you. You can't beat me. You gonna wish you hadn't took this fight. Pryor with the first punch, he scores with the right hand. Up tempo, right from the opening bell. They were throwing bombs from the get-go and never stopped. Pryor with the right hand and scores on Pryor, whose legs buckle for a moment. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if someone gets knocked down in the first round. Pryor put the pressure on him. I mean, uh, you'd thought it was a one-round bout instead of a 15-round bout. Well, there weren't too many who expected this fight to go the distance, and at this pace, there is simply no way that it can. Arguello is letting Pryor fight his fight. And another right hand, and Arguello back to the ropes again. That hurt Arguello. Arguello holds on here as Pryor forces the attack. And there was silence in the people. that Arguello's fans were just totally in shock. I couldn't even move because I was just watching my dad get his ass beat. He just kept saying, come on, come on, that's nothing. Most boxing experts theorized if Pryor, a two-to-one underdog, had any chance to win, he'd have to knock out Arguello early. Originally, Pryor's handlers wanted it to be a 12-round fight, and my dad wanted it to be a 15-round fight because he knew that if he got Pryor past 10, that it was in the bag for him. After the second round, Pryor's trainer, Panama Lewis, instructed him to drink from a specific bottle. Give me, give me, give me a drink now that I mix. One that I mix. A move that would later raise suspicion. Whatever he was mixing, that bottle uh, gave Pryor more energy. Pryor again rushing off the stool at Alexis Arguello. Pryor, who had made short work of most of his opponents, set a frantic pace early in the fight. I don't think I've ever seen Arguello have to fight so hard, so persistently, in the first few rounds of a fight. Arguello struggled to counter Pryor's relentless attack. As the fight progressed, Arguello began to connect. But he did score with an uppercut with the left hand. Arguello back to the right hand of his own. And then in the middle rounds, he started to make this comeback, and you went, OK, now this is what we're more used to seeing. Maybe the seventh or eighth round started to come around, and my dad started landing more shots. And there's a the right hand, and that might have hurt Pryor. One time he hit me. There's a hard right hand by Arguello. And I thought he knocked my head off. As Arguello closed the gap and the fight drew even, Pryor, the angry brawler, changed his approach. He was expecting me to come in swinging, 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 swinging. I knew I couldn't beat him that way. It's really impressive to see Aaron Pryor as a boxer. You can't find some of the moves in the book he was creating. He was creating in, the, in that fight. You notice the way he bobs and weed goes with the left hand, the right hand. He's capable of throwing punches from all angles. He was like a Michelangelo. And see, Aguayo can't deal with the boxer. He has trouble with all boxers. And Pryor's doing the right thing now. And Pryor was, was boxing from outside. And Lexus was hitting him, but he was hitting him on the end of the punches, you know. And so therefore, you're sacrificing your power. He never had any reaction but a smile to one of my dad's punches. Every time he get a big punch, he laughed. They say, well, man, this is crazy. Pryor smiles at him at the bell. I have no idea why Aaron Pryor wanted any more of those shots. He just wasn't strong enough to knock me out. This fight had all the billings, of course. Brawler, boxer, good versus evil. What it all comes down to is two guys in an 18-foot square. A close fight in the eye of any impartial viewer. If the fight had been scheduled for 12 rounds, as Pryor's camp had requested, the bout would have ended in scandal. I believe the Spanish official was judging every round for Arguello. And so um, we were kind of getting worried. The worst that could happen is for a fight to go the distance and then somebody has it by one point one way or the other point and then somebody has it ten points the other way. As you see it now, the fight's dead even. It's just about dead even, yes. This was for real. Aaron you know, Pryor had to knock him out or he would have lost the fight. This is the 13th round. It is still anybody's guess. Having knocked out 29 of 31 opponents, Aaron Pryor had fought past 10 rounds only once in his career. Alexis Arguello had built his reputation in these final championship rounds. That was the best punch of the fight. My head went back and I could see the lights in this ceiling up there. That was like target practice. I was so concentrated on him that I, that was nothing. I took that shot up. I ate that shot. When Alexis hit a guy with those kind of shots, 
Nine times out of ten, they go down. He fought a different animal and Aaron Pryor. I think Aaron got to a point, he, his mind just went to another place. No matter what, I ain't going nowhere. I'm not going to get beat tonight. Two rounds away from the respect Aaron Pryor always thought he deserved. He sat across from a three-time champion and a potential hometown decision. Punch back! Win these two last rounds! Six minutes! You can fight for six minutes! Once again, Panama Lewis asked Pryor to drink from the mysterious black bottle. Give me that bottle! That's the one I mix! Pryor brought everything from the inner city and the ghetto with him. Panama Lewis telling Aaron Pryor that he had to win these next two rounds. Everybody did anything to him that night was with him. That's what Alexis meant to him. Pryor on that jab and a combination again. And Aguayo's in trouble. Aguayo in big trouble against the ropes. Pryor going for the kill, trying to put him away. Aguayo trying to cover up. A smashing right hand. Aguayo's helpless against the ropes. Aguayo's hands on the side. It's over. Aaron Pryor has retained his junior one-to-one championship. Aguayo slips to the canvas. What a victory for Aaron Incredible, Barry. Never seen anything like that before. This time, he reacted by going back to the ropes and allowing me to rush him. I just kept throwing punches, just kept throwing punches. I said, like, they got to not take this fight from me. They're not going to take this fight from me. It was definitely a matter of pride that he wanted to stay up there. No, I'm not going to go down. I'll take all your shots, but I'm not going to go down. He never lost his, his, his courage until he slinked back. When I caught him with the overhand right, boom. And the last flurry that ended it by Pryor was as brutal, as ruthless as anything I've ever seen in the ring. The way he looks in, in, in the middle of the ring was like it was hurt bad. I mean, this was not just a knockout, you know, he was hurt. Alexis Arguello felt he had disappointed those close to him. I just remember him coming over to me and hugging me and crying and telling me that he was sorry, and that was it. So many people cry because people love him so much. He just apologized, and I didn't know why, you know. It's like, I was like, Dad, you know, why are you apologizing? You don't have to say sorry. Why apologize to me and to me only? It was just the me that he looked at me in my eyes and he was like, I'm sorry. That was um, an uncomfortable situation. As Aaron Pryor celebrated his greatest victory, a controversy brewed. The newly formed Miami Boxing Commission had neglected to collect urine samples after the bout. The local commission is in charge of the test, and so the local commission really blew it. The absence of a post-fight drug test focused national attention on a transaction occurring in Pryor's corner shortly before the final round. Give me that bottle. That's the one I mix. Trainer Panama Lewis, as he had also done after the second round, requested a specific bottle, one that he mixed. Boxing rules permit only the usage of water in the corner. We saw the tape where, where, where Panama was furious and asking for the other bottle, not the water, the one that I mixed. Uh, I don't think you mix water with water. The media had already, you know, made me the feeling. I don't doubt that there was some sort of stimulant in that bottle. I really don't, in retrospect. Someone had said sh it was, schnapps was in it. It was used to control diarrhea. And he didn't need a bottle to get through that. I think that was a way of Panama injecting himself into a very pivotal part of that fight. Well, Aaron Pryor just came on strong. I don't know why, where he got the energy from. But one thing I do know, and I'm sure the boxing fans know, that Aaron Pryor didn't need that bottle, whatever it was. My pride is what is involved in the rematch with Alexis. While Arguello never contested Pryor's victory, the black bottle fueled demand for a rematch. He came up and asked me, did I have anything in the black bottle? This is why I took the second fight with him, and. Um, why I told him apart. In the most anticipated rematch since the thriller in Manila between Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier, Alexis Arguello and Aaron Pryor will again go to war. The second fight, he didn't have the black bottle. Knocked him out in 10 instead of 14. Beat him up worse. Here goes Pryor again. Oh, what an uppercut to the chin of Arguello. Arguello's in trouble. He's down. He's down on his right knee and he goes to the seat of his pants. 
he knew what was going to happen if he had, if he had gone out. He wasn't out. He wasn't out on his feet. But he knew. He got me again. I just can't beat this guy. And he let himself get counted out. That's it. And you're all over. It's all over. Aaron... And he said, Jimmy, in all my years of boxing, he says, I've never been hit with two hands at the same time. He was just like in awe of pride. I was pushing really hard. And uh, I was really hurt. You know, I don't want to risk my, my life, you know. We know what we wanted to do after this fight, and we know what we had to do during this fight. Alexis wanted to go home a four-time world champion, and I wanted to go home with my title. The fighters kind of reveal themselves, like, this is what I'm about, let's see what you're about. There's a tremendous amount of respect because both of them spent probably everything they had. It was a lot like the thrill in Manila, just in a sense that it was two warriors, I mean, just laying it out from the beginning to the end. And I don't think there's any question that had lifelong lasting results. I mean, neither fighter was ever the same after that. Three years after the black bottle controversy, Panama Lewis was banned from boxing for illegally stripping padding from the gloves of a fighter. Aaron Pryor, his career foreshortened by cocaine addiction, retired with a what might have been record of 39 wins against a single loss. And Alexis Arguello, who later also battled cocaine, eventually returned home to Nicaragua. Thanks for watching The Tale of Pryor Arguello. Hello, I'm Jim Lampley. Welcome to this look back at the stories behind Hagler Hearns, possibly the most memorable fight in 30 years of boxing on HBO. It's the most hellacious eight minutes of combat in modern boxing history, a confrontation so starkly violent it took away the breath of hardened ringside observers. Marvelous Marvin Hagler and Thomas Hitman Hearns entered the ring at the same level of high-risk commitment in 1985. Their flames met and within seconds built a bonfire. Fifteen rounds of boxing for the undisputed middleweight championship of the world. In November 1979, Marvin Hagler, in his 50th fight, finally got a shot at the middleweight title. Although he looked like the winner, the champion, Vito Antifermo, retained the title on a controversial draw. The decision deepened Hagler's frustration and hardened his resolve to earn the respect and admiration that had always eluded him. The referee said to Pat and I, he step aside because when I uh, raise his hand, I want to get a picture with him and I. We stepped aside and they called it a draw. He was devastating. It was like, I lost the fight. Mom, you didn't lose. It was a draw. You both won. I lost the fight because I don't have the title. And this is what he wanted to explain to me, that if you don't get the win, you still lose. It made me much more stronger, made me meaner, made me more aggressive. Marvin learned a lesson there that being in Vegas was never a sure thing. From that point on, Marvin said, these right here are going to be my judges from now on. Ten months later, in London, Hagler stopped the new middleweight champion, Alan Minter, in the third round. But his crowning glory turned into a riot rather than a celebration. Full beer bottles are raining down on the canvas and bouncing off. The Bobbies came to rescue us. We won the world's title. The belt wasn't presented to us in the ring like you normally do to the world's champion. We had to run like we did something wrong. I got here the hard way and I'm, fl I'm planning on staying here. Uh, I'm leaving it up to my manager and trainer to figure out who's next and uh, I'm planning on being here for a long time. Thomas Hearns also planned on establishing his place on the boxing scene. In 1981, the undefeated Hearns, then known as the Motor City Cobra, stood on the cusp of superstar status when he faced Sugar Ray Leonard for the welterweight title. In a memorable fight that elevated both men, Leonard rallied to win on a TKO in the 14th round. It's over, and Ray Leonard is the undisputed welterweight champion of the world against a very game Thomas Hurt. Boxing really was all that Detroit had, and I believe that Tommy felt that he let the whole city down when he lost that fight. That was a fight that he should have won. When Thomas lost to Ray Leonard, we went back and there was a lot of rethinking. So Emmanuel made the immediate decision to start to move him up, and so he started the campaign in the 154-pound weight class. And the thought was, okay, we're just going to go on and we're going to reestablish the image. The images of Thomas Hearns and Marvin Hagler 
were both born in cities rich with boxing tradition. Hearns' journey began in Detroit, the home of Joe Lewis, Sugar Ray Robinson, and the legendary Cronk Jim. In the middle of the city, there's a pillbox-like bunker, brick, red. You go down one flight of stairs. You feel the heat rising as you go down. In some ways, I would imagine it's like Dante's Inferno. In the middle of all this is this little Merlin, this little man, Emmanuel Stewart. The first time that I met Thomas Hearns, he was a little skinny kid, very quiet, very bashful, a little kind of puppy dog-like sad eyes. And even though he wasn't the most talented guy at the time, he would always be back the next day. Tommy Hearns was not a great athlete. In fact, he was a skinny guy who said, I'm tired of people stealing my coats. Can you help me? Emmanuel said, okay, and threw him in there with a kid who was skillful and broke his nose immediately. And then Emmanuel looked at him to see what his reaction was gonna be. And Tommy Hearns straightened his nose back out and went back in there. It was like part manager, trainer, but also like a father to some degree too, being that he, like I, came from a fatherless home. We spent so much time together. After a while, Emmanuel did become something like a father figure to me. Not just to, to develop me as a fighter, but to develop me as a, a, a young man. In Brockton, Massachusetts, the hometown of Rocky Marciano, Marvin Hagler would find a boxing family of his own under the guidance of brothers Goody and Pat Petronelli. From 1969 to 73, Marvin worked with Pat and Goody, who had a uh, construction company. Me and Marvin both were young laborers on the job and would do the bulwark. I worked construction for eight years, and uh, while I was digging, I was thinking, there's got to be a better way. <laughs> he had said that he's going to become champ, and he did. When he came out of here, he referred to us as whiteies. And, uh, you know, he had a kick out of that, and it took him a while to really get to trust us as whiteies. The Petronellis, for me, is, they've been like a father and a brother. You know, I was able to talk about anything under the sun with them, to share even things that when I was upset or my personal life or whatever. It was climbing that mountain together, Pat and myself and, and, and Marvin. It was a uh, triangle. There's nothing stronger than a triangle. Despite the support of the Petronellis, Hagler simply didn't feel respected inside the ring. So he went to a court of law to get what he couldn't get in the court of public opinion. Marvin wanted to be called Marvelous. We tried to educate the general public to the name Marvelous Marvin. We thought we had done it until we ran up against the guy who was in charge of ABC Sports. And he said, if you want us to use the name Marvelous Marvin, go to court. So I rose to the challenge and I asked the probate court judge to change the name of Marvin Nathaniel Hagler to Marvelous Marvin. It wasn't like he grew up always wishing his mom had called him Marvelous, you know, I mean it was a need inside him. I really felt as though I never got the respect in which I deserve uh, in the beginning part of my career. And I just remember when Joe Frazier had said, you know, you got three strikes against you, one you're southpaw, two you're good, and three you're black. While people were hesitant to face Hagler, the lanky Thomas Hearns didn't have the look of a future world champion. He looked like you could blow him over, but out of nowhere, he possessed this punch. And it was almost like there was Tommy's body, and then there was this right hand that was from another person. It was demonic. When Tommy hit people with his right hand, most of his career, they disappeared like those people in that uh, Star Wars, you know, they just, they vaporized. That right hand, hey, it's, 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 over. Go. it's over, he hit it with some right hand. The way that he struck with such deadly force and precision accuracy, it was only natural to give him some kind of devastating name. Ring Magazine put him on the cover in a gangster suit with a, with a machine gun calling him the hitman. In 1982, a retired Sugar Ray Leonard refused a rematch with Thomas Hearns and also brushed aside a showdown with Hagler. A fight with this great man, this great champion, marvelous Marvin Hagler could be one of the greatest fights in the history of boxing. But unfortunately, it'll never happen. Hagler and Hearns turned their attention to each other and were set to meet in May of 1982. But an injury to Hearns' right hand forced a postponement. 
Marvin um, found out that the fight with Hearns was off, and he, I've never seen him so angry. I mean, he just wanted to fight this guy so badly. He started complaining about his little baby pinky. You know how many people will give a million dollars for that little baby pinky? And for a million dollars, I cut that thing off. <laughs> for two years, Hagler would continue his reign as middleweight champ, while Thomas Hearns, now fighting at 154 pounds, would put Hagler on notice. His shocking second round knockout of the legendary Roberto Duran sounded the return of the hitman. Oh, oh he's, out, out. he's out, he's out. He was out before he hit the camp. If there's a sweet spot in boxing, it was that night where Hearn's fist met the point of Roberto Duran's chin. He was out cold, just boom, out. He looked like 140 pounds of pancake batter, just splat, down he went. When I hit Roberto Duran, it was like it was just a thrust of power just after humiliating Duran, a confident Thomas Hearns would move up to the 160-pound weight class, and the long-awaited showdown was set. Hostilities between the two fighters grew during a 20-city press tour. Keep that belt by your bed, because uh, it'll be the last time you see it. When he would pull a little baseball cap on war across the top, you knew, and I think Thomas Hearns knew, that it was about war with with Hagler. It's a mental toughness, and uh, that's what I feel. War, that's what's on my mind. Marvin was even more quiet than Tommy and, and said less. So in order to make the press conferences interesting, Thomas Hearns had to be the outgoing, talkative one. And come April 15, and three rounds, I would be the greatest. I finish hitting with one, two, three, I want to back off him just a little bit so I can hit him with four. Just back off. Bam, 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 bam. Seeing his ugly face every day, I mean, you get tired, man. <laughs> you know, and then he had that big mouth and he's telling him what he's going to do. He's going to knock my ball head off. I already know who the winner is. And as for my man say, he never fights a man twice. That's right. He's never going to fight me again because this is going to be his last fight. To prepare for the biggest fight of his career, Marvin Hagler did what he always did. He went into isolation. One of the terms that Marvin used for his training camp was that he was going to go to jail. And I call it jail because you're sacrificing and you're away from uh, no party and no drinking, no woman. Arrgh. Once he started this schedule, he wouldn't sit down and talk to the president of the United States come in. Marvin. Marvin. When I was working out with different guys the same size as him, I like to see him fall like a tree, you know. Boom. <laughs> While Hagler was training in Massachusetts, Hearns was more visible in Las Vegas, at home in the spotlight. In the days preceding the fight, Thomas Hearns just exuded confidence. You know, maybe even the borderline being cocky. I remember walking through the casino at Caesar's Palace one night. It must have been 11, 15 at night. I saw a big crowd around a craps table. And it was Thomas Hearns shooting crap to people all around him. That led him to believe, gee, what a relaxed guy. This guy, you know, he, he must going to be win easy. The night of the fight, the locker room of Thomas Hearns was overflowing with followers of the hitman. Thomas Hearns, maybe more than any fighter in history, at the biggest entourage. And in the dressing room before the fight, it's a million people. They were in the room next to us, and they were banging the walls, and Marvin was putting his boxing shoes on, and he looked up and he says, you can't take those guys in the ring with them. It's just going to be me and them. In his hotel room prior to the fight, Thomas Hearns received a massage from a member of his entourage. That act upset trainer Emmanuel Stewart. One of the guys from, one of the hang-ons at least, massaged Thomas's legs down, and when I came up, I ran him out of the room, and I knew then that was a major problem. The massage leaves the body spent. And so going into the fight, we was worried. In the dressing room, I was saying to myself, I was thinking in my mind that in order for me to win this fight, I got to go right out there and take it to him and get rid of him. The fight would be Thomas Hearns first in the middleweight division, which dictated the strategy of Hagler. He would try to impose his strength on Hearns from start to finish. He'll have to start, start earlier because uh, he's, uh, he's as ready as he's ever been. He's the best shape he's ever been in his life. He's, uh, he'll knock out Tommy Hines. Goody called it. Goody said, Tommy's going to come gunning right out after you. Just 
make a street fight out of it. He'll come right out at you and you just come right out with him. People just saw two, two trains ready to collide. This is the main event of the night. 12 rounds of boxing for the undisputed middleweight championship of the world. I think when people saw them come in, Hagler and Hearns, and they looked at these two men who sometimes lived in Sugar Ray Leonard's shadow, and they said they are desperate to win this fight because their legacy could depend on this. And the entourage now of Thomas Hearns making its way toward the ring here. Marvelous Marvin Hagler, of course. He had his game face on Ray somewhere around Thursday. Everybody expects to see a contest here decided by their strength, decided by their styles, decided by their will. This was going to be high megaton action. One guy who's called a hitman, and the other guy who walks around talking about destroying destruction no matter what you ask him. Marvelous Marvin Hagler! I suddenly notice Marvin Hagler is beating himself up in his face. Ed Schuyler, the Associated Press, said later, if the introductions had gone one more minute, Hagley would have stopped himself. When they got in the ring, I mean, I could not believe the tension that was in that fight. I'm just cautioning you now. Obey my command at all times. Shake hands, good luck to both of you. When Marvin Hagler came out of his corner, he was carrying with him all the frustrations and broken dreams of his whole life. And he was going to take them all out on somebody else. We're underway. And the pace is up-tempo, right at the opening bell. The moment in that fight was in the first 10 seconds of the fight. You know, I mean, you couldn't get any more up. And it went on for the first three minutes of that fight. Tremendous pace in the first round. I expect this, Barry. Both guys are going at it. Bird's getting the better of it right now. I dropped my stock, I was hitting all the heat with triple I. Man, I was trying to hit him with everything. The second round, these guys would definitely pace themselves. There has been no boxing at all, just fighting him. I went to jump right on top of him, not giving him time to think, not giving him time to use his reach or that right hand. combinations were unbelievable. They, they just both were just bashing each other to the point where I felt like sweat coming out of the TV screen. Now that was the right hand of Tommy Hearns and it did catch Hacker, but he didn't take a backward step there. This is still the first round. Blood on the face of Marvin Hacker again. We can't quite tell where it's coming from. Everything was in fast motion. It was so quickly. Uh, I, I, I forgot how many rounds it went. Writers from the New York Times and Los Angeles Times and papers from all over the world, they've got their mouths open. This may be the most brutal even round you've ever seen in boxing. At the end of the first round of that fight, I remember thinking, could there ever have been a better round in the history of boxing? The first round ended, Tommy's told me my right hand is broke. I hit him a little too high up over his head. Just crushed my right hand. He had a hard head. I mean, I couldn't believe how hard his man head was. I, I said, man, I see why you keep your head bald and shaved bald, because you got, you got a weapon here. You got a hard weapon. When I think off to the back, the most exciting three rounds in boxing, and he did that with a broken hand, it just starts to realize how much courage and determination he had. Broken or not, it was Hagler's ability to withstand Hearns' best weapon that shifted the fight's momentum. After he hit me with the right hand, I think that was his best shot. And I knew for myself that in order for you to knock me out, you better hit me with that ring post because I ain't going nowhere. Nobody could take Hearn's punches. When Hagler shook it off, I remember thinking, the fight's over. Bang, just like that. In the second round, with Hearn's right hand already broken, Marvin Hagler would gain the advantage. That was a hook. Good left hook, and Hurts left his feet. Hurts is hurt. That was a good game, Barry. Hurts, Hurts is definitely hurt. Trying to weather the storm here in round two. Big round for Marvin Hagler. In the third round, blood coming from a cut in the middle of Hagler's forehead came to the attention of referee Richard Steele. 
And now we're going to get a moment for the doctor to come in as that cut just opened up. I took Marvin Hagler to the doctor, and the doctor looked at the cut and allow it to go on. It's not bothering your cut. No, it's not bothering his sight. Let him go. I couldn't understand where the cut came from because I don't think it was from a right hand. It wasn't blood over my eyes, and I couldn't understand why the referee was trying to step in and give Tommy more time to rest. In the back of his mind, I'm sure, sensed that here we go again. They're going to find some way to take away from me what I've earned. I'll decide if I can't go on. He knew he had to do something to, to take it into his own hands. I think his great quote was, I, you know, he saw blood and he turned into a bull. You remember the game Pac-Man? And so if I just keep, arr, 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 and sooner or later, I'm going to catch you. the absolute moment of his life and, and he goes after Hearns with everything he has and he catches him behind the ear. And then Tommy went down in a sort of weird fashion, like a, a beach umbrella that's been caught by the wind. He goes down and I'm counting. Thomas Hearns' heart is just big as he is. He gets up and claps in my arms. It's, it's over. over. I love the knockout, but I, I believe that if Tommy would have got up in that fight there, I believe that I never really want to hurt anybody in the ring or kill anybody, but I believe that he was really going to be hurt. For Marvin Hagler, this was the peak of his 12-year career. I told you I was going to eat him up like Pat, man. I figured once I get through the right hand, then it was all mine. He made us all stand 10 feet high. We picked him up, walked around the ring with him. He's our champ. He's finally... Uh, got the recognition he should have had. I don't think until that moment that any or many of us realized how important it was to Marvin Hagler to be considered a great fighter. I told you a long time ago that I was a great fighter. You said, not yet, not yet, you said. You still got to prove yourself. Well, did I do that tonight? This night, Hagler got all he deserved. He had worked for this night and for this moment. He had to decide at some point, how much is this worth to me? And he decided it was worth a lot. And, uh, and he was rewarded. It's a great thing. While Hagler and his handlers celebrated, the sight of Hearns laid out on the canvas was difficult for his supporters to witness. It was the first time I'd ever saw Tommy actually down. He was totally drained. One of Tommy's handlers jumped in the ring and lifted him up like a baby. It was bad enough that he got stopped, but he didn't need to be carried back like he was an unconscious slab of meat. Weeks later, I said, Tommy, ever think what would have happened if that fight would have gone the distance? And he said, yeah, one of us would have been carried out. I said, wait a minute, one of you was carried out. <laughs> After the fight, Hagler and Hearns met face to face. No longer enemies, but partners in history. The man showed his greatness. And then I have to say that it was one damn good fight. What to visit Marvin? The question was, man, um, what was you taking? What made you stand up? And Marvin's answer was, I didn't want to fall. I, I wasn't going to fall. I was determined to win this fight. I do give a lot of respect for Tommy at this moment beyond the fact that, you know, he came to fight. He showed me great skills and a, a lot of courage. Hearns is remembered today as a great champion who came up a little short against the two best fighters of his time. Those two fights, Hearns had his two golden moments and, and lost them both. That's what he's remembered for. He put on a hell of a fight twice, but he didn't win at either time, and, and it's not as good as winning. I really hate even doing this interview for this. Anytime those fights are ever brought up, I leave because I relive the pain too much. My place in history, I leave it up to the people that, that can call the shot. Well, wherever they place me, I'm gonna be happy. I'm gonna be satisfied because they don't have to place me at all. Now Marvin Hagler was considered marvelous in the court of public opinion as well as the court of law. It came brutally, it came against all odds, but it came the way everything had come from Marvin Hagler. That's the way I had to do it. 
That's the only way. That is how sweet it is. That performance became his identification badge for the rest of his career. Those eight minutes transformed him from just being a terrific pro into a star. One should grab oneself one of these red guard sports sticks because one would hate to be considered malodorous by one's chums. And one of the great middleweights of all time. The victory over Hearns would be the peak of Hagler's career. He would have one more super fight against Sugar Ray Leonard. Hagler would lose a split decision and retire, never putting a pair of gloves on again. But no matter what happened later, Marvin Hagler and Thomas Hearns' performance on April 15, 1985, will always be remembered for boxing's most unforgettable eight minutes. For great stars to do that, to put themselves on the line, take all those risks in that big moment on the stage is so rare that it has a timeless epic quality to it. Because of Hagler's abrupt retirement two years later, there would be no rematch of Hagler Hearns, no sequel to dilute or diminish the impact of their abbreviated street fight. And for Hearns, just as had been the case following his heartbreaking loss to Leonard four years before, his image as a great warrior was further enhanced. Hearns' career proves that great fights can establish a fighter's greatness, whether the record shows he won or lost. Thanks for watching The Tale of Hagler Hearns. Hello, I'm Jim Lampley. Welcome to this look back at the stories behind Hagler Leonard, one of the most memorable fights in 30 years of boxing on HBO. Life, we're fond of saying, is unfair. And even unfairer it sometimes seems in the game of fame and fortune. Why is it some great fighters become stars and others, perhaps equally great, are largely ignored in the world beyond the ropes? Never did a prize fight more graphically underline this inequity than in 1987 when Ray Leonard made his most memorable comeback against marvelous Marvin Hagler. Today, people still will argue who won the fight. I don't care who you're with, a Hagler and Leonard fight comes up, it's the conversation for the night. How do you like it? How do you like it? I know I won the fight. He believes he won the fight. Everyone says, you know, Hagler, I picked you. <laughs> I want to know. I says, how did I lose this fight then? Both fighters think they won the fight. The decision announced on April 6, 1987, assured one man's ascent to greatness, confirming the unfortunate fate of another. But for Sugar Ray Leonard and marvelous Marvin Hagler, the bad blood goes back to the beginning of a long road of disparity. Their conflicting journeys date back to the amateurs, as the show-stealing Leonard embarked upon the golden road the 1976 Olympic Games. Hagler, an amateur champion eager for a payday, turned professional only to be humbled with $50 fights in obscure arenas. Nobody ever thought of Marvin Hagler as a potential champion. I mean, probably not for the first five or six years of his career. Ray Leonard, coming out of the Olympic Games, was groomed to be a champion. 